Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to WOLPA Day 2 uh, and your, your live streaming conference. I uh, hope you are coffeeed up and uh, got to the breakfast bar in the hotel lobby. Oh, wait, not happening this year. Uh, hope you've got your snacks and are ready to settle in. Uh, I'm Avery Shinneman, uh, a professor at the University of Washington Bothell campus and the Earth System Science Program. Uh, and this morning with Jim Gowell from UW Tacoma, we're going to start with a discussion about public access uh, to lakes. And this, uh, this discussion, Jim and I were talking about this at least since the last WALPA, a little bit about um, what we know about public access points, their, their actual accessibility, their value, their use. Um, and then the summer came around, and I'm sure as many of you experienced, our parks and beaches and trailheads were absolutely swamped uh, with people looking for a place to socialize and stay cool while all the buildings with air conditioning were closed. Um, and so it became really apparent how many people are trying to use that public space uh, a lot of times all at the same time. Uh, so what we wanted to do this morning um, was have a, a discussion as best we can in this format, uh, really within WALPA. Um, what do we know about public access at lakes? What do we wish we knew? We had a start of that discussion yesterday in the plenary, a little bit about how much data we lack about where those public access points are, um, what, where the points are relative to different neighborhoods and different parts of the state. Um, so, so we just kind of want to open up to thinking about some of those points and have a discussion that that ranges across um, lots of different things about those public access points, what we know about them, what we don't, what we should. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our, our panelists for this morning uh, and ask uh, them to go around and introduce themselves a bit. Uh, and as we do that, I'll remind you that any questions that you have as we go, you can submit to info at walpa.org uh, and we'll bring those into the discussion from our end. Uh, so moving around uh, the screen, you'll see, uh, no Jim, no doubt, uh, I think on your upper left there from UW Tacoma. We have Ashley Towns, who is a graduate student at the University of Washington, uh, but also here representing an organization called Link to Lake, uh, which is trying to work with some public access and parks recreation creation in the Rainier Beach neighborhood in Seattle. She's on your upper right there. Uh, Daniel Nigzgorski uh, from King County. Um, uh, lakes and Streams Assessment, and Marissa Bergdorf uh, down next to me here from Snohomish County and the LakeWise program. So I was going to start with is asking each of you to go around and just introduce a bit about um, yourself. Maybe I was going to ask you for your favorite lake. What is your favorite lake uh, or, or maybe lake, lake thing, lake thing to do, whatever it might be. Uh, and then introduce your organization, particularly as it pertains to public access. So we'll start uh, with, uh, let's see, let's start with Daniel. All right. Thank you, Avery. So I'm an ecologist working with King County Department of Natural Resources. We work on a lot of different projects. The ones that I'm going to be talking about here mostly are our swimming beach monitoring on Lake Washington and other lakes in King County for bacteria from poop pollution, and also our toxic algae, which I know is near and dear to a lot of your hearts. My favorite lake is a small lake in the Cascades that I won't name because I'm trying to keep it from getting overrun like everything else is. Great, thank you. How about Ashley? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Ashley Towns, and I am a PhD student at the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. Um, and But I'm also a proud resident of the Rainier Beach neighborhood and I joined this fantastic uh, committee organization called Rainier Beach Link to Lake, where our primary mission is to create a civic uh, commercial corridor between the Rainier Beach um, Link Station to um, Bear Shepherd Park, which is a water park, um, waterfront park. And um, our objectives are really to try to improve it and to um, um, up the standards of the park. And I'll be talking a little bit about the uh, lack of uh, amenities and inequities um, that we are eliminating at the current time. Thanks so much. Thanks. And Marissa. Hi, thanks for having me this morning. I'm Marissa Bergdorf, as uh, Avery mentioned, from Snohomish County, uh, and I work in the Lake Management Program, which I'm still thrilled that we have a Lake Management Program, but we get to work on all sorts of projects. Primarily, we have a volunteer lake monitoring program. So we interact a lot with lake residents through that program. We also um, 
work uh, on a variety of lake management uh, activities, including toxic algae monitoring, uh, invasive aquatic plant control, and our lake-wise outreach program. And a lot of times we also just get lots and lots of phone calls from lake area residents and users. So um, we can bring that perspective of what their concerns are today. And Jim. Sure, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Gal. I'm an associate professor at the University of Washington in Tacoma. Uh, also a past uh, president and board member on WALPA uh, for a number of years and uh, my uh, research actually is on lakes and toxics in lakes, as well as harmful algae blooms and effects of nutrients, um, both around here in uh, the sort of Puget Sound region lakes, as well as at Mount St. Helens and other places. So um, I have a lot of interest in sort of the effect of toxics on people um, and on uh, organisms, and therefore trying to figure out who those people are um, that are potentially affected, which is actually not necessarily um, very well known. So I'm really interested in that stuff. As far as my favorite lake goes, that's an awfully political question um, when somebody does a whole bunch of stuff. But I'm going to name one out of state just because I remember it fondly. So Walden Pond uh, outside of Boston, because it was the closest place you could actually go swimming uh, during the heat of Boston summers. Everything else was a water supply. So you actually had to drive about an hour in traffic to get to a lake to be able to swim. So I remember it quite well. <laughs> That's actually my uh, my impetus for asking the question because I put up uh, as my ba background here Lake Phelan in St. Paul, Minnesota, which was the local public lake to where I grew up. Uh, and when I moved here, the, the St. Paul, Minneapolis metro area, there is no private ownership of waterfront. So there's the like eight lakes or so and the Mississippi River water frontage and several large creeks and all of that is publicly owned and accessible within the city. Uh, so moving to Seattle was kind of a shock for me. Uh, and, and there's looking at these little teeny pocket parks on Lake Washington that are 15 feet of shoreline and calling that a public access point was a little bit of a, uh, a, a change of perspective. Um, so <laughs> actually open with a question around that. Um, one of the things we talked about yesterday was the, the data access and I undoubtedly across the WELPA membership that's out there, there's more uh, data points available than we have in one spot. So that may be a place that we could do some work to kind of gather data on this, but just reaching out to King County, um, there was not some immediately accessible data set on how many lakes even have public access points or do not have public access points. Um, so I did get from Chris Knudsen, um, the subset of their, um, their lake stewardship lakes, just as, as an example set, and that's 38 lakes 14 of which have no public access at all. Um, and then that leaves 24 with some public access, but a little more than a third of those, the public access is only a concrete boat ramp. So there's no, um, nothing if you don't have a boat, basically. Um, so it's, it's public access as long as you're a member of the public who owns a boat and a boat trailer. Um, and so I wanted to start, um, maybe uh, kick off by asking Ashley a little bit about when we're thinking about promoting access to lakes, what are those amenities that um, that we need to make it safe and accessible and usable for the public? And where are we where are we lacking with that? Yes, well, um, on the south end, and like I was telling you all in the in my little introduction, that uh, we are trying to illuminate the inequities at Bear River Park, uh, which is a waterfront park, and basically those basic standards or those basic amenities such as lights, uh, fixtures. Um, such as places to gather in regards to having benches and, and um, uh, seating arrangements and also um, structures that will help us hang out in areas where when it starts to rain or whatever, like, um, you know, like shelters uh, for seasonal use. Um, those are the things that we are lacking that would really up the use of Bear Shelba Park. I mean, it's a relatively large, beautiful Glen uh, Park that is just definitely not um, taken into consideration or by the public or the, 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 the composition of the neighborhood is incredibly diverse. They're not very aware that this is actually a park because of these lack of amenities, these basic things. And when you start to do an informal study around um, Seattle um, and go up to the north end, they have a lot of amenities, a lot of furnishings, um, the upkeep 
Um, that's something too, as being a, a, a fisheries ecologist, I, I start to look at the riparian buffers and look at the vegetation and um, invasive species. And that's definitely being taken over. It's a monster here and it's that uh, neglect. And it's something in regards to, you know, amenities mean that you have the proper like money and funding to just be proudful of this space, right? There's no money going into um, our park. It's not um, on the priority list for us um, to get these basic things. So those are really the four basic things that we're really fighting for, which is quite sad. And um, I must tell you all that last uh, three weeks ago, we had a one hour meeting with uh, Jane Durkin to talk about these inequities and these um, basic furnishings that we're trying to get funding for and um, to just really elevate the voices of our residents. Um, we are in the 98118 zip code of, of Rainier Beach is not one of the most, I have to demystify that, it's not one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the country, but for how small it is, it's incredibly a, a melting pot. Um, and what I wanna say about that is that culture is embedded into natural spaces and how we utilize the park, right? Um, in regards to taking strolls, um, in regards to praying or reflecting. And we already know that, you know, the neurochemicals start flowing when we are by water. It's, it's, it's science, right? Um, and that's a shame because we have these unnecessary obstacles and um, lack of amenities where we're not able to use this beautiful park that's right in our space. Um, so that's what Link the Link is really doing and, and trying to increase our empirical evidence, um, really expose it with um, visuals, also getting the input of how people um, utilize the space. Like, we you know, we asked them directly, do, do you know this is a park? And high percent of people didn't even know. I have to just reiterate that. Um, and so really creating a corridor um, and also being um, aware that there is a park, right? So we talk about signage. Um, that's also kind of a, a uh, uh, amenity, you know, having public signage, something, some some sort of access point to get to the shorelines and also to expand it. When you look at the definition of a, um, a waterfront park, uh, you have trails, you have distinguished um, walkways. We don't really have that at all. Um, so that's what we're fighting for. Um, and those are the amenities that I want to uh, share with you all that are quite important that we're lacking at the Bear Share Park in South Seattle. Thank you for that excellent example. Um, I'll ask the other panelists if they have things to add in a second, but I also just want to remind people watching that you can email in um, questions for Ashley specifically or in general, um, or if you have examples um, that, that seem similar or, or other things to share from other parks uh, around the state, um, feel free to, to send those in as well and we'll share them out here. So um, any other panelists want to add on to that? Um, I'll throw something in there. So uh, one of the things that uh, I found, I think the interesting thing about doing research at lakes or any of us who are actually spending quite a bit of time around lakes is that we end up knowing more about the lakes sometimes than the lake residents do. Um, it's interesting because um, when I was doing research in Boston um, on a quite contaminated lake, um, we were meeting with the lake homeowners about the situation in the lake and they were aware of what was going on and they said oh well you know nobody here eats the fish out of this lake so it's not an issue i said you know i actually spend quite a bit of time during the day on weekdays out there and there are always people out there fishing and they're taking them home um and they're not taking them home to mount them because that's not the kind of fish you get out of that lake so um i think there's that that interesting idea that um people are using these lakes and they're almost invisible um, sometimes to the folks that we often talk to. So that's always been, I think, an issue with, with getting information about lakes and lake users is that we go to the people that we know that live on the lake. And that's a very different population than the rest of the folks who actually rely on that lake who don't have the money to live on it. So um, I think it's really, a big um, piece of that is trying to make so trying to figure out who uses it what do they want to use it for um, just getting in touch with those folks is there's not a, a set way I've been looking into that recently there's not a set way to get that information from people um, if you don't know who they are so Great, and that actually leads into the, the second question that I wanted to, to put out maybe um, first to, to Daniel because of your work on on the uh, swimming beaches, but 
what what do you think as we consider public access points what is that key information that needs to be conveyed primarily for the health of the people using that swimming beach or using that lake and and where are the barriers to getting that out all right so we think a lot about how we say stuff language where to say it signage website but the most important thing is focusing on what to say as scientists or scientifically minded people, we tend to start with context information education. Skip all that. People need to know what to do. They need actionable recommendations. So anything when we have to issue a warning or a closure, we start really simply with what's going on, either toxic algae in lake, high bacteria levels, and then do not swim. If you're not telling people an actionable recommendation, but you're kind of <laughs> direction, um, it's not going to be very helpful. We were surveying swimming beaches across the country to see if they had kind of a warning in between open and closed. And a lot of them had something really vague like, oh, bacteria levels are kind of elevated. Maybe kids or older people should exercise some caution. And when we talked to our beach managers here and to public health, they said those things are useless because you're not telling people what to do. You're not saying like people over 65 should not swim or something. And those vague statements just create a lot more confusion than they do help. So clear actionable recommendations are the most important thing that people need to know what to do or not to do to keep themselves, their families, their pets safe. Along those lines is how to interpret and apply things to other areas. So we monitor a number of beaches on Lake Washington that are more of the official public lifeguarded beaches. And there are all these other parks and swimming spots, private shorelines, everything else in between. And people always want to say, well, that beach here is closed. That one's okay. I live here. What am I supposed to do? And for poop pollution in, in a big lake like Lake Washington, we know that that can be extremely local. Sometimes we've had a beach with screamingly high bacteria values and we sampled a couple houses down to see where it's coming from and that had amazingly good water quality. So trying to tell people no, the whole lake isn't closed, a lot of that other stuff because we're trying to make recommendations about one beach and they're trying to ask about their favorite park or their shoreline a little bit ways. So that's really what to say is telling people what they need to know and realizing that that can have a lot of different layers to it. When you get into how to say it, um, I won't go into the whole workshop here on plain language, but things like saying toxic algae instead of cyanobacteria, actually saying poop instead of fecal contamination. Yes, I have said poop on TV, radio, newspaper interviews, scientific conferences, because it's what people understand. <laughs> and then once you have a simple plain language message, can you translate that into other languages? For many of us in Washington, that's English and Spanish at a minimum. In King County, we have a set of 10 languages we try to use for our key messages. And also considering culture. Um, public health has a great example where they had to cancel their um, swine flu vaccination campaign a few years ago because people are like, why are you going to inject me with something from pigs? <laughs> you know, it just it didn't cross cultures very well. And then once you have your message, getting it out to the public can be hard. We rely a lot on signage that only works at public access points. Um, so considering the private users, the unofficial access points, all of that can be trickier. And we know that people will still just somehow walk right past a sign without seeing it. We've even had people who they set up at a beach, they hang their sweatshirt on something and we say, excuse me, the beach is closed. You didn't see the sign? Well, that thing you hung your sweatshirt on was the beach closed sign. You can only do so much. Um, we also, try to get a lot out through websites and emails. And that gets really tricky because there's layers of city and county. Um, Ashley's Bear Shiva Park is a really interesting example. Last summer, it was closed for a bit because of some sewer work that was just contaminating the area. 
And the city's website for the park never had information about the closure. It's not designed to be updated rapidly like that. On our county swimming beach monitoring page, we put a courtesy notice about that, even though it's not one of our monitored ones. But there's oftentimes you get that kind of mishmash where like our website says something is closed. The city's website about the park doesn't say anything. I've had people call in and say, well, the sign says it's closed, but the website doesn't. So I'm just going to let my kids swim. And oh, goodness. So we have, in some senses, too much conflicting information, and in other senses, not enough. People always want more. You know, can you notify everyone who lives in the area? Can you put more signs? And I don't have any clear answers for that bit except to just listen and try to understand that every park, every community is going to have different ways that they can receive the information. So yeah, just what to say, how to say it, where to say it can all be tricky. We know kind of from that scientific basis what we want to recommend, but then the layers of translating it into do not swim, getting that out to where people can hear it is always a lot harder. Did uh, Ashley, Marissa, Jim have any follow-up comment on, on those communication strategies? I do. This really resonates with me because for, for two reasons, um, especially talking about the different cultural elements and signage and having the skill to cross communicate with different cultures and audiences um, in order to connect that information, that content um, important content such as, you know, warning signs for, for when and when not to swim. Um, and the reason is, is because um, this resonates with me because um, I, I attended Tufts University and I was a rower. And um, before that, I, at a point in my life, I wasn't sure that I belonged by water. It was a weird, it's a weird thing to think about now being, um, being older. But it was something about the signage that my mom thought I had the opportunity to be part of a rowing team when I was 12 years old in Philadelphia. I'm from Philadelphia. And um, it was something about the signage. And the signage actually had an African-American girl holding an oar. Um, so it was that visual effect. But also on top of that, layered on top of that, it was the language. Um, how it was broken down, like Daniel said, you know, scientific um, uh, 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 words and definitions. I mean, that doesn't really sometimes compute to people. They don't know how to interpret. They don't know what it is. It also discourages people. You know, say poop. <laughs> <laughs> we know what that is, but yeah, just being very um, delicate with with language and um, having a, different sets of lexicons, right? and when to use them appropriately. Um, I think that's something that's definitely not done enough. Um, and also how information is disseminated. Daniel said, the, the, uh, our website wasn't updated. First of all, not everyone has internet access. People are old school like me. I mean, I still write letters. I still do the door-to-door -door knocking. I'm still a fan of having, you know, informational uh, uh, seminars or uh, informational um, gatherings in the park, handing out flyers, something tangible people can hold. But it, again, it's those that, that being that have that sort of creative um, aspect when you're trying to create a message and how you're going to get that message across is incredibly important. A lot of times, a lot of um, officials um, miss the mark on that, and it's quite sad. But yeah, that was an excellent point, Daniel. That really resonated. And for what Ashley's talking about with a lot of that getting messages out to the communities. One, it's communities plural. Anywhere we're talking about, as Jim mentioned, even the people who live around a lake and the people who fish there every day may be completely different groups of folks. But none of us is going to have the skills to magically reach every community. If you have a good communications partner, work with them, but the communities can be your partners. Reach out to folks. If you've got a group, say you're working in the Rainier Beach neighborhood, reach out to a group like Ashley's and be prepared to hire them for their expertise in working with you on this because they're going to know 
what reaches their community and how way better than any of us or any surveys could. So I think those community partnerships are really the best way to co-create messages for your community. Uh, I might add a little bit to that as well. So first, I would just say thank you to King County for leading the way in especially the toxic LG signage and the toxic LG website and making that more accessible. We've been able to adopt yours and you know use that, so it's been really helpful. I think I might add of getting the message out a tool that's been really helpful for us, especially because in Snohomish County, most of our lakes that we work with closely are in rural areas. So it's uh, somewhat different issues of accessibility and the communities you're working with. Um, but we've really uh, found Nextdoor to be a really helpful tool uh, to be able to get the message out there, especially to those lake users as opposed to the lake residents. So uh, we've had really good response. I think of just raising overall awareness, especially with toxic algae, uh, that this is a problem and to be aware of it. So they may be looking or thinking about using that signage. And it's also been just a good visibility or way to increase knowledge of that lakes are around there. So if they're receiving notices about a toxic algae alert, it also keys a person into that, you know, there are those researchers out there, although they might not be the best message if you're saying don't go there right now. Um, and I think one thing I might add, and it kind of builds on the last comment, is that uh, this summer has been, I think, a real um, shift in uh, the demand and pressure for lakes, which and I think in a lot of ways is great because we've had more people that are seeing our website. We have web uh, webpage for each of our public lakes. Um, that gives all the information and the accessibility and whether there's parks or boat launches. And we've had more people call. Um, we keep a, you know, call a, than ever trying to find out where the lakes are. Is it safe to swim? Is it safe to fish? Um, so um, I, I think that's probably a little bit more of looking into the future. Great. And I have a, a follow up on that. Um, the way all of you are talking about uh, reaching out to different communities, one of the things that, that Jim and I have talked about that prompted this is how hard it is to figure out who you're talking to. Um, I'm curious if anyone here or, or really anyone uh, in the WALPA audience also um, have seen good ways to get a good handle on who the users are. You know, what if, if you're talking about lake residents, but then also looking at frequent fishers, at frequent swimmers, at people who want to stroll and picnic by the lake. Um, how do we best figure out who each of those groups are so that we can go about communicating with them? There was one summer we had an intern who just spent a few, some weekdays, some weekend days out at a beach and actually counted noses and surveyed people. Um, we certainly know that it's not just the people who live around a lake or a public access point who use it. So don't mistake your census maps for your lake users. But yeah, just taking the time and being there and realizing that different people will use the lake at different times of day, different days of week. I don't think there is any real substitute for that on the ground. And yes, unfortunately, there's a lot of lakes and not enough of us to do that all well. I'm not a representative of this, but I'm pretty sure Fish and Wildlife does their surveys um, to understand catch. So perhaps there's an element there that that could be used as a tool to uh, understand the lake users better, potentially. I think um, to Marissa's point, I think they do some of that, but unfortunately they do it mostly on really hot spot like fishing areas. So it tends to be a lot on the rivers actually, and on some of the bigger lakes. So they do actually, because we've been trying to find that lately, and it's pretty sparse on most of the small lakes um, that um, in urban areas and such, it tends to be big on what we consider to be big like angler um, lakes. So they do those creel surveys and things along those lines, which are really useful. Um, but again, it's one agency trying to cover all of the lakes in Washington is a little tough. Um, and so I think coming up with and I think this is a good place for WALPA. We've talked about this on the volunteer monitoring side of things of actually collecting not just water measurements, but user information, right? Finding out who's there, putting them in touch with um, information about their lake, where would they find it, right? So trying to spend, get volunteers to kind of expand the reach of, um, and, and I know that Snohomish County already and, and King County already do this, but I think that there's a bunch of lakes that we don't reach, especially those that um, don't have that kind of 
that population that um, it, it's usually the, again, the, the lake uh, homeowners as opposed to people that are using the lake. And so the question is, are you actually getting in contact with other people using the lake or are they just getting in contact with people that live on the lake? So I, Avery and I have been trying to figure out how do you reach um, that population? How do you get them informed? How do you find out who they are? And I do wonder if what, all the members who are out there, you know, one of the things I find is when I'm out on a lake, um, I am always getting questions from people. Usually it's, what did you catch? Um, which is interesting because it's the one thing we don't bring out on a lake is a fishing pole uh, when we're out sampling, but um, it doesn't matter. And it gives us an opportunity to talk to people, whoever happens to be there. So um, just kind of working with WAPA members to maybe put together a survey that they can do whenever they happen to be out on a lake and they're doing you know kind of doing a quick thing along those lines and set up a regular piece that at least tells us what are the communities that we should be trying to reach um what languages should we be trying to um use out there um and i think that's at least one place to start but um it's you know there's no it's definitely at least as far as i've found there's not a simple answer for kind of a broader brush of figuring out um all of the lakes what's going on and you're right about that. Is, there's no simple answer. Um, yeah, I feel like we've done, uh, the the community that I'm on is incredibly um, in tune and cerebral with what's going on, on the ground. Um, and we've done some really uh, incredible, in-depth, kind of a sociological, qualitative, quantitative, um, study on our community and what they want and how they utilize it. And we've done some, you know, simple things such as count the people in the park that day, that night, um, and what they're doing, what they're doing, like what the activity is or what they want to do too. Um, we feel compelled or we feel comfortable and we've kind of assess from afar the social cue. You get the, the head nod like, hey, how's it going? What's going on? Hey, I was wondering, you know, what are, what are your favorite things you like to do at the park? And we start to create from these like dialogues, we start to create a repository of um, what people like to do. And then at the same time, we start to put that in a hierarchical order. Um, and what people want to learn to do is fish because somehow they've learned that, they learned about the daylighting project at Barry Shuttle Park where um, we won a fantastic grant on restoring the Chinook habitat on the lower end of Lake Washington um, and what that means for the community. So they, lots of people want to learn how to fish. They want to learn how to canoe. They want to, they want to learn how to swim. These are grown people, um, many of them, adults, some of them in their 60s, want to learn how to swim. And there's no room for that at our park currently. Um, so again, it's just kind of, having those authentic conversations with the community and really figuring out what they want. And I've seen, I feel like that's been effective. Um, and then you turn that into something official, right? Like a document to maybe submit to have your proof that increases your clout, right? On winning. Um, but yeah, it's been so much fun talking to me like, what do you want? What do you like to do? You like to fish? Oh, you don't know how to fish, but you want to know? Okay, that's cool. <laughs> that's outstanding. And I, I would love to see, um, use that as an example maybe for something that Jim is talking about where we can maybe adapt from what you've learned in that really extensive project you know not every lake has such an engaged community group as Lake to Lake um, but maybe you know maybe that's something we can draw from to, to make a, a bigger uh, sort of exemplar survey of how you might go about talking to people <laughs> at these lakes which would be awesome um, I, I don't want to cut that off if people have other things to say about it but we have a couple of um, comments coming in that actually relate to a, a question I was going to pose uh, specifically to Marissa, but then to anybody, um, which is generally about the the relationship between private ownership on lakefront and public use on lakefront. Um, so the, the first comment we got was about lake residents um, sort of actively discouraging public access, even on public land. Uh, and so I know you have worked, Marissa, through LakeWise with some of that. So I wonder if you could lead us off talking about some of the sort of known conflicts or the things that tend to antagonize that relationship or, or kind of what you've learned about that in Snohomish County? Sure. Uh, so we uh, often, as Jim says, we, we do work a lot with lake residents because they are our target group for improving water quality by changing behaviors. 
And we also work with them in terms of volunteer monitors. But we also do get a flavor from the public because when there are issues uh, and lake users, they call us about if there's issues with the boat launches and other things. And I think I just, after Avery's intro, I did a quick survey of ours and our 35 public lakes that we work with in the county, 15 have parks that are accessible that allow swimming or other things, whereas the remaining 20 just have a boat launch. And I think right there, the boat launch is probably the biggest source of conflict. Um, and I think Ashley alluded to this as well, is boat launches really aren't set up or uh, for multi-use recreation. They're set up for people to pull in a boat and go fishing. And so there's a lot of tension that comes because especially when you have more dense population, or even if it's just a hot summer day, you're gonna have you know 20 people trying to get in their floaties to go out swimming or fishing or little kids waiting in the park as people are trying to launch. And so that, that definitely creates a tension and a conflict. Um, but I think along with that too, from a lake resident perspective, as I mentioned, a lot of our lakes that are in rural areas, there um, there is not a lot of people around there, especially in the evening. And so boat launches become a, a hub or an activity, a place where people get really concerned about for vandalism, trash, and particularly drug use and leaving needles behind. Um, so there's a lot of concern about public health and safety that's generated. Um, and fish and wildlife, uh, they have a really low budget and it's very hard for them to keep up on um, you know, cleaning the access sites and that sort of thing. So there's been, we've seen a lot of partnerships with lake residents uh, doing things, actually doing frequent cleanups of the boat launches and other things. Some of them pretend to lock the gate each night, they close it uh, to try and discourage people though it's not really actually locked. Uh, so there's been a lot of conflict around that. I think one thing we haven't really talked about either is there's uh, this perception or in some cases real uh, potential um, concerns about the lake health with regard to lake users. Um, and one of the biggest ones, which is probably, it is a real threat, not to say lake users or residents can't bring in, but aquatic invasive species, boats coming in are often the source of those aquatic invasive species. And once they're introduced, it's often the residents that end up footing the bill if there's any action taken on them. So that is one kind of area of conflict. Uh, another one that may in some ways be more of a perceived threat in some cases, it might be a real threat, but we did a survey of uh, lake residents for uh, kind of separate purposes. But in that, we asked what their main uh, thought was for the main sources of pollution to the lake. And 25 or 22 percent of them said the main source of pollution was lake recreation from external users. Um, and so and then there is also the this is, you know, on boats with expensive motorized boat access. There's a lot of conflict that arises too there in terms of the noise pollution and especially with the advent of wake boats uh, there's been really concern about that so that's not necessarily to do with lake access and some of the things we're talking about but these are the reasons that i think avery your point in that question that comes in oftentimes there is a conflict with lake residents and they are vocally against expanding lake access not always but um there definitely are is tension and concern there and we have a couple of um, follow up uh, comments from viewers as well about um, specifically about if anyone has had experience with signage or communication to assert the rights of public uh, of the public in public spaces to sort of state the rights of the commons uh, in those common spaces. Uh, and then a, a separate question, but somewhat related about um, community docks where there may be a public access point only accessible to like a homeowners association or lake association members and whether there's um, kind of what the history of those are. The, um, this is a question specifically referencing like Sammamish and the Sammamish Plateau, where there are some community docks um, that are not privately owned, but are only accessible to certain people. Um, so if anyone knows anything about the history of those and or um, any experience with good signage to explain the, the rights of access in different places. I can address the second one about the private docks. Um, so a lot of times what's happened uh, is developers may be able to only acquire like one lakefront parcel, but they want to build a huge development behind it. Um, so what happens is then people purchase into that larger development and then are granted specific rights to those docks. So that's often where that comes from. So each person owns, you know, one one hundredth or something of that community dock, and that's why they're restricted. And, when we see that on bigger lakes here, at least most of the time, those are gated and locked um, to only allow members into those areas. I'm assuming that's what that's referring to. I'm not familiar with the Sammamish example, though. 
I think that, yeah, that, that sounds like the, the very little familiarity I have with uh, Lake Sammamish. That sounds like the, the right answer. Um, has anyone had encountered, seen any signage or thought about signage about, about commons? I can imagine this, particularly with the kind of pocket park model on Lake Washington. So Daniel, I don't know if you have any experience with that. I have not seen a lot of signage like that. There is occasionally something that will say like um, public shore but usually the signs say no. Signs are all about saying, you know, this is only for members and residents of this homeowners association if it's one of those private dock things. So now as Ashley was talking about with Barashiva, what tells people it's a park is usually not a sign, it's the way that the space is set up and used that it invites that. Usually the only places I see signs saying something about public access is when it's like an easement through private land and they have to basically say, you're allowed to be on the trail, but this is private land. And so it's still kind of asserting that privateness of it. Yeah, public land usually has pretty poor signage. So trying to find a park even, sometimes I've been driving around a lake, it's like, okay, well, the map says there's a park here. I'm looking at it, I'm still not sure. Yeah, I, re I really like the idea. And now I want to go on like a, a ninja campaign to put like, yes, you can signs all over public parks now. I really, I really oh, like that. that would be delightful. <laughs> um, I think maybe that's that's the, the, the actionable item that should come from this discussion. Um, I, I, I might add to that an actionable item too. I, I don't know why I never thought of this before, but is improving that signage store lakes. We have one lake chain lake in Snohomish County that we literally, when people call, say you have to look for the blue reflector by the road and take a left because otherwise you'll miss it because it looks like you're driving down somebody's driveway, but it ends up being a public access site. So that's a really simple action. I mean, it's expensive and fish and wildlife, it's difficult, but it's actionable. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, we have a, a little bit of a related question then um, coming in about how people perceive lakes. So the question is sort of as we talk to communities and people around the lakes, um, have have we all encountered a sense mostly of um, from not so much homeowners, but public using the lake that we we belong to this lake and this is this lake is ours to steward, this lake is ours to use? Or do you encounter more of a perception of um, this lake is theirs, meaning it belongs to the managers, it belongs to the state, or even it belongs to, to homeowners and I'm just visiting? Um, and that maybe has to do with some of that, you know, whether we post whether we tend to speak of keeping people out or inviting people in. Um, but do, what do you see mostly that lakes that people feel the lake is theirs or that they're visiting someone else's place when you talk to the public? I mean, I, we haven't done an official survey or anything, but we see a lot of people as we go sample and post and that sort of thing and talk to them. And I think for the most part, that people feel that public lands are theirs. I mean, again, it's my community, it's that I work with are mostly in rural areas and that sort of thing. But we, um, you know, I, I think people do feel a sense of ownership if they've made it and have figured out that that lake is there for them. I think our bigger issue is probably the people that aren't aware of them and trying to increase that. Um, but once they're there, for the most part, people do feel ownership over that, of, you know, their ability to go kayak or swim or even just fish or even pick blackberries in the boat launch parking lot. We see a lot of that. And it's especially, yeah, I think there's some ownership there just from our conversations. It is, Jim. Um, I, I think some of the ownership comes with the size of the access to or the sort of ability for access, right? That, you know, some of the lakes I go to, it's chain link fence on either side, warning signs from the neighbors and a boat ramp or, or even just gravel going into a lake. And that's a whole different feel to ownership, right? And I think there's a different, you can see sort of that difference in, in how feel than, um, you know, someplace like Angle Lake or Steel Lake, where you have these larger parks um, and lots of people feeling like it's their space to go spread out, have fun, right? It feels that kind of public access feel. And so I think that there's a, uh, can be a difference. Yeah, right, right, right. In how, how
and then there's a um, there's a follow up question to that about if anyone has any ideas for strategies or tools for sort of in, increasing that sense of connection or ownership to water bodies by people who are not not lake shore owners. Anyone wants to speak to that? Some of it might just be taking down the chain link fencing. <laughs> I, I think that Jim just maybe kind of nailed it right there is most of our public access sites are really our boat launches. And some of those are so physically constrained, I'm not sure they can become anything else. But there are some out there that would allow for expansion and invitation. And I think in terms of the strategies, um, there are some grant funding sources out there to improve public access. And I. I imagine, uh, you know, squeaky wheels get the grease. So those people that are really pushing for it have probably historically been at the more affluent lakes and other things for improved areas. And so maybe working with some of the major funding sources like the RCO, the Recreation and Conservation Office, I think that's right, um, that runs those grant programs to maybe have a category specific to areas um, that are traditionally underserved potentially could be a strategy. Uh, to move forward and apply funding for those, or potentially it's WALPA identifying a few ones and encouraging the community to apply for these funding sources or partner with them or partner organizations within WALPA might be one idea. Yeah, I think it comes back down to the, the signage again and also capitalizing on um, the aesthetics to, to increase belongingness. Um, I do think the visitors that come and stroll um, the ones who do know about Bear Shepherd Park and uh, the waterfront access there, they feel like they own it, but it's, I don't know who said it in the, on the panel, but it's about, it's so small though, the ownership is so small, so it's just also connects to like power and like what you're worth um, in regards to being in that small, fa small space with your your friend or with your niece or with your children. Um, so the beautification piece, I think is very impactful and that's definitely neglected at the, the Southern end of, uh, of uh, Lake Washington. Um, and um, I think that needs to be paid attention to and really increase the, the use of it um, and increase the sense of belongingness and wanting to just stay there long periods of time um, because yeah, this boat launch situation is such a stratification um, between different demographics and, and people. Um, and that kind of discourages people to want to stay when there's a boat coming into the water. It, I don't know, boats are awesome, but at the same time, for me, when I see it, I, I, I see wealth um, and they don't have those things. And too, like when we go back to the definitions and stuff, I've talked to someone uh, about like a beach and like, I don't understand how is this a beach? There's no sand. I don't want to go. There's no sand. That's a great, yeah, you know, and I, and I was talking about some, I, I, I studied like the geological and, and um, like habitat attributes of uh, sockeye salmon um, in Alaska. And I talk about like, you know, like habitat, what does habitat look like? What is it, what attracts you to a habitat? What attracts you to a space? And um, yeah, that was something that was interesting where they criticized negatively um, about the substrate on the ground, uh, they wanted sand. So that was something that was uh, like a detrimental impact on, on some certain subpopulations on wanting to use the beach, which was interesting and overlooked. Another piece of that is, do people feel safe there? There's, I don't know as much if there's been good research on lake access specifically, but for urban parks and green spaces, there's been a lot of research on what makes a space feel safe and inviting to a community. And you can have all the signs you want, but if they don't feel like it's a safe spot. So just signs that a place is being kept and cared for, that there's designated things. Um, there's even been some fun studies with like prairie restoration type projects in the Midwest where they find that if they just mow a little strip around the edge and put up a cute little fence, suddenly people see it as beautiful and well-loved and inviting as opposed to overgrown and vacant and derelict. So it can be a few little things like that. But then also, is there lighting at night? Are there lines of sight so that people don't feel like someone's going to jump out from around a bush, any of those bits? 
So there's a fair bit about just urban park design that I think could be helpful here. Again, at a boat launch, we may have absolutely nothing to work with, but for places where we do, does it feel like someone cares for it? And are there other people around to have those eyes on the ground kind of thing? There's a lot out there on what can make a space feel safe, comfortable, and inviting. I think along with that, um, with one of the things that maybe is ignored here too is, you know, when we do have our parks here in Snohomish County and they're mostly on lakes within cities and the cities tend to take care of and have that uh, feel of being loved, but the fish and wildlife access parks and launches they're not very well taken care of and it's not really the fault of fish and wildlife. They are stretched so thin. I know the manager here that works on that cleaning and he does a tremendous amount of work and is always out doing it, but simply they right now don't have the resources to take care and manage those uh, public access sites like they are kind of deserve to be. So some solution may be either addressing the underlying funding sources for the care of our public pro uh, properties in the state um, and on top of that, when that's not feasible, is developing partnerships and working with those lake landowners. They can be used as a resource. We've seen that a lot where when they've adopted an area, that public access site is so much more inviting, clear of trash, clear of you know, um, debris and blackberries and that thing. And so they can be a real asset and working with them to you know, make everybody feel welcome. I think I what you know. Ma sorry, ma making it inviting is also about actually sending out invitations, right? So I think that, you know, one of the things that we happen in summer is there's usually like, you know, th it shows up in the newspaper or, you know, sorry, old school, shows up in print um, or it actually shows up on your um, on your phone. Um, but um, where to go? But it tends to be, you know, go to Lake Roosevelt, right? Or go someplace that's way, you know, way away from where you actually live and requires money and access and things that, you, that people don't have as opposed to here's all the different places in your neighborhood right not one place in the county or something but where where are all the access points right letting people in on the spots that they can go to um and kind of giving them that access um is a it, it like that's a big invitation it's just to say here's where we're recommending that you can go and you know near you to actually find some great places when it gets hot in the summertime um and then the other piece is about spending effort and money on working on those places that um where people need the most access right so in places where uh, finances are low and access to green space is really needed. Um, we tend to write off water bodies, unfortunately, for the things that they're needed most, right? So when it's getting hot during climate change issues, um, you know, people are looking for the space, but, you know, in Wapato Lake in Pierce County, you can walk around it, but you can't go swimming in it. Um, if, you know, a bunch of those places that have public access it's only near the water at certain times of the summer. You can't actually get in the water. Um, and so I think that there's a need to create those inviting spaces and actually make them usable in the way that people need them. And so I think that's, again, what Ashley and, and Daniel and other folks were talking about is trying to get information on what people would use them for, not necessarily what they use them for now. Um, and it's somewhat of a chicken and an egg thing because the people that are there are probably using it for what they can do right now, as opposed to thinking about what they would do with them sometimes. So um, how do you get a hold of those people that want to use it for something else? That's great. I just want to say one quick thing, if possible, um, and I think everyone touched on it, I really do, is that I think it's incredibly important and vital to have a participatory approach to this. They have to be at the round table. I believe, I'm a firm believer in citizen science, right? And there's some incredible informal scientists out there um, who have incredible ideas, innovative ideas, forward thinking ideas that could be included in how to be um, effective on going about this and creating more access points and, and being in charge of maybe the design of the light fixtures that need to be um, installed at the beaches. Um, it's just, really need to have an eclectic bunch of people together to come up with a solid plan. I think it becomes way more robust um, and impactful in the long run. So I just want to say that's all about like collective action on this. That's great. 
we have a, a just a short time left and there's um there's questions coming in um from the audience that we probably don't have time to get to but i just want to mention there's a couple of comments talking about um both the, the signage related to things like uh, uh as in daniel's example with the prairies things like signage that uh, helps people discern between something like a restoration project and something being overgrown or neglected, you know, where we have things that might be growing back or might be, you know, pulled of vegetation for a short time uh, while something's ongoing. Things like where sandy beaches are and aren't appropriate in like in terms of lake health or the, the lake function uh, and some of the things, especially in small spaces, maybe the potential conflict between very heavy use and the environmental needs of the lake. Um, and so the questions we can continue to dwell on um, in the in the just five minutes that we have left. Um, I want to I want to give them a chance to take a quick break before we go to the student posters. So um, just really quickly, I want to think about what Walpa's role in this might be. Right. We don't have we, we you know, we don't have um, huge pots of money that we can give to these things. We don't have. Uh, necessarily all the resources to solve this, but we do have an amazing network, right? There's people out here watching from counties across the state, from all sorts of different agencies, from different research bodies, from different community groups. Um, what is something you think that we could do within this organization that would be helpful um, to this question? I think going forward, if we were to take something and, and, and move forward with it, what do you think something effective could be? And we'll try to make this just really quick if everybody has one quick comment before we end. Like you said, just networking. Um, honestly, I've been looking for a community organization just like Ashley's. I didn't know her or existed until we ended up on the same panel today. So I'll be reaching out to you for um, some ongoing partnership stuff. But yeah, if Wal Walpa can just do help with the matchmaking. I think the question is, is Walpa uh I'm not muted. <laughs> I was trying to say that WAPLA doesn't have a lot of money, but we can and have successfully influenced policy decisions in the past. So if there was one policy decision, whether it be with the state or something like that, that could really help to make this change, if we could carefully maybe collaboratively, participatorily think of what that policy change would be, a very actionable item, and go for it, that that's probably, besides the networking component, our, our best bet. Jim or Ashley, do you have a final thought? Just building those bridges would be fantastic. Um, you all are fantastic for what you do. And it's been wonderful to meet you on this panel. But yeah, building bridges, expanding networks. I, I do think uh, similar to what uh, Marissa is saying is I think um, WAPA it, it's a good thing for WAPA to get into on the policy side and try to figure out if there are ways to um, fund some things along, um, you know, uh, volunteer monitoring and volunteer um, actions or recognition for people who go and maintain these public spaces, um, who send out flyers about this, who are collecting information. Uh, it seems like trying to get um, kind of working that angle to really develop a statewide program is, is definitely needed and something that WALPA can coordinate across the state. Great. Oh, uh, thank you all. I want to give a couple of, of minutes um, to, to let the media transition to the next um, next session. So I, I think that um, I'm seeing that the, the session will restart again at five after nine uh, for the student posters. Um, so everyone out there in TV land, uh, YouTube land that's watching, uh, take a quick break and get some coffee and come back to see those students and their work. And a big thank you to everyone who joined us this morning. Thank you for all of your thoughts. Thanks, Avery. Thank you so much. Thank you, Avery.
Good morning and welcome to the student poster session. I'm um, Rob Zazette and I'm here to introduce uh, four student posters that we have today, three of which are winners of scholarships. I'm very excited. Uh, we're starting a little bit early, five minutes early from what was posted on the program so we can give these students their time. Uh, they only get uh, their lightning talks. They're gonna spend about five minutes just briefly summarizing their posters. I hope you all took your time to, to read them. They're excellent posters. So let's get started. We're gonna start with uh, Catherine Swenson. She's our PhD candidate scholarship winner uh, for the Nan uh, Nancy Weller Memorial Fund. And so let's take it away, Katie. Hey, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Swenson and I am a PhD candidate at Washington State University and today I'll be presenting my uh, preliminary findings for my research that is supported by the Nancy Weller Memorial Scholarship. So as you can see from my title, Impacts of Wildfire Reaping Events on Water Storage and Transport in the Washington Cascades, my research focuses on the uh, had water's hydrologic dynamics rather than the surface water bodies. So I'll give you a quick nickel tour of my uh, poster. So if I could get the next slide, please. This will be a zoom in, yeah, the background section. So the motivation for this research is derived in the climate-induced stresses on our hydrologic systems in the West. Not only are um, snowmelt uh, level or excuse me, snowmelt rates accelerating in the spring, um, snowpack is also declining. And then we are also experiencing an increase in wildfire activity in some places in the West. And this increase in wildfire activity impacts um, down gradient ecosystems by um, sedimentation and erosion. And it can also disrupt uh, the timing and magnitude of water availability to uh, down gradient streams and uh, lakes. And in Washington state in particular, uh, wildfire activity is projected to continue increasing through the end of the 21st century. And we can see that in the upper right um, figure there with area burned on the Y axis and then time on the X axis from the 20th century in that blue box through the end of the 21st century in the red and orange boxes. And this increase in wildfire activity in Washington has led to a rebirth events in some ecosystems that are historically adapted to much longer wildfire return intervals. And so an example here is shown in the bottom right figure. And um, you can see that there are three severe wildfire burn perimeters that are overlapping. And this is on the south slope of Mount Adams, which is my field site. And these wildfires occurred between 2004 and 2015, with the previous wildfire um, not occurring for more than 200 years in the past. So um, these events are unprecedented, and we don't really know how these reburn events impact hydrologic recovery in these systems. And so that's the aim of this research is to quantify that impact. Next slide, please. So my field sites are on Mount Adams, and I have a series of plots that were either unburned for more than 200 years or burned once, um, twice, or um, one site that was burned three times. And so I draw your attention to the far right three pictures. Those are the sites I'm focusing on in this poster, the single, double, and triple, most recent burn in 2015. At each of these sites, I am monitoring snow accumulation and ablation using snow depth poles shown in that picture on the right, that orange pole in the far background is my monitoring pole, and then I have game cameras mounted on trees. Um, I'm also monitoring uh, soil, vegetation, meteorological data, and hydrologic data in order to quantify um, the uh, seasonal water balance in each of these sites. Next slide, please. So these are the uh, very preliminary findings of my research, and I wanted to point out two main results that I thought were particularly interesting. So the first is in the top half of this slide. Um, on that uh, plot on the upper left, we have major snow events occurring over the snow season. 
Um, those lines are representing uh, the single burn site in the yellow, double in orange, and triple burn in the red. And we can see that first point is the first initial snow cover. And so um, all the sites have snow cover at the same time. Next set of point shows the last full day of snow cover. And then uh, the third set of points shows when snow melt is complete in the spring. And so the takeaway here is that spring snowmelt occurs almost two weeks earlier in the triple burn site than it does in the single burn site. But the double burn site melts almost a week after the single burn site. And this could be because of um, a bunch of downed um, horsewoody debris that you might be able to see in the far right picture of the double burn site. And then the second major result I'd like to draw your attention to is shown in the bottom right figure. So we have the summer hillslope water partitioning in the single, double, and triple burn sites. On the y-axis is the percent contribution of the cumulative water balance, uh, excuse me, cumulative water year precipitation. And so the blue represents potential evapotranspiration, the red is soil storage, and the yellow is the residual. And the residual could be um, evapotranspiration that's occurring outside of the snow-free period, but um, it also is um, the runoff and the deep drainage that's occurring from these sites. And so we can see in the double burn site that there is a higher um, component of that precipitation that is in the residual. But we only see evidence of runoff in the triple burn site. So that image is some rills um, that are um, present in the triple burn site. So um, my hypothesis is that the double burn site actually has a lot more deep drainage. And then next slide, please. And so the, the, we see evidence of um, early melt in the triple burn site. We see evidence of um, runoff in the triple burn site. And then we see evidence of these large outflows in the double burn site. And all of these have implications for early season flooding um, in downstream or downgradient ecosystems, and then lower late season flows in watersheds that have experienced more frequent wildfire. Um, one potential uh, benefit is uh, those coarse woody debris, the downed logs in the double burn site, which may um, partially counteract the impact of that um, earlier um, snow melt um, that occurs in our uh, reburn sites. And so the next steps of this research are to uh, incorporate a um, physical hydrologic model to better partition those outflows into runoff and uh, deep drainage. And then I will be incorporating some climate um, projections in order to look at the hydrologic fluxes on under a future climate. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That was excellent. We're going to move quickly to our next presenter, Salvador Rob Chavez. Salvador uh, is our MS student scholarship winner of the Dan Dave Lamb Memorial Fund. And so take it away, Salvador. Thank you, Rob. Hello, my name is Salvador Rob Chavez and I am currently a graduate student at Washington State University of Vancouver pursuing an MS degree in environmental science. Uh, today, I would like to share with you the project comprising my master's thesis work entitled Broad Scale Distribution, Abundance and Habitat Association of the Asian Clam, Corbicula fluminea in the Lower Columbia River, USA. Here, I will briefly summarize background information, my methods, and my preliminary results regarding the distribution and abundance of C. fluminea throughout the Lower Columbia River. Uh, but first, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors uh, and my advisors, uh, Dr. Steve Bolins, Dr. Gretchen Rowan, Reagan Bolins, uh, our always helpful uh, lab manager, Julie Zimmerman, um, of the WSU Vancouver Aquatic Ecology Group, as well as Tim Cunahan of USGS uh, for all of their guidance and support in this project. Uh, so a bit of background, Corbicula fluminea, commonly known as the Asian clam, is an invasive freshwater bivalve originating in Eastern and Southern Asia, which has successfully established itself in many Atlantic and Lodic ecosystems of temperate and tropical regions around the world. Uh, C. fluminea establishes itself quickly in novel ecosystems due to its hermaphroditic reproduction and is thought to have deleterious effects on invaded ecosystems. Uh, 
as well as human infrastructure and aquatic systems. Uh, these effects might include the alteration of sediment dynamics through uh, bioturbation from their pedal feeding activity. Um, it could also include outcompeting native bivalve species in our area. An example that comes to mind is unionids uh, for food and space. Um, and clogging up human infrastructure like heat exchangers uh, or pipes with their mucoid secretions and larvae. Uh, the invaded range of sea fluminea includes the Columbia River and its impounded lacustrine areas, uh, and it's been known to be present there since about 1938 due to human transmission, transmission vectors like uh, shipping ballast. Uh, and it's since become well established. Previous studies have recorded main channel densities up to 722 individuals per square meter and near shore densities up to 500 individuals per square meter. Um, but despite these negative effects on invaded ecosystems uh, and 80 years of occurrence in the Columbia River, the literature regarding sea fluminate in the Columbia River is uh, extremely limited. Uh, thus, our ongoing study seeks to expand the existing body of research by addressing the following research questions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first question, what is the broad scale distribution and abundance of C. fluminea in the lower Columbia River? Uh, the second question being, which environmental vi variables are the best predictors of C. fluminea abundance? And the third, how does C. fluminea morphological condition vary spatially in relation to these environmental variables? Next slide, please. So our study area. Um, from 2017 through 2020, we collected adult and juvenile sea fluminea from 26 near shore, shown in the top panel there, A, and 15 main channel sampling sites uh, spanning 537 river kilometers of the lower Columbia. Uh, at each site, I also measured a number of environmental variables, including dissolved oxygen, pH, water temperature, salinity, specific conductivity, water depth, geographic location, chlorophyll A concentration, riverbed slope, and sediment samples to determine size fractionation and organic matter content. Um, at the shore base sampling sites, so sites shown in figure 2A, uh, triplicate one meter square samples were taken at five meter intervals um, at a water depth of 30 centimeters consistently with all C. fluminate individuals of shell length greater than two millimeters collected from the top 15 centimeters of substrate. Um, and then at the shipboard sampling stations within Bonneville Reservoir, shown in figure 2B, um, uh, that sampling was carried out on board the USGS RV Merlin, utilizing triplicate ponar grab samples deployed from the deck uh, down to water depths of up to 30 meters. Um, and on the next slide, we'll take a look at some preliminary results regarding the nearshore distribution and abundance of C. fluminea um, as sampled in 2019. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, you got it already. All right. Um, the 78 observations of C. fluminate abundance from 2019 shore-based sampling ranged from 0 to 427 individuals per square meter. Uh, figure 4 here displays the abundance of C. fluminate as nested circles, uh, and these represent triplicate samples taken at each sampling site throughout the Columbia River. Um, and the pattern of distribution shows a majority of samples with abundances greater than 100 individuals per square meter uh, were located west of Bonneville Dam and uh, near the most developed areas of the river, while the majority of samples with zero C. fluminate abundance were located to its east. Um, the station featuring the greatest average abundance of C. fluminate um, was near the Sandy River confluence at Gresham, Oregon, and that had 342 individuals per square meter averaged between the three triplicate samples. Um, and these observations of abundance represent the broadest spatial scale of C. fluminea sampling to date in the Columbia River and are generally consistent with, um, albeit slightly lower than, those made in the two previous studies known to us, both of which were uh, more limited in the spatial extent of their sampling. Next, next slide, please. Uh, with 2020 shore-based sampling effort ongoing, future work includes sample processing to characterize sediments qualitatively by soil type and quantitatively by size fractionation and total organic carbon content. Um, this information will be included in mixed model regression analyses uh, to explore the relationships between habitat characteristics um, or environmental variables as predictor variables and uh, sea fluminate abundance and morphological condition determined via their link to math mass ratio uh, as dependent variables. Um, by elucidating relationships between C. fluminea population biology and habitat characteristics in the Lower Columbia River, we aim to provide natural resource and infrastructure managers with valuable information on where, when, and why C. fluminea invades temperate river ecosystems, and we expect our findings to be relevant uh, to other invasive bivalves, uh, such as dry-scented mussels, 
which utilize similar means of reproduction and dispersal. Um, so that concludes the summary. I would like to thank WALPA for its support of this research through the Dave Lamb Memorial Scholarship uh, and USGS staff for their logistical and technical support of this project. Thank you. Well, thank you. Am I on? I, Jesus. I am. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, we've got Crystal. Crystal uh, Sonoy is um, ready to give her presentation, so take it away, Crystal. Yes. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Crystal Sonoa. I am an environmental science student. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I am an environmental science student at University of Idaho. I am in my undergraduate. The project that I worked on this summer with Enbury allowed me to work with uh, Dr. Frank Wilhelm from University of Idaho College of Natural Resources. And we were looking at the effects of boat wakes on the near shore of um, waterways, specifically the Spokane River in North Idaho. And I will go over a little bit of our project during this presentation. Next slide, please. For the background, um, eutrophication is a very complex global environmental issue, and we are studying um, cultural eutrophication, which is the increase and um, um, increase of uh, different nutrients into the waterways that are caused and attributed mostly from human activity. Um, so, water sports over the past 80 years has become um, a very popular recreational activity. And since about the 1980s, boat technology has been improving um, to where boats can now make intentional waves for different recreational sports. Um, so, we are studying the Spokane River, which is a um, very popular site in North Idaho, and we are studying the uh, the connection near the Spokane River and the Lake Coeur d'Alene. So um, our focus area in this study began with turbidity, which we are going further into this study with um, different phosphorus levels and trying to create a turbidity phosphorus relationship. But up until this point, the scope of the study has um, solely been focused on turbidity. Um, so phosphorus is typically a limiting nutrient in many freshwater systems and um, with nutrient resuspension, which uh, is related to turbidity, there can be an overgrowth of um, cyanobacteria because of the uh, phosphorus release from the sediment resuspension. Um, next slide, please. So we wanted to choose an area on the Spokane River that was kind of representative of a natural riparian zone. And we were able to find that. And again, we're located, if you check out the map on the very top under site selection, we're located right at the mouth of the Spokane River that leads from Lake Coeur d'Alene. We're di directly south of the Blackwell Island boat launch. Um, and we are outside of a no wake zone. So that does give us the chance to experience the actual boat wake versus wave activity. With our site selection, we wanted to choose a site that was more representative of the riparian zones that did not have any additional um, armoring or um, any sand addition that was from humans. Um, so we wanted to have something that had um, that, had that representation to where we can see the natural sediments of the area and the site that we chose did have a, a sediment um, characterization of mostly silt and a little bit of sand. And when we did set up our project, um, we had to make sure that we were very consistent with our data collection. And this project so far was um, over the summer was mostly focused on data collection of turbidity. Um, so we used a few different ways to collect data that we were focused on. We used a turbidity meter to measure turbidity, and then we also used a, uh, a water level logger. And we wanted to measure the different boat wake activity compared to the natural wave activity. And with our data collection, our sampling method, we took uh, water samples at 15 minute intervals and we measured the turbidity. Um, and then we also counted uh, every boat and documented the type of boat and the time the boat 
past our location. That way we can kind of match the boat activity and the frequency of boats and the disturb disturbance of the wakes and match it with our hydrographs from our water level logger. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so our results, very preliminary, but our results did show that um, there is a correlation between boat activity and um, wave versus wake height. So the very top graph is a hydrograph from um, August 7th through August 8th. And this took place over midday about 11 a.m. Um, on August 7th overnight into the morning of August 8th. And we can see that there is substantial wave and wake activity during the daytime. And it does taper off and there's hardly any wave activity overnight. And then um, again, it picks up in the morning. And the very first, uh, I guess you would say, the, the first activity that you see on August 8th at around 6 a.m., that is a uh, fishing boat activity. And below we have a chart that uh, we were tracking the, the type of boats and the time the boats passed. And we could see that just from August 7th, from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m., we had a total of 225 watercraft that did pass our area. And that is what is representative in the hydrograph above all, with all of that wake activity. Um, I only did track the, the, the watercraft. I didn't track kayaks or like smaller personal unmotorized watercraft, but from going here on out, I think we are looking into tracking that type of activity just to see the, the type of use that this area is getting on, on a daily basis in the summer months. Um, next slide, please. So here we have um, a graph that shows the average daytime turbidity. And we start out early in the morning and we can see that turbidity is less than 10 in TU. And that is representative of what the background turbidity normally is. And then we see a steady increase throughout the day up until about nine from our last uh, measurements. And then we can uh, tell, we can correlate the, the turbidity increase with the boat counts and the traffic and the boat disturbances that take place with the, the graph off to the right. We see that correlation with increased turbidity and increased boating activity. And this is a very typical representation of a summer day throughout the busy summer months where turbidity is, the background turbidity is, is standardly um, below 10 NTU, but then it does increase over, over the daytime. And, most of the days that we did study included weekdays. So it's not, this is a phenomenon that takes place just daily in the, the busy summer months. Next slide, please. So our conclusions up until this point, we do see that there is a correlation between boating activity, wave and wake height and boat wake height, the wave frequency um, and the uh, magnitude of the disturbance from each wake. Uh, as well as the increase of turbidity. So that's correlated together. Um, so we do want to study further into this, this project and we want to get um, a total phosphorus analysis from, from all of our water samples. And the point of, of this project is to, to create a turbidity phosphorus relationship to where we can be able to predict the total amount of, of nutrient um, uh, of sediment resuspension and nutrient reintroduction uh, based off of just a, a few samples of the, the turbidity in, in the set area and then also the, um, the sediment analysis. So depending on what type of substrate is located in an area, whether or not it's a, a silt or a clay or sand um, versus gravel and, and more sandy areas. We want to be able to create a relationship to where we can use um, this relationship as a tool to predict the, the type of nutrient reintroduction and sediment resuspension in water. I would like to acknowledge Idaho Embree for funding this project. Um, and I also would like to acknowledge uh, uh, Professor Julianne Middlesworth, who is at North Idaho College, who did help with a lot of this, uh, the development of this project. Thank you.
Thank you, Crystal. Uh, next up, we've got Hannah Hakenstad. She's our undergrad scholarship winner. And um, let's go, Hannah. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. All right. So I'm Hannah Hockenstad, and I am an undergraduate student in the environmental science program at the University of Idaho. And Frank Wilhelm is my co-author. And today is going to be showing, I'm going to be showing some of my preliminary results for my senior project right now. So my project was on the spatial distribution of zooplankton in Willow Creek Reservoir in relation to hypolimnetic anoxia and the implications for pelagic grazing. All right, next slide. So zooplankton densities and population fluctuate in response to late chemistry changes like hypolimnetic anoxia. And one of the species that's pretty impacted by that is Daphnia. And that's because they go through diurnal vertical migration and that can be interrupted when the hypolimnion becomes anoxic. So that would force them out of their deep and cold water refuge out into the water column and potentially out of the pelagic. So what we're looking at here is really what do Daphnia do in response to hypolimnia, hypolimnetic anoxia and how does this change their grazing pressure? So my study area was Willow Creek Reservoir in Hefner, Oregon, and it's in like Eastern Oregon. And then next slide. And my objectives were to examine the relationship between hypolimnetic anoxia and the spatial distribution of Daphnia. Where do they go and what do they do when hypolimnetic anoxia sets in? And my other objective was to measure Daphnia size and track those changes throughout the summer. So I was testing the null hypothesis that the vertical and horizontal migration or distribution of Daphnia is not related to the change in dissolved oxygen concentrations with depth in Willow Creek Reservoir. And my prediction is as those deep water refuges become anoxic, they're no longer inhabitable for zooplankton. So they're gonna boogie on up the water column and potentially migrate out towards the near shore areas to evade predation from fish. Next slide. My methods to collecting my samples were to collect vertical and horizontal samples of zooplankton in triplicates along two transects from the pelagic to the near shore and then collect physicochemical data. And that was temperature and dissolved oxygen. And then so in this figure to the right, that's where my transects are and those are my sample sites. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about the data that comes from the two that are highlighted in red, and that's MS1, which is my pelagic site, and MS3, which is my near shore site. Once I got my samples, I counted the zooplankton, I photographed them, and then I measured their body size in image J. Next. And then here are my preliminary results. We're going to start from the top of these and move down, and we're going to start at the left one. Those top two graphs are the uh, profile data. And so the blue line represents temperature, and then the red line represents anoxia. So on June 9th, anoxia hasn't hit yet. And then Daphnia are in the, it's the turquoise color down in the bar grass. And so the density of Daphnia at site MS1, my pelagic site, are approximately equal to the density of Daphnia at MS3. So there is no significant difference between the Daphnia densities of those sites. But when we go over to August, that's when hypolimnetic anoxia has hit. And you can see that through that red uh, gradient um, graph at the top. And then when you look at the bar graphs, you can see that the density of Daphnia in MS1 is significantly less than the density of Daphnia in the MS3 site, which is the near shore site. So there is a significant difference between uh, the densities of Daphnia between the pelagic and the near shore. And then when we look over at this next graph, this is the distribution of the cohort sizes of my Daphnia. I broke my Daphnia sizes up into cohorts and then graphed them like this. And you can see that there's really no significant changes in their body size depending on their location. It doesn't matter if they're in the near shore or in the pelagic, they're approximately the same size. And then next slide. And then this is the p-values for the t-tests for the changes in density and in size between those pelagic and near shore sites for June and then, Ju and then August. So like I said, in June, there is no significant um, 
difference between the density or size with an alpha of one. And then when you look at August, there is significant difference for density of zooplankton um, in density, but not in size. Then next. So upon initial analysis, we can reject the null hypothesis. There is a significant difference between the, the densities of zooplankton between MS1, which is the pelagic, and MS3, which is the near shore. There are no significant differences, however, with an alpha of one in Daphnia size between the pelagic and the near shore. And then going forward, I'm going to be counting the final set of samples that I have from 27th of September. Those will be counted, measured, and analyzed with the t-test just as the rest of this data was. And then I'm going to go and do an ANOVA test to see if there is a significant difference between sites and dates. And then I'm also going to calculate grazing pressure for each site, and that data will really inform the difference in grazing pressures between the near shore and the pelagic sites and the implications for the growth of algae when those pelagic grazers are absent since they are more in the near shore areas. So our results to date strongly suggest that pelagic grazing pressure is reduced during uh, anoxia. Next. I want to thank the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for field and logistical support. And I want to give you a big thanks, Walpa, for considering this project and awarding it the Undergraduate Research Scholarship. It truly made my year. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at this email. And thanks so much for watching. Tune in. in. Well, thank you so much, Hannah. That was really exciting for all four of you. So we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately. I wish I would have scheduled more. My bad. But here, a quick one. Katie, ready? I'm going to put all three questions in one. Uh, did you evaluate the time between burns, the severity of the burn, and the soil and or the soil organic matter and, and its effects? Yeah, uh, so I didn't, but a previous student on this project did. So uh, the time between fires, um, well, I suppose we didn't analyze that quite as much, but we have the other, the single and the double that were burned most recently in 2008. So we can compare um, more recent time after fire and then longer time after fire. Uh, and then um, severity was, um, it was severe at all of the sites. Um, and then soil organic matter was um, statistically significantly higher in the unburned site only. And then all of the others were statistically similar. Well, great, you answered it perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. Salvador, you're up. Did you evaluate river flow or macrophyte uh, presence in, in corbicular distribution? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, thus far in the study, we have not incorporated river flow or macrophytes. Um, macrophytes is something I did not consider, but river flow uh, is something that I have been. If I can get that GIS data, you can bet that I'm going to be incorporating into the study. Um, so thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> well, that sounds like a good plan. Okay, Crystal, uh, will you evaluate the effects of shoreline hardening and uh, the difference between wake boats and other boats? Um, I'm not familiar with the shoreline hardening. I don't know what that means. Oh, that uh, would be uh, bulkheads versus natural vegetate, natural shoreline versus, you know, the bulkhead. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, that is a, a great thing to actually observe. So maybe, maybe, yes, I will talk to Dr. Frank Guggenheim to ask him. Good. All right. Um, and then the other part of that question. Oh, the, other, the other part is about uh, wake boats and how yes. you know, th those waves are bigger and have you separated out sort of the differences between motorboats? Uh, yes, that's, that's actually what we were doing. Um, so we were focusing on uh, boats that would create larger wakes and um, larger disturbance. And we are matching those boat types with the hydrographs. And so far, uh, what we found is that wake boats in particular, uh, boats that are have technology to make intentional wakes, as well as pontoon boats, which was the rest of me, the largest disturbance. Um, but this is again ongoing, so we need we need more data. Well, that's interesting. I think we're all very excited to hear uh, what you're going to come up with, all of you actually. And I'm sorry, we are uh, just about out of time. Hannah, your questions haven't come in yet. I'm going to 
still waiting. I'm sure they're going to come in. Hey, you know, well, well, we'll get them to you. You guys, you guys have done a fabulous research. I'm, I'm very impressed, um, really. And I am really uh, grateful for your time today. Uh, again, um, I'll make sure we get more time next time. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we will forward you additional questions as they come in. And I would like to thank the audience too for sticking around and um, we'll see you at the next session. Thank you. Yeah.
Good morning and welcome to Health Risks. Um, I'm pleased to uh, introduce our next three speakers. First two uh, regarding the health risk of arsenic and followed up uh, finally with um, microcystin. I'm sure these will all be very exciting uh, presentations. So let's begin uh, right away. And then we will ask uh, uh, the, the presenters questions at the end of the three presentations to allow a little bit more time to get those questions to me. And uh, let's start with Marco Barajas and Aaron Hall. Take it away. Barajas, and I'll be co-presenting with Aaron Hall. Other authors made it possible is James Gowell, Kenneth Burkhart, Ricky Pendergrass from UW Tacoma, and Samantha Fung, Pamela Barrett, Rebecca Newman, and Julian Olden from UW Seattle. Also, we have Brian Jackson from Dartmouth College. This presentation is on human health risk from consumption of aquatic species in arsenic contaminated shallow urban lakes. The Osarco Copper Smelter was located in Western Washington and operated for nearly a century. The smelter was decommissioned in the 1980s and demolished in the early 1990s. The plumes from the smelter had deposited arsenic and lead across the south central Puget Sound region, which raised health concerns for people that live in North Tacoma and Russian area, which became a Superfund site. Past studies done by Gao and others have reported high levels of arsenic in sediments from lakes in the affected area. Here we can see two pictures of the Osarco's copper smelter. And on the bottom right, you can see the arsenic concentrations from the plumes downwind from the Osarco smelter. After examining several lakes for arsenic contamination, the study focused on two of the most contaminated lakes found from the research led by Gowell in 2014. Both Lake Killarney and Angle Lake have 200 parts per million of arsenic in the sediments. Angle Lake is a deep lake of around 14 meters at max depth, Lake Killarney being a shallow lake of around 4 meters max depth. The hypolunians in both of these lakes experience anoxia in the summertime. Furthermore, Angle Lake will stratify through the season, whereas Lake Killarney undergoes frequent mixing events, which is very typical in most of the shallow lakes. In both lakes, arsenic is released from the sediments during periods of anoxia. In Angle Lake, the arsenic remains in the anoxic hypolimnium for the most part and separated from the organisms residing in the oxic epilimnium of the lake. In Lake Killarney, on the other hand, frequent mixing events causes the release of arsenic to mix in the oxic water column where the majority of the organisms reside. Evidence of this hypothesis is that phytoplankton arsenic concentrations in Lake Killarney is around 970 parts per million, whereas Angle Lake has a max of 170 parts per million. With such high levels of arsenic at the base of the food chain, we wonder, how does this translate to higher trophic levels in the food web? And ultimately, what are the implications for human health? Arsenic, without a doubt, is toxic to humans and other biota. In addition to being carcinogen, even at low levels of long-term exposure to arsenic has been related to an increased incidence of diabetes, hypertensions, decrease of male fertility and other reproductive tissues, kidney and bladder disorders, cardiovascular disease and respiratory problems. In 2019, the Agency of Toxic Substance and Disease Registry listed arsenic as number one on the substance priority list. So we decided to quantify arsenic concentrations in the edible tissues of three organisms commonly found in the lakes of the region and known to be consumed by humans. These species are snails, crayfish, and fish. We also assess the human health risk from consuming these organisms later on. The organisms collected were from lakes that have been studied from the past. These lakes have a range of arsenic concentrations in sediments and different mixing regimes. Three lakes are considered shallow of less than eight meters and therefore polymictic and represent a gradient of arsenic contamination. Lake Killarney being the highest arsenic in the sediment followed by Steel Lake having moderate and Bonnie Lake having the lowest amount or considered the reference site. Two lakes are considered deep having more than 10 meters max depth. Angle Lake being the highest arsenic amount, followed by Pine Lake being the low arsenic or the reference site. 
Bonnie Lake didn't have any crayfish, so we decided to use Pine Lake as a low or reference site to collect the crayfish from. The next three slides show the species caught for the project. All species are non-native except for the signal crayfish. We analyzed the edible tissues for total arsenic and a subset of samples were sent to Dartmouth for arsenic speciation. Each symbol indicates a lake and the open symbol signifies that it is a deep and seasonally stratified lake. The closed symbols indicate shallow polymectic lakes. Arsenic in the snail tissue increases as the background arsenic in the sediment increases as well, Lake Killarney being significantly higher than the other three lakes. The figure to the left has a better correlation between arsenic in the snail tissue and arsenic in the shallow sediments as opposed to arsenic in the deeper sediments shown in the right figure. Arsenic concentrations follows the same trend as the snails, pine being the lowest and Killarney being the highest. Moreover, there are higher arsenic concentration in the pancreas as opposed to the tail meat for the crayfish. Once again, Killarney is significantly higher than pine and steel. The reason why we analyze the hepatopancreas is that it is also a food source known as the crayfish butter. Arsenic concentration is significantly higher in Killarney followed by Steel Lake. Both Bonnie and Angle Lake have the same concentration in fish muscle tissue despite the difference in sediment concentration. Angle Lake having 35 parts per million and Bonnie Lake having 10 parts per million. Fish spend most of their time in oxic water columns where arsenic concentration in both Angle and Bonnie are less than 2 parts per million. The summary table shows the overall transfer of arsenic from sediments to primary producers down to the higher trophic levels. The amount of arsenic in each species correlates to the sediment concentrations. Arsenic being the highest in Killarney, followed by Steel, Angle, and Bonnie Lake. You will notice that phytoplankton soaks up more arsenic than the background sediment concentrations, except for Bonnie and Angle. Zooplankton then eat phytoplankton and are then consumed by snails or fish in the process of filter feeding. Crayfish, on the other hand, will eat whatever they can get their hands on. Arsenic in fish muscle tissues are less than one part per million. Unfortunately, there is no data for crayfish in Angle and Bonnie as there aren't any reports of crayfish spawning in these lakes. And now I will pass it on to Erin Hull and she will talk about arsenic speciation and the health assessment. Thanks, Marco. So here we have a bar graph of the percent inorganic and organic arsenic in organisms from Steel and Killarney Lakes. We are interested in these ratios because the risk assessment model only takes inorganic arsenic into account. This is because inorganic arsenic is much more toxic to humans than organic forms of arsenic. We included phytoplankton here to explain why snails have such a high percentage of inorganic arsenic. Phytoplankton and paraphyton are the main component of a snail's diet and mostly comprised of inorganic arsenic, whereas crayfish and fish have a more varied diet and are positioned a bit higher up in the food web. This trend you see here is expected because arsenic is biotransformed with each trophic transfer along the food chain. Fish in particular are known to contain high amounts of ASB, which is an organic arsenic compound that is relatively non-toxic to humans and other biota. To assess the human health risk of consuming each type of organism, we applied the average percentage of inorganic arsenic in organisms from Steel and Killarney to all lakes in the study. We focused on three different adult, so 18 years and older, consumption rates used by the EPA, and these are all for the consumption of freshwater and estuarine organisms only. We have the mean consumption rate representing the general U.S. population. This category has two slightly different consumption rates, shellfish, which are the snails and crayfish in the study at 3.27 grams per day, and finfish at 4.23 grams per day. Then we have the 90th percentile consumption rate, which is recommended by the EPA because it is more protective of high consuming populations at 17.5 grams per day. And this rate combines both fin fish and shellfish. And finally, we have the 99th percentile consumption rate, which is an average rate based off of subsistence fishing populations in the US at 142.4 grams per day. Again, combining shellfish and fin fish. 
So results for the non-cancer health risks are presented as a dosage based on the amount of inorganic arsenic in edible tissues. Non-cancer health risks may include skin disorders, reproductive issues, developmental and cognitive disruptions, complications of urinary and gastrointestinal systems, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases, to name a few. So for the 99th percentile of consumers, we found that snails from all lakes and Killarney crayfish are above the EPA's chronic oral reference dose for non-cancer effects, which is three times 10 to the negative four micrograms of inorganic arsenic per gram. Uh, highlighted in yellow, and basically means that non-cancerous adverse health effects are possible. And Killarney snails are also above the reference dose for the 90th percentile of consumers. Here we see the cancer risk part of the assessment. Results for cancer risk are a little different than the non-cancer risk dosage. So a value of one times 10 to the negative five or E negative five means one additional cancer occurrence and 100,000 people. Here, we're considering an increased cancer risk to be above 10 to the negative five based on recommendations by the EPA. Results that exceed that limit are highlighted in, in yellow. Results highlighted in orange represent an even higher increased cancer risk, exceeding one additional cancer occurrence in 10,000 individuals or 10 to the negative four. The most concerning results are those with an increased cancer risk above 10 to the negative three or one additional cancer occurrence in just 1,000 individuals, highlighted in red. Snails from Angle, Steel, and Killarney at the 99th percentile consumption rate are flagged at that level, with Killarney snails resulting in over four additional cancer occurrences in 1,000 people. Overall, the cancer risk from consuming each type of organism decreases with increasing trophic level. This is partly due to the percentage of inorganic arsenic, which also decreases with increasing trophic level. Furthermore, shallow lakes with moderate or high arsenic contamination, steel and Killarney, consistently high, have the highest cancer risk for each type of organism. Maximum arsenic concentrations in Angle Lake sediments are just as high as Killarney yet its cancer risk levels are still lower than both steel and Killarney. Another takeaway from these results is that unregulated consumption of Chinese mystery snails could be problematic. Even snails from Bonnie Lake, which is the shallow lake with background or low levels of arsenic contamination, results in an increased cancer risk using the EPA's default consumption rate. So putting these consumption rates into perspective, the EPA recommended 90th percentile consumption rate of 17.5 grams per day, uh, which includes both shellfish and finfish, is equivalent to consuming about three snails or crayfish a day. And that's assuming you only ate that one type of organism and no other type of shellfish or finfish. That's based on average uncooked weight of snails and crayfish collected in our study. Now, if you're thinking some of these shellfish consumption rates seem high. We looked at consumption rates for just snails or crayfish taken from international studies with the assumption that immigrant populations may maintain similar dietary practices. The estimated mean consumption rate of snails alone for the Lake Taihu region in China is 20 grams per day. The mean consumption rate for crayfish based on a survey also from China is 10 grams per day with 118 grams per day for the 99th percentile of consumers. So the low and high end consumption rates we use serve as a realistic bracketing of the potential risk to use consumers, including the most vulnerable population of subsistence fishers. That being said, there's still controversy over whether rates are truly protecting everyone. For example, the highest reported fish consumption rate in Washington state is 865 grams per day for the Spokane tribe. This is almost 50 times higher than the EPA recommended rate. So in conclusion, the dynamics of shallow polymectic lakes can result in greater arsenic bioavailability compared to deeper seasonally stratified lakes and therefore greater human exposure and health risk. We recommend that monitoring the extent of arsenic contamination include littoral sediment sampling as concentration in shallow zones may be a better 
indicator of the potential uptake into organisms compared to conditions in the deeper areas of lakes. And finally, we suggest that regional agencies consider regulating the consumption of aquatic species that are especially susceptible to the uptake of ar arsenic, like the Chinese mystery snail. So thank you all for giving us your attention uh, and to the WALPA organizers for making this virtual conference happen. In addition to all our amazing co-authors, we'd like to give special thanks to Lenford Agaro for guidance with the risk assessment, Becca Styling, Noelle Hogan, and Suji Kim for their help in sample collection and processing, and to the NIEHS Superfund Research Program for funding this study. Thank you very much, uh, Marco and Aaron. That was fascinating. Uh, no escargot for me. Anyway, uh, we're moving on to Samantha Fung. She's going to kind of carry on the same theme here. So take it away, Samantha. All right, so um, I think, can you guys hear me okay? Great, okay. Um, so my name is Samantha Fung. I'm a graduate student at UW, and I'm gonna follow up Aaron and Marco's wonderful talk and look at some of the seasonal patterns of mixing and arsenic concentrations in Lake Killarney, our small study system. So next slide, please. So first, I'd like to acknowledge the Native people of the land where I work and conduct research. The land occupied by the University of Washington, indicated by the top star, and our study lakes, indicated by the bottom four stars, was originally inhabited by the Coast Salish, Suquamish, Duwamish, Puyallup, and Muckleshoot nations. Next slide. So Aaron and Marco just did a great job of introducing the study and discussing the human health risks that occur when arsenic ends up in the organisms we consume. However, we really need to understand the background mechanisms that lead to high arsenic, high amounts of bioaccumulation so that we are able to predict which contaminated systems are most, get, most at risk for having adverse human and ecosystem health impacts. In this talk, I'll focus on the physical and biogeochemical mechanisms that are involved in the pathways of arsenic transport in small lakes. I'll be using data from Lake Killarney, our small study system represented by the shallow lake in the left of the schematic. Just to review its characteristics, Lake Killarney has a max depth of four meters and is polymictic. As the schematic shows, arsenic is generally fixed in the bottom sediments of the lake. So imagine, an arsenic molecule stuck to the sediment at the bottom of the lake. What pathways must this molecule go through to make its way from the sediment into an organism? Next slide. So first, it must be mobilized from the sediment into the pore waters surrounding the sediment. Next, it must diffuse from the sediment pore water into the hypolimnion, or the, the water right above the sediment water interface. Third, it must um, mix from the bottom water into the bulk oxic water that the organisms inhabit. Lastly, it must be taken in by primary producers and transferred through the food web. I'm going to focus on these first three, so let's dive into mobilization. Next slide. So arsenic mobilization is a microbially mediated process that is dependent on both temperature and dissolved oxygen. I'm going to quickly talk about redox reactions and hopefully I don't induce too many flash flashbacks to high school chemistry. Um, so microbes living in the lake sediment consume and oxidize organic carbon as a food source. In oxic conditions, these microbes will couple the oxidation of carbon with the reduction of oxygen. However, when there's no oxygen, microbes next choose to reduce iron. Specifically, they reduce iron three, a solid form of iron, to iron two, a dissolved form. As a result of the dissolution of iron, Arsenic is released and transformed to arsenic-5, a solid form, to arsenic-3, a dissolved form. Once the arsenic is mobilized into the pore water, it undergoes passive diffusion. Um, can you click the next? Yeah, so it undergoes passive diffusion into the water right above the sediment water interface. 
Because both microbe activity and diffusion are processes greatly regulated by temperature, the release of arsenic from the sediment into the pore water and its diffusion into overlying waters are also temperature dependent. Okay, next slide. So Pamela Barrett, a postdoc who previously worked on this project, investigated this temperature effect in a lab study published last year. She incubated sediments from two of our study lakes, Ingle and Killarney, which Marco and Aaron um, previously mentioned. So the data indicated, um, or the data shown in blue indicates soil incubated at 10 degrees Celsius, and the data shown in red indicates soil incubated at 20 degrees Celsius. As the plot shows, arsenic was not mobilized at 10 degrees Celsius in the lab, but it was mobilized at 20 degrees. So we know that arsenic mobilization begins somewhere between 10 and 20 degrees, but where is that threshold? Luckily, we have field data to help us um, hone in and answer this question. Next slide. So as part of our multi-year field study in Lake Killarney, we deployed passive pore water peepers at the sediment water interface for two week periods. The peepers hold sample vials shown by the little circles here um, above and below the sediment water interface. The vials are filled with tracer solution and covered by a membrane filter that allows the fluid inside to equi equilibrate with the fluid outside and gives us estimate, estimates of arsenic concentrations in the pore water surrounding the sediment and in the hypolimnion or the um, water right above the sediment water interface. Using these concentrations in conjunction with measurements of sediment temperature, we can look at the relationship between sediment temperature and arsenic mobilization in the field. Um, so click. Okay, so these plots um, show sediment temperature versus arsenic concentration from 13 different peeper deployments over a two-year period. Each dot represents a peeper deployment where I average the sediment temperature over the two weeks. Um, so to look at the temperature effect on mobilization, I have the sediment temperature plotted against the mean arsenic in the pore water on the left. Um, and then to look at the temperature effect on diffusion, I have the sediment temperature plotted against the mean arsenic above the sediment water interface on the right. Um, so there appears to be a temperature threshold for both of these mechanisms, um, which makes sense because we know both microbe activity and diffusion are temperature regulated processes. Um, so below the threshold, um, and you can click one more time, so below the threshold, um, which is about 13 degrees Celsius, um, we don't see very much arsenic mobilization or diffusion. Above the threshold, we see a potential for high arsenic, but um, some variability in the response. So the takeaway here is that the sediment temperature must be above a threshold of 13 degrees Celsius for arsenic to be released into the sediment and diffused into the overlying water. Okay, so this data is um, zoomed in right at the sediment water interface. Um, now let's zoom out and look at what's happening in the whole water column over time. So next slide, thanks. Um, so in the top panel, now I'm showing a time series of sediment temperature where the blue shading indicates periods where the temperature is above our identified threshold. In the bottom panel, we have profiles of arsenic throughout the whole water column with a depth of zero indicating the water surface and a depth of three and a half meters indicating the lake bed. So indeed, when the sediment temperature is below our threshold, um, we see very little arsenic in the water column, which is in line with our conclusions from the last slide. However, during periods when the sediment temperature is above the threshold, we see a variety of patterns. During some periods, there's a gradient of concentration with high levels near the bed and lower levels near the surface. During other periods, we see a more uniform distribution of arsenic. So to bring this back to our um, central motivation, we really wanna understand when and why arsenic concentrations are elevated in the upper waters, because this leads to uptake into the lake organisms. Um, okay, so now that we can see the whole time series, let's zoom in again to a couple different of these time periods and investigate what's controlling the different patterns. So next slide. Okay, so let's start by looking at the month of August in 2018. During this period, we see a gradient of arsenic. 
And to look at why this is the case, we need to look at the physical lake mixing and the DO patterns during this period of time. Next slide. Okay, so this, this um, slide has a lot of information, but I'm gonna break it down. Um, so the left two panels, the left two plots, are showing time series for the month of August. On the top left, we have DTDZ, or the change in temperature over the lake depth. This is a measure of stratification. When um, DTDZ is zero, shown by the dashed line on the bottom of the plot, there is no change in temperature over the lake depth, indicating a fully mixed system. A positive DTDZ indicates that the lake is stratified, with strength of stratification increased with increasing with a greater DTDZ. On the bottom left, we have sediment temperature um, as the blue line, the sediment temperature threshold shown by the dashed line, and then the bottom water DO in orange. Um, lastly, on the right, I have plotted the same arsenic profile we saw um, on the last slide in the red box, now just with arsenic concentration on the x-axis rather than shown in color. So it's just a line plot now instead of a color plot. Um, and then the blue triangle is indicating the day when this profile was taken. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about this um, measure of stratification before fitting it in with the other two plots. So you may notice that there's a diurnal pattern. Um, during the day, solar heating causes stratification to strengthen. However, in the evening, the air cools the water surface, causing convective mixing and a subsequent weakening of the stratification. Full mixing occurs when the water surface cools below the temperature of the rest of the lake, and this surface water sinks due to its increased density. You can observe this happening when DTDZ briefly dips below zero, indicating an inverted temperature profile and a complete mixing event. So the patterns in nighttime convective cooling are, and mixing are extremely important because they control the distribution of dissolved oxygen and arsenic throughout the water column. Okay, so now connecting to the other two plots, um, looking at the first and second nights of August, we see two full mixing events um, where DTDZ reaches zero. Because this is mixing oxygen-rich surface waters into the bottom hypolimnion, we see simultaneous spikes in the bottom water DO. Um, for the next week after this, um, the, the lake water column stays stably stratified and there's a consistent decrease in the bottom water DO. For the rest of August, we see periods of stable stratification interspersed with occasional mixing events. This pattern produces the arsenic gradient we see in this August 16th profile. Large amounts of arsenic are being loaded into the bottom waters when the lake is stratified. During occasional mixing events, some of this arsenic is mixed into the upper waters. Because these mixing events are infrequent, the arsenic is allowed to build up in the hypolimnion, leading to our observation of high bottom water concentrations and lower surface water concentrations. Okay, next slide. Awesome, so let's hop one month forward and look at September of 2018. Oh, um, yeah, so now we're looking at September of 2018. So the temperature um, of the sediment is still above our threshold, but now we see a uniform distribution of arsenic. Okay, now, now you can go to the next slide. Cool, thanks. So looking at DTDZ again, we see that the lake is fully overturning almost every night. Um, as a result, the bottom water DO remains relatively high and the arsenic is distributed evenly throughout the water column, as seen in this profile taken on September 10th. Okay, so now that we've examined two month-long periods, let's zoom back out and look at how sediment temperature and stratification control the arsenic um, concentration seasonally. Next slide. Awesome. So, um, again, we have our sediment temperature in the top panel and stratification in the middle panel. And now the bottom panel is showing time series of arsenic concentrations in the top and bottom of the water column, with the top being in blue and the bottom being in orange. Okay, so in the winter time, um, click once. So in the winter time, sediment temperature remains below our threshold, 
Consequently, little or no arsenic is being mobilized from the sediment into the pore waters. Although the lake um, has a variety of mixing patterns during this time and is generally fully mixed, um, the top and bottom water column concentrations is negligible as there is no arsenic being loaded into the system. From late spring to early summer, click. Okay, so late spring to early summer, the sediment temperature is now above our threshold and the water column undergoes periods of stratification with occasional mixing like we saw in August. So during these months, we see very high um, bottom water concentrations and lower but still elevated upper water concentrations. Click one more time. So lastly, in um, the late summer and early fall, sediment temperature is above our threshold, but the water column mixes nightly. During this period, the top and bottom water arsenic concentrations converge. Okay, next slide. So our three main takeaways from the study um, are first, the release of arsenic from the sediments into the lake water is regulated by temperature. Um, and specifically, arsenic mobilization from the sediment and diffusion from the pore water into overlying waters both exhibit a temperature threshold behavior with a threshold around 13 degrees Celsius. Second, in late spring to early summer, periods of stratification cause arsenic buildup at the sediment water interface and episodic mixing transfers arsenic into the lake epilimnion. These mechanisms cause a gradient of arsenic throughout the water column. Lastly, during summer and early fall, convection driven diol or um, diurnal overturning distributes arsenic homogeneously throughout the full water column. So hopefully I've convinced you guys that in order, for, in order to predict when arsenic contamination will overlap with biota, we need to understand the mixing mechanisms and how patterns of mixing interact with lake chemistry. Um, I've just been like watching all the other presentations and thinking about how um, lake mixing is so widely useful in other internal loading scenarios. Um, so for example, with internal loading of phosphorus, um, which is controlled by the same mechanisms as arsenic mobilization, if we can predict when the lake will mix and when um, anoxia will form, we can um, time our treatments of alum or bubbling for when anoxia and phosphor phosphorus release is the highest. Similarly, if we are trying to remediate a lake for arsenic with the cool algal scrubbers that Ken and Sarah presented yesterday, we can plan to maximize flow when the scrubber, through the scrubber, when the arsenic concentrations in the lake are the highest. Um, okay, next slide. So I just wanted to thank um, all of my wonderful co-authors and the field team, um, and of course, uh, NIEHS for providing the funding. And that's it. Well, thank you very much, Samantha. That was wonderful. Um, I uh, well, we're going to get to questions later. I have to wait. Uh, so we're going to move on to our last presenter, and that's Mr. Tim Clark from King County. Welcome back, Tim. Um, let's uh, hear what you have to say about your Bayesian model. Yeah. Toxic algae blooms are a major concern in King County's lakes. Every year, we have several lakes that close due to high levels of microcystin or anatoxin that uh, exceed the state's recreational guidelines. This makes them of particular interest to our elected and appointed officials um, who are interested in managing our natural resources for both human health and ecological outcomes. And so they often, they have come to us as uh, in our, in the Water and Land Resources Division to help expand on how different types of natural resource management activities can best manage harmful algal blooms as well as other endpoints. This effort is called the Water Quality Benefits Evaluation, and that's what I'll be talking about today. My name is Timothy Clark, I go by Clark, and I'll be talking about how King County is trying to connect actions to endpoints. 
particularly focusing at swimming beaches. King County is in a time of planning. We have um, a really great uh, collaborating effort around the Clean Water and Healthy Habitat Initiative, which is, has the central tenet of making the right investments at the right time in the right places. This mantra is helping guide our clean water plan, which is a long-term utility planning effort from the wastewater treatment division, as well as this combined sewer overflow long-term control plan update. Uh, and what the water quality benefits evaluation is trying to do is, is, is doing is developing tools that are driven by the latest scientific information to provide evidence to decision makers on what types of actions can give us the biggest water quality benefit. So this tool will be used for both of those plans as well as other strategic planning efforts for stormwater or, or, or land acquisition efforts. Because why do we improve water quality? We want to be able to eat shellfish and fish. We want to be able to swim safely without concern of we want Chinook salmon to be recovering and abundant. We want orcas to be recovering. So what the water quality benefits evaluation is trying to do is be able to connect what actions we can have to these endpoints. And to do so, it is relying on three tools. The first of which is a pollutant loading model. So understanding where the pollutants are coming from on the landscape, whether it's confined sewer flows or stormwater runoff, and what kind of land uses are those pollutants coming from. A major concern for lakes is phosphorus. And so that's one of the pollutants that's being uh, modeled through this effort. And then we want, and the second tool is a cost effectiveness model for both best management practices and other actions. So looking at rain gardens and street sweeping and tree planting, how, how does these result in better water quality or decreased loading? And then actually, can we optimize a suite of those to be the most cost effective and give us a, the biggest bang for our buck for meeting our management goals? And then pulling that information from those the, that loading model and optimization to see how those affect all those endpoints I discussed earlier. How do those pollutants and other landscape factors impact the things that we care about? So I'm the causal model lead for swimming beaches and swimming beaches are affected by two things, fecal contamination and toxic algae blooms. Today I'll be focusing on toxic algae blooms. Last year I talked a lot about poop and so it's really exciting that I won't have to talk about poop at WAPA this year other than this sentence. So kind of a, a big ask is that we need a general model for predicting algal toxins in over 50 lowland lakes as related to external phosphorus reduction and we want that model to be simple, robust, easy to understand, and adaptable. We want to be able to put in new information um, and, and change it as, our, as we learn more about our systems, as well as we think about other types of actions that we might uh, take on. So ultimately, we actually decided for all of these endpoints to be using a Bayesian network. And I'll talk more about a Bayesian network right now and what that is by providing an example. So a Bayesian network is really a causal web of conditional dependencies that capture the influence of, of parameters on one another using probabilities. So in this example, I'm asking, will I catch my bus? And so down here in purple is, will I catch my bus? And that's either yes or no. So I have two mutually exclusive states, and I can have three or four, but as long as they're mutually exclusive. So whether I catch my bus or not is dependent on, do I leave the house on time? And does the bus arrive? And when does it arrive? Is it early, on time, or late? Uh, and then me leaving the house on time is in turn <laughs> dependent on, do I oversleep? Or 
And is the bathroom available or is my roommate hogging it? So within each of these uh, parameters, these nodes, is a conditional probability table, which I pulled up here. So that outcome of leaving the house on time, yes or no, those two states, and then we have every iteration of oversleeping and bathroom availability. So in this first case uh, where I oversleep, but the bathroom is available, I think there's a 70% probability that I will leave the house on time. Whereas if I oversleep and my roommate is hogging the bathroom, there's only a 5% probability that I'm going to leave the house on time. And I generated probabilities for those other scenarios. And we can continue to go up the chain. So what causes me to oversleep? Well, it might be, or it's bad dreams. And what causes me to have bad dreams? It might be I have a presentation the next day and I'm stressed, or I ate ice cream before bed. And maybe I ate ice cream before bed because I had a presentation the next day and I was trying to do some self-care. So you can see how we're really kind of like, oh, I have a presentation the next day that goes down this web into whether or not I catch my bus or not. So let's say I have a presentation tomorrow. It says, yes, oh, it becomes more likely that I'm going to eat some ice cream. It's fairly likely I'm going to have bad dreams then, 78% chance. Less, about half, half chance that I'll oversleep. And with that, 56% uh, chance I'll leave the house on time, and then I'll uh, be able to catch my bus 57% of the time. So just knowing that I have a presentation tomorrow, I have I have a better chance than not of catching my bus tomorrow, but not by much. So maybe I should plan accordingly or work from home forever. So that was just a brief example and hopefully a kind of a fun example of a Bayesian network. So why, why are we interested in using Bayesian networks? Well, uh, it allows us to use both use extra expert knowledge and data. So what I used um, in that model was my expert knowledge of living in my home and knowing when and where I'll be able to catch the bus. Uh, and then also I could use data. I could have structured notes for every day I've left and was my bathroom, was the bathroom being hogged and developing all those cases and then really it's just a frequency distribution of when, when this and this, does this happen? So that's really great for us so that we're able to handle areas where we have data gaps, but a lot of expert knowledge. Another area that uh, is a strength for Bayesian networks is being able to handle uncertainty. Uh, by use of probabilities, it allows us for more of that uh, squishiness of, well, I think A causes B, but not always and, un and even under all the right conditions, I don't think 100% that this is going to happen. So it allows us to, to, to understand that not to, to, to allow us to really play with the knowledge that we don't know everything. And we can capture that really well through probabilities. So for building the algal toxin model, the first step was to find the experts because this was going to be chiefly built on uh, knowledge because we don't have all the data necessary for all of King County's lakes. So the subject matters I was able to find, and boy, I was very pleased with the people I was able to bring on. We had Dr. Eugene Welch, retired professor of the University of Washington. Chris Knudsen from King County, our lake stewardship manager. He knows King County's lakes um, very intimately. Deborah Bouchard, senior limnologist with King County and my boss. Uh, Dr. Ellen Priest, uh, from Robertson Bryan down in California, previously out of Washington State University, and Dr. Joan Hardy, uh, retired from the Washington State Department of Health, but uh, doesn't seem like she's uh, she retired. She never seems to stop working. 
So with these experts, we use the IDEA protocol, which is to present information to them, making sure we're all on the same place and, and trying to understand and remove any biases that might exist. And then asking them a question, allowing them to provide their answer, and then presenting those answers to all of those experts anonymously and allowing time for discussion for uh, what's happening and then uh, and for experts to have a chance to, to explain themselves uh, and then they're able to make a second round of estimates and then then we move forward so to go through this process uh, there was a lot of video conferences and I sent out a lot of surveys and because there's all these video conferences, I recorded them and watched them back later, I've got to find out how much I talk with my hands, which apparently is a lot and is very distracting. And I'm sorry, but this is how I talk. So I would often send them a survey. Uh, they would provide it. I would, I would create a summary of their responses, and then I would present that through them at a video conference, and then they would uh, do those responses. And so that's how we built the conceptual model, and we built all those conditional probability tables, that little table I showed previously. So this is sort of a general uh, conceptual model for the algal toxin. Uh, we thought algal toxin down here at the bottom, uh, influenced by the genotype of the algae that are present, um, as well as the amount of accumulation near the beach, how, how much of a scum is forming up. And that accumulation, in turn, is, was influenced by uh, accumulation conditions, winds and macrophytes at that beach, and then uh, how much cyanobacteria were lake-wide, what is the amount of abundance, which in turn was influenced by the nutrient availability, nitrogen and phosphorus, and then the environmental conditions of so temperature, light, grazing, uh, by zooplankton. So now I'm going to break that out a little more, uh, specifically the environmental conditions and, and nutrients. So if you look on the upper right with the environmental conditions, so you're looking at lake stability as measured through the Osgood index, uh, mean summer temperature, the flushing rate, uh, where large bodied grazers present, uh, and then light availability as influenced by sort of organic matter, that tannin tannic color um, and macrophyte coverage. For the nutrients, um, we were, based off discussion with the experts, they really thought this was going to be driven by the N to P ratio, and so there's a place for that, and then also what the phosphorus is. And what we wanted to capture was what do we expect the phosphorus to be after an external load reduction? And so we did that based off of different levels of internal load, like what fraction of the total load comes from the inter from internal sources, uh, and so we looked at so our post treatment TP so post reduction was estimated by our experts based off of what is the pre treatment TP, that and what is the amount of reduction of phosphorus from the external load and what is the internal load fraction. And they also, we allowed for a timeline. Uh, is this the first five years after the reduction or five year, or five to 10 years after the reduction? And so now building out and with all the CPTs in place, this is the, the fleshed out model. Um, so what, again, what's really of interest to our decision makers um, is the knobs that we turn and the output. So they're gonna be really interested in the external total phosphorus load reduction um, as that affects the lake TP. And what is, how does that affect the probability that in the summer we exceed the uh, microcystin standard? So we are using microcystin here uh, because that's the most common toxin we find in King County lakes. And it was thought that actions that would help manage uh, microcystin would also help manage anatoxin. And for the purposes of the model, that was seemed to be sufficient. 
So we can actually set boundary conditions for a given lake. Um, and I've done that here. Uh, and with these conditions, we have a 19.7% probability down the bottom of exceeding the toxin criterion. And then we can run a scenario in which we reduce the external load in the summer by 80%, which drops it down to 15.4%. Uh, and I'll sorry to put this as five years after. So not a lot, really. And so that's actually a really important thing to be talking with, with our natural resource managers and decision makers, is that the external total phosphorus load management for a lot of our lakes is not going to be enough. We really have to look at both external load and internal load. So that's really important for our experts to, to know, or for, for our natural resource managers to know, is that external load and stormwater management and wastewater management for King County's lakes, as they currently are, will not likely be enough. This model is still under construction. Uh, every time I meet with uh, that team of experts, uh, we come up with new ideas to how to make it better. And some of the structural changes that we're considering right now is moving from that cell density, uh, the cyanobacteria cell density, to uh, either dropping it and, and plugging phosphorus directly into microcystin, um, as well as the environmental conditions or using chlorophyll A, which, as we know, is an imperfect predictor, but being able to capture the uncertainty around that in this model will be very helpful. And that's the benefit of the Bayesian network. So this is still under construction, um, but I'd like to close with an invitation to you all. Uh, if you would like to review the beta model, which will be the next stage of the model, please contact me. I have really appreciated the input of my five immediate experts and this this model is their model i i'm heavily just facilitated its uh production and i really want to hear from all of you on how to make it better and if what you see coming out of the model is believable um, and is aligned with your expectations uh, yeah, so thank you for uh, hearing me out today and, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Wow, Clark, that's pretty amazing stuff. Okay, well, we're time for some questions. We got a good uh, seven minutes or so, that's great. I'm gonna start with Marco. Uh, what species of snail did you use? And uh, I know you said something about the Chinese mystery snail and kind of how that species relates. And my question also is the uptake between differences between species as well as the consumption uh, differences between species. Yeah, so yeah, the species is the Chinese mystery snails. Um, it's very abundant on every single lake. Uh, the difference between the arsenic we have not calculated that but that's going to be on our next paper about how the arsenic transfers with uh up on the trophic level and what was the last question again uh if there's a differences in consider different uh species and how their consumption rates are uh if the consumption human consumption rates vary between species yeah. so the consumption rate uh between different species is, it's very controversial right now. Um, we try our best to stay on the conservative side. As for the species itself, well, we only select the species that are available in our lakes because it's the more realistic model or the most realistic way to represent the lakes here in uh, South Puget Sound region. Okay. Uh, and then secondly, for Aaron, um, about, uh, have you presented these results to the Department of Health? If people are curious uh, what the Department of Health thinks about uh, the risks that you've observed. Um, yeah, so we, we initially uh, worked with uh, the Department of Health, Glenford Ogaro. He kind of got us set up with the risk assessment model. Um, and 
I think in a few weeks, we do have an agency stakeholders meeting to kind of run through our results, uh, get some input and um, go from there. So before we publish anything, we definitely want to include uh, those guys, get their input. Great. Samantha, have you considered a correlation between your temperature threshold and the sediment boundary layer dissolved oxygen uh, to stratification strength, as you discussed? Uh, other researchers have found low oxygen at the sediment water interface and um, we're wondering if that was maybe missed in the one meter intervals that you, you measure, the, the you collect the data. Correlation between which two variables, the oxygen and stratification? Yeah. Um, yeah, that would definitely, I think it would match the um, correlation to arsenic release um, because arsenic is so closely tied to anoxic conditions, but that's definitely something I should plot up and look at, yeah. So you, you related it to temperature. Did you measure dissolved oxygen continuously also or just the temperature? <clears throat> yeah, I had the oxygen um, uh, time series in those two in the August and September um, zoomed in plots. I just haven't correlated um, Chlor the correlated temperature too. and the oxygen. Cool. All right. Kay Clark, I uh, got one for you. And that would be, uh, did you look at pH in your model? Uh, Certainly it was on the list of parameters uh, that we were looking at in, in, in the early discussions around building that conceptual model for uh, uh, toxic algae blooms. Um, ultimately it did not make the cut. There were a lot of different parameters that didn't make the cut. Um, there are a lot of things that we believe will have, can have some influence, but in terms of like, we really want to focus on the major drivers and um, especially around the areas that King County can have some influence on um, and particular around the, the WICB, uh, the water quality benefits evaluation actions of stormwater management, um, which certainly can have effects on pH. Um, but, uh, ultimately through discussions with the experts, uh, it was not included. Um, but if during the beta model review, which you whoever asked that question is certainly welcome to take part of, I already was contacted by, uh, Sally Abella. So come on and join the fun. Uh, of the beta model review. Um, and you can tell uh, us all why uh, this model is wrong and needs a pH and how we can improve it. Um, and so please uh, join the discussion. Okay. Well, thank you, Tim. I, I would say, um, Clark, that, uh, well, there's a couple here. I don't know how much time we have, but I'm interested in the internal load. So I, the external load results kind of know, gave you what our limnologists know and told you that you've got to reduce internal load to uh, affect uh, algal biomass. So have you um, been used the model to affect, uh, to uh, evaluate changes in internal load? I would love that as a next step in the model. Uh, for the goal of the model right now, uh, we are looking at uh, external load management as it relates to stormwater and wastewater management. So for the goal of this model to serve uh, King County's purposes, we can't uh, uh, going deeply into internal load management through a Bayesian network uh, seem uh, beyond the scope. Uh, but as we know, it's, and as this model showed, is like it's a very important piece for us to manage. Uh, and I think I, I'm really interested in discussion of whether or not internal load um, as a, a could, could be well estimated and how uh, alum treatment or dredging or other actions for managing internal loads can really be well modeled in terms of a Bayesian network, especially generalizing to a lake because I've, often that is so unique. Um, and that's why we have uh, lake management plans and like very focused like uh, around how to manage internal loads. So I'd be interested to see if we can build a good general Bayesian network around internal loads in the future. Um, uh, once we get into the second phase of this project, I think that might be a place of interest, but I really need to hear from the people who are running those budgets um, that they are interested in uh, not doing just stormwater management, but potentially also using that money for 
uh, internal load management, and I'll be like, okay, let's build the model for it. And then we can prioritize around that. So not yet, but I hope so. Uh, let's have to make some good sales pitches. Well, well, thank you. I, uh, I do hope you, you win that sales pitch. That would be great uh, for all of us. Um, It'd be great for business. Yeah. But, um, and then lastly, we don't have much time. It looks like time's up, but uh, the, did you did you factor in, Tim, wind direction and uh, wind speed in, in the environmental conditions? Yeah, and so that's like a very generalized, because uh, we're, we're looking at a certain beach uh, within, uh, within a lake. And so certainly wind conditions can vary by day. And so this is not like a daily model um, right. for accumulation, but there are general patterns in, Oh yeah, this is a cove in which we always get a lot of accumulation because the general wind patterns push it this way. So that's sort of that allows for like the uncertainty around it. Like yeah, we think there's this generally supportive uh, conditions for having uh, scum show up here at this beach, uh, but we know that doesn't happen all the time. So that's captured, mm -hmm. um, but uh, like not on like not on a daily time scale. Great. Well, that's a great answer. Uh, great answer from all of you. I really appreciate your time today. Um, these were all all great presentations. Give us a lot to think about. And uh, I congratulate you uh, in your research and may you continue and teach us all great things in the future. Uh, go Walpa and we'll see you all at the, uh, at the next session, which starts at 11 o'clock in 10 minutes. So please, uh, please come back and don't miss Invasives Management. Thank you. Go Walpa.
Thank you. Welcome to um, session six of the WALPA uh, annual conference. Uh, this time it's on invasive management, invasive species management. I'm Joan Hardy, toxicologist and um, secretary of WALPA. And I'd like to make two call outs before we start. And just, I, I think we had a great start um, to new and productive careers with those student posters. Just really want to say those were great and really enjoyed those. Also, um, to Tim Clark, that um, that project has been the most enter entertaining, interesting, and uh, rewarding project in any limnology that I've done. So thank you, Tim. Okay, so to get started, our first talk is by Julian Olden. Uh, Julian. Good afternoon, Walpa. It's my pleasure to be here. My name is Julian Olden. I'm a professor in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences at the University of Washington. Today, I'm really excited about presenting some ongoing work that Rachel Freaky and I have been doing in collaboration with Spencer Wood and Dustin Martin. Now, prevention of aquatic invasive species remains a fundamental challenge. And with hundreds of millions of recreational boaters moving among water bodies across the United States, we really need to understand what these human movements look like because ultimately invasive species piggyback on those human movements and when they're getting transmitted across the landscape. Now we're all keenly aware that invasive species are removed through a variety of different mechanisms from intentional releasing of bait fish after fishing, entanglement on fishing gear and on motors, as well as being attached to boats. Many of these species um, I'm shown here have been moved through these vectors and many of these are kind of species of concern here at Washington State, whether it be mussels, fish, or uh, aquatic nuisance species. Now understanding human behavior really gives us an idea of the likely transmission across the landscape and ultimately this helps us guide effective implementation of prevention strategies, thus reducing the initial introduction, spread, and then the economic ecological harm, harm that these invaders might have. Now to date we've modeled the uh, potential spread of invasive species and I would argue that modeling actually the most invasive species, that is humans, is the most appropriate way to understand or take a multi-species approach if you will uh, to understanding where invasive species might be transmitted via this vector. Now, traditional approaches to understand recreational boater and angler movement is, are quite limited in time, space. In fact, this behavior is often inferred from sparsely conducted in-person uh, surveys as shown here, or mail-in surveys, or we've done a very concentrated effort like shown here on Lake Whatcom, where we uh, do kind of creel surveys at boat launches and we know a lot about a specific water body. So in large part, they're limited in time and space because of limited resources. They're also limited in their representation. The reality is, is that uh, recreational angling, for example, is increasing with respect to female participation and also in terms of youth participation. And these youth don't interact with these common mechanisms by which we try to um, understand boater movement around. They're not at the other end receiving hard mail copies of surveys. Um, so we really need to better understand what this diff change in demographic is even looking like in terms of how they're using water bodies and then ultimately what that might mean for invasive species transmission. Here I'm going to argue that mobile technologies um, and social media really provide new and exciting opportunities to uh, improve our understanding of angler and boater movement behaviors at scale. That is at spatial and temporal scales in which we formerly have unable um, to be able to get a, a handle on. And in fact, um, there's some really interesting work showing that uh, some of this uh, mobile uh, data is actually quite useful in terms of estimating actual visitation. This is some work by Spencer Wood that shows photographic visitation as estimated through Flickr, provides a good um, correlate of actual visitation of recreational use um, in different areas in the US. So the objective of this work is to map human movement in networks using data from mobile phishing applications and social media to assess and the implications of this work is to assess the pathways and locations of future potential movements so that we can target prevention. 
Now, phishing apps, um, um, there's a large variety of phishing apps. Um, and these data are actually quite useful if we can uh, access them because they can give us geotag locations of, uh, of where anglers are and the date in which they're actually participating in these activities. Um, it often involves both active and passive user reporting. Um, and it gives us some opportunities for detailed user demographic data. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about one such technology, and this is the iBobber, um, and how we use this to actually track uh, recreational uh, fishing activity. Now, social media is another whole form. This also gives us geotag typical photographs of people recreational on water bodies. Um, it gives us limited demographic data, but it gives us a whole wealth of spatial data in terms of where people are recreating and when. Uh, today, I'm going to be using Flickr data. Flickr data um, was um, highly used over the last decades or so, um, and it gives us a really strong geographic uh, understanding of where potential uh, movement are between different water bodies. So iBobber, really quick, is a solar-enabled solar -enabled bobber. Um, it's shown here. You can buy it on Amazon for under $100. It provides an opportunity for anglers to understand the depths and the topography of the areas in which they're fishing. But what we're interested in is that it actually pings up to the cloud every 50 seconds, the location of that bobber. So that gives us an understanding of where bobbers are and uh, where anglers are and at what time. This is the global distribution of iBobber users across the landscape. You can see it's highly, highly concentrated in more developed parts of the world, the United States, many parts in Europe, as well as in parts of Southeast Asia. Here are the distribution of iBobber activities across the United States. Uh, we're looking at basically around 20,000 different anglers which use these iBobbers over a two-year time period. And this included about 70,000 iBobber records. The figure shown just over my shoulder there is just the angler activity through time estimated by the amount of iBobber activity. And it makes sense with increasing uh, fishing activity in the spring and summertime, which then dissipates over the winter. So pretty impressive coverage across the United States. Here is the activity of Flickr data across the Western United States, just for the sake of time. There's a lot of data to process. This had about 60,000 users and over 200,000 different geotagged posts across different water bodies of the Western United States. And this was done over a 13 year time period. Now, our data process was multifold. First, we have all this geotagged information about Flickr users, as well as iBobber users shown in the two icons there. But a lot of that activity doesn't occur on lakes, which is what we were particularly interested in. So we essentially took their location as well as the um, a lake layer, national lake layer for the United States. And then we just removed all of those um, geotagged um, occurrences that did not occur on lakes. Next, we removed all of those lakes which had no information on either iBob or Flickr data. Then we calculated the um, geographic distance um, as one would travel on roads um, between pairwise between each lake using a graph hopper routing API. And then we identified the lake attributes of each one of those lakes that had more, had activity, fishing activity on it, and also the presence of invasive species uh, using the USGS NAS database. So first, I just wanted to take a little look at the patterns of uh, uh, movement behavior. So overall, between Flickr and iBobber, we had data for about 10,000 water bodies, which is quite, quite impressive. We we're quite happy with that. The plot shown on your right is just the uh, road distance on the x-axis pairwise and the percent of anglers moved. And you can see that about, you know, it's highly skewed as what we'd expect, a lot of short distance movements between different water bodies. Um, and about 50% of anglers moved less than around 33 or 43 kilometers, depending on what data source that you looked at. So again, it's what we expect, a lot of short distance movements, but also a very fat tail. And that leptocurtic tail in this distribution is what we're really interested in as well, because that gives the indication of long-term movements, movements, uh, long distance movements, distance that may be come from the Eastern part to the Western part um, of the United States. And if we just kind of zoom in on one of my favorite parts here in the upper Midwest, because around, um, um, around the Milwaukee 
Madison area um, in Wisconsin. This just shows the actual track traced movements that we did, for example, for an iBobber user shown in red or a bunch of geotagged uh, Flickr data where the same user we identified in multiple different lakes through time. And this shows just the uh, movement pathways in which they were doing and hopping, if you will, between different lakes. Now, what we can do is that we can take a look at the network of user movements. So what I've done here is I'm just shown a network analysis where each one of those dots in this plot right there is a lake, and then they're connected to other lakes through, um, through movements. Um, so this is around the 10,000 lakes that I've shown earlier. Um, and these cluster of lakes in the same color are essentially what we call distinct components or subnetworks of this network. This indicates that they're more connected to one another than others, and this suggests that the amount of, boat, of angler movement between these lakes is, is particularly high. Now, there's a number of components you can see there, around 700 different components, but about 10 components have greater than 100 lakes. So essentially what this is doing is allowing us to kind of zoom in on particular components where there's a lot of angular movement between them so we can better have a better understanding of kind of the flux of the movements between those different lakes and then how we actually try to might manage invasive species that might get moved around because of that angular movement. So I really don't want to kind of highlight, I focus too much on this kind of diagram right here, but I do want to zone in on one particular subcomponent shown in the red square right there. This had greater than 100 lakes and is highly connected, and then how we might use this information moving forward. So if we zoom in on that particular network, we're actually zooming in in this part of Utah. Um, so um, each one of those dots, again, is the individual lake and they're connected through those solid lines. So nodes and different spokes, if you will. And I've just highlighted some of the major lakes um, that we're looking at. Everywhere from Great Salt Lake, um, Lake Utah, and, and, and Lake Powell, lakes, lake names that we're probably well aware of. So let's just take a look at this a little bit and try to understand how we might be able to uh, understand and, uh, and use this information moving forward. So let's just zoom in on one, two particular lakes to show how we can use some metrics of these um, network topology, if you will, to try to guide prevention. For example, on the left-hand side, that's Utah Lake that has a centrality value of, of 123 and a mean, um, a mean connectedness, um, if you will, of 16. Um, so centrality actually tells us how important a water body is within a network based on the frequency of visitation and connectedness to other lakes. So I like to think of lakes with really high centrality um, as a center of a wheel, and there's many spokes radiating outward from that lake to a lot of other water bodies. So in this particular example, this has very high average centrality. Um, uh, that's a 16, um, which basically suggests um, that it is um, um, basically highly visited and highly connected to other water bodies. The second metric I want to highlight, and I'm going to highlight it for Deer Creek Reservoir right there, is a measure of betweenness. This is a measure of the extent to which a water body lies on paths between other very centralized water bodies. So in this example, um, uh, Deer Creek Reservoir right here is kind of connecting two different kind of subcomponents of this network, those related to Lake Powell and those related to uh, Great Salt Lake. Um, so uh, essentially, I like to look at this as these are kind of conduits, if you will, between two other connected networks. So through a management lens, um, I, lakes like Utah Lake shown over there with high centrality, um, especially those that we know that have invasive species, are really great places for required boat and cleaning gears to prevent distribution of aquatic hitchhikers among lakes within that cluster. On the other hand, Deer Creek Reservoir or lakes that have high betweenness uh, really serve as bridges. That is, there are kind of um, connectors between other highly connected networks. And these are really prime locations for gear inspections, um, roadside inspections, and education to try to intercept the flow of invasive species, potentially hitchhiking between one cluster or another. Real quick, these are just the attributes of visited water bodies. Uh, between those who were visited versus all within the uh, within the United States, and not surprisingly, the lake area of visited water bodies is higher for those that receive angling versus not, as well as the degree of urbanization. And in fact, reservoirs, interestingly, not shown here, were ten times more often to be visited compared to natural lakes, which is um, 
uh, discouraging because previous work has shown that reservoirs can be anywhere between 5 and 20 percent more vulnerable to invasive species. So not only are they more visited, but they're also more likely to have the conditions make them conducive to the establishment of invasive species. The time between trips is quite interesting because that tells us the likely survival of these non-native species. So what I'm showing here is a histogram of the number of trips on the y-axis and the days between trips um, on the x-axis. And we know that survival, that is desiccation tolerance, varies greatly from on the left-hand side. I've just overlaid what hydrilla is around 16 hours. And Chinese mystery snail, that can be over two months. They can remain out of water. And this just shows that this is additional filter, but the large majority of movements between these water bodies occur in that sweet spot between zero and 10 days. A sweet spot in the sense that the large majority of invasive species would be surviving moving from one water body to another, at least according to dissertation um, tolerance as shown here. Our current research is looking at um, additional phishing apps, different forms of social media, including Flickr, um, including um, uh, Twitter data, um, and, and also trying to use online phishing forms to give us an indication or multiple lines of evidence in terms of what water bodies are getting visited more often than not. We are really excited, and this is going to be our, the core of Rachel's uh, graduate work, is to kind of crack open the idea of using convision, uh, computer vision algorithms uh, to indicate you know, what images actually are indicative of fishing or boating related activities or not. This is a really important way of us wading through the whole mass of Twitter data um, to try to understand what might actually be linked to um, angling or, or boater activities, i.e. the pathway in which invasive species are getting moved around. And then our hope is to try to bring all of these data sources together so that we can have a better insight of movement beyond which what we have right now in terms of traditional kind of survey-based approaches um, with respect to boater movement and hence the likelihood of um, invasive species moving around. With that, I just want to thank Rachel again um, and Spencer and, and Dustin, who was our partner at Real Sonar, the iBobber part of this. Anyone who's interested can, uh, can look at this paper, which was just published last month in the journal Neobiota. It's available online free um, at the URL I can show below, or you can reach out to me. And this reports just the iBobber component of the study um, that I just reported on right now. So with that, um, thank you very much for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. This, uh, thank you, Julian. The scale of that work was really impressive. Um, and I neglected to mention that we will be taking questions at the end of the session uh, for all of the presenters. And all of the presenters in this session have been uh, pre recorded. So, our next speaker is Tegan Ward, and she will be talking about um, uh, walk and boat inspections. Welcome, Tegan. Today I'll be talking to you about the walk and boat inspection program and our efforts to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species in Whatcom County. Aquatic invasive species are non-native plants, animals and pathogens that live primarily in water and are able to thrive in new environments. They're capable of causing economic loss, environmental damage and harm to human health. Two of the freshwater species that we're most concerned about here in Whatcom County are the zebra and quagga mussel, you can see in the bottom right hand corner here. Um, and they are not found in Washington state yet, but they have the potential to cause a lot of really serious impacts. These mussels have a really unique adaptation that allows them to attach to hard surfaces using tiny bissel threads. This is how they were able to be transported across the United States on recreational watercraft and equipment. And in their early life stages, they're actually microscopic and found in standing water. Um, so it can also be transported in any standing water left on boats and equipment and things like that. They cause a lot of different impacts to um, native biodiversity, as you can see here when they're all attached to a native mussel. Um, also to recreational equipment when they attach to propellers and equipment on watercraft. And then the big one for us here, as you can see on the right hand side, that is an intake pipe that has become completely clogged um, with mussels. And so that can cause serious impacts to our ability um, to provide drinking water. 
They can also make beaches and recreational areas really hazardous and uninviting. As you can see, these really sharp shells just completely covering these beaches along the Great Lakes. We first found the zebra and quagga mussels in the Great Lakes area in the late 1980s, and they spread really quickly throughout the Mississippi and Missouri River basins. The red dots on this map represent the zebra mussel occurrences, and the green dots represent quagga mussel occurrences. Our first sighting of these mussels in the western U.S. happened in 2007 in Lake Mead, and since that time, we've developed inspection stations across much of the western U.S. in an effort to prevent their spread to our states. And currently, we do not have these mussels in several Pacific Northwest states, so we've been relatively successful with this effort. Um, we are part of that effort, so we have our own boat inspection program. We focus primarily on Lake Whatcom and Lake Samish, which are the two main lakes outside Bellingham in Whatcom County. Here you can see a picture of Lake Whatcom taken from Basin 3. It has a surface area of around 5,000 acres. It is an open multiple use lake and is the drinking water source for over 100,000 people. The Lake Whatcom watershed is also home to around 18,000 residents. It's a really popular recreational site and is already home to several aquatic invasive species, including Eurasian water milfoil, Asian clams, curly leaf pondweed, and purple loosestrife, just to name a few. In contrast, Lake Samish is a much smaller lake. It has a surface area of around 814 acres. It's an open, multiple-use lake, has a year-round kokanee fishery, and is again a source of drinking water for many of the lakeside residents. It's a popular recreational site for visitors and residents, and is currently home to two aquatic invasive species, the fragrant water lily and Asian clams, which we discovered there last year. In terms of our program development, we started out by doing a risk assessment back in 2011. Um, we followed that by doing passing some local regulations and starting with a voluntary watercraft inspection program. So that allowed us to get a lot of the data and information we needed to then develop the mandatory watercraft inspection program, which we started back in 2013. And then we've revised it several times since then. In terms of the risk assessment elements we considered, we looked at the amount of recreational activity occurring on the lake. So we needed some data on boat traffic uh, as well as access points. We also looked at the suitability of the water body to support the establishment of AIS. So in that case, we're talking about the water chemistry and how likely those species are to survive in that environment. We looked at the current distribution of aquatic invasive species and their proximity to the lake. So obviously we're getting new infestations, getting closer, depending on the species of concern. You, you also wanna take into account if there are, are local infestations you're concerned about. The potential impacts and mitigation costs that could result from an infestation. So in my case, we're talking about drinking water sources. So those impacts are, are very high. Those costs would be very high if we were to get an infestation. And then looking at that existing level of protection. So um, do you know where these boats are coming from? Um, are they coming from high risk areas? Do you have an inspection program in place? Do you have an education program in place so people know the clean, drain, dry message? So these were things we considered um, as we developed our program. So in terms of our local ordinances, we do um, prohibit the transport or release of aquatic invasive species into our local lakes. We require inspections and permits for all watercraft operating on Lake Whatcom and Lake Samish. Uh, and then this program is enforced by the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office on the water. So he's out there looking for their stickers on the boats. We do charge fees for our aquatic invasive species permits, and these fees do then go back into helping to fund our program. There are a variety of different permit options from annual to different day passes, and then the fees do range um, from low for some of those lower risk boats that are easier to inspect all the way up to registered boats that are much more complex. We offer inspections at a variety of different locations at the two lakes. While our season mostly runs from April through September, um, we do offer inspections outside of that season at our Nevada Street location. And then during the season, we change our hours of operation at sites depending on the amount of traffic that we see there. So Blood L. Donovan and our Samish Fish and Wildlife site, we end up operating them seven days a week from dawn to dusk because those are our highest traffic sites. In contrast, our Sudden Valley and South Bay locations are just open on weekends because we see a lot 
lot less boat traffic at those sites. Our inspection program is mandatory, and so as part of that, we do a vessel history survey and risk assessment. So we ask the boater where was the last place they had the boat in the water and when, and that helps us to determine the level of risk that boat poses to our local lake. In addition to doing that, we also do a visual and physical inspection. So we're looking to make sure there's no mud, water plants, or animals on board the watercraft. We make sure it's clean, drained, and dried, and then we decontaminate if needed. So that could be anything from removing plants to pumping out bilge compartments to doing a full decontamination if necessary. We treat each interaction with the boater as an educational opportunity because we want to make sure they can inspect their own boat even when inspectors are not present. We collect all of our data electronically on mobile devices in the field uh, using a database that we developed in-house. It allows us to seal their inspection, seal and permit history in real time across all of our sites. So it's been made much more efficient for our inspectors and for our boaters. We had to change a lot of our procedures this year in response to COVID-19. So we had new inspection and safety protocols. Um, we had to assign roles to try to minimize cross-contamination, uh, wear PPE, socially distance as much as possible. Uh, we moved our payment system completely online this year, had to do all of our training online as well, which was quite challenging. Um, and we ended up with a delayed start uh, because of that, but we still ended up uh, with increased traffic at all of our sites this year, which was really interesting. Uh, we did not have any Canadians come through our check stations this year, which was really different since we were clo so close to the border. Um, and then we did also have some outreach challenges. You know, it's a big part of our program, but in an age when we're trying to really minimize our interactions with the public, um, and the time we're spending with the public, we had to just focus on some of those real core messages this year. Here you can see the annual total number of watercraft inspections that we've conducted each year since we started the program back in 2013. You'll see a big jump from 2013 to 2014, and that's because we added those non-motorized hand-carried watercraft to the program at that time. The blue bars represent the number of inspections conducted at Lake Whatcom, and the yellow represent the inspections conducted at Lake Samish. We increased our hours of operation and added new sites over that time, which accounts for much of the increases. However, this year was quite an anomaly. We had a delayed start, we had no Canadian traffic, and we still saw huge increase in the number of inspections. In terms of the highlights, we had 19 inspectors working across all four launches. We conducted over 14,600 inspections across all four sites and interacted with an additional 1,100 visitors as well this year. We had 970 boats that required additional attention because they were carrying standing water that had to be removed, as well as 231 boats with vegetation that had to be removed um, before those boats could launch. And then we did an additional six full decontaminations of high-risk watercraft. This year, over 60% of our inspections occurred at Bloedel Donovan, um, and we did over 8,100 inspections at that site, and then we did over 3,800 inspections at the Lake Samish boat launch as well. In addition to asking our boaters where they last had their boat in the water, we also like to find out the full water body history of where that boat has ever gone in the past. That gives us that big picture risk assessment of where all our boats are going and coming from and things like that. And so this year we found out our boaters had taken their boats to over 1,004 different water bodies in 52 states and provinces at some point in the past, and that included 93 mussel infested lakes. So we often get asked what we found on the boats. And so this year, most of the boats we dealt with were actually clean, drained and dried. However, we did have 11% of the boats we inspected that required additional attention because they either had vegetation that had to be removed or standing water that we had to drain. We often had to pull out ballast bags to drain them and things like that. And then when additionally, we had the six boats that we had to do a full decontamination on. So when we get those high risk boats, um, we have to do a full decontamination. We pull out our mobile decontamination unit, which holds up to 400 gallons of water that we can heat up to a temperature of between 120 and 140 degrees to kill any of those aquatic invasive species. So we flush out any of those systems, ballast, tanks, engines, 
uh, compartments, things like that. And then uh, we can also do an exterior flush using our high pressure wand as well to remove any invasive species if needed. And so this year we had several boats coming in from Nevada and Arizona and different areas of concern um, from Texas as well that we had to decontaminate. We also have a wire seal program that sort of serves as an express pass for boaters returning to the same lake. So if a boat goes to Lake Wacom and then they decide they want to bring it back to that lake on their next visit, as they exit the lake, we can tether that boat to the trailer using wire and a uniquely numbered plunger seal. If they come back to the lake on their next visit and that seal is still intact, we know they haven't launched anywhere else, so we don't have to do a full inspection. We can just clip that seal, enter the data in our system, and let them go on their way. So this has made it much more efficient for us, as well as safer during times of COVID, so we can minimize those unnecessary interactions. But it does still allow us to communicate with boaters and do some education. Uh, we've had 1,500 boats participate in the program this year. Most of those interactions were at Blue Doll Donovan, our busiest site. And again, it really helped on those super busy days. We also have an on-site watercraft inspection program. So we do require people who have boats on Lake Wacom and Lake Samish, who even live there, to still get their boats inspected and permitted. And if they're not able to bring those boats to our check stations, we actually offer to go to their homes to do those inspections. So we'll often do large community appointments where we do several homes in one go um, with boats. And it's a great way for us to do some outreach with people from our own community. Um, so they really understand the efforts that we're making uh, to prevent the spread of invasive species to their lakes and to protect their properties. We also do early detection and monitoring. Um, so we're looking for different new species introductions. So we're always checking for those mussels. Um, we do that in partnership with the county and the state. And then we also look at existing species. So we do a lot of shoreline monitoring, aquatic plant surveys. We're looking at the extent of these infestations, um, the density of the populations, and then trying to come up with different management options as well. Most of the work that my team does uh, is looking at the Asian clam populations at Lake Wacom and Lake Samish, but we also document different aquatic plant species that we find. And then we also were the ones that discovered the New Zealand mud snails and have continued to monitor their infestation in Lake Patton, which is another one of our local water bodies. So education and outreach is one of the most important aspects of our program. We do much of this at our boat launches in person and at on-site appointments, but we also use a variety of other tools as well to get the message out. And so attending conferences like this is another great tool for us too. We also try to get the word out during events. And so this year we were able to attend several bass tournaments. We had a float plane fly in at Lake Whatcom, several small paddling events. And then we also did a lot of outreach about New Zealand mud snails at Lake Patton. So all of these events give us an opportunity to do outreach, not only with people from our community, but also people visiting from outside the area, uh, which is really important. We also have our own website, wacomboatinspections.com, where you can learn more about our program and ways to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. On there, you'll find out more information about our online aquatic invasive species awareness course. This is a course we developed back in 2014 for people to learn more about aquatic invasive species and our program. There's a short quiz at the end that people can take and if they pass it, they can get a discount code that can give them $10 off their permits. Uh, we've had over 13,000 people take this course since we launched it in 2014. The success of our program wouldn't be possible, though, if it weren't for the partnerships we've had both locally, at the state level, as well as regionally. We've learned so much from other programs in other places, um, sharing information and resources and things like that. And so if there's anyone out there who is interested in setting up a boat inspection program locally, uh, please do reach out. We're happy to share any lessons learned um, with you. And so with that, I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you, Tegan. That was very interesting. Um, quite frightening to realize that uh, boats come from 52 different states and um, provinces just to Lake Whatcom and uh, Lake Samish. We're holding questions till the end. So everyone, please uh, submit your questions online and we'll get to them at the end of the uh, session. 
So next up is uh, Ben Peterson, and he's going to talk about invasive species in King County. Hello, I'm Ben Peterson with the King County Noxious Weed Program, and I'm going to talk to you about Ligdwigia peploides, Class A noxious weed um, control that we are doing in an off-channel wetland near Seattle, Washington. So first of all, the taxonomy of Ludwigia species is still very confusing. And this is actually text from a book called Weed Control in Natural Areas of the Western U.S. Um, first, there are two or three invasive Ludwigia species. And of the Ludwigia species, Ludwigia peploides, the one I'm going to talk about, there are actually three subspecies. One is native to California, Ludwigia peploides, pep, subspecies peploides, and that's the one that's actually here in Washington that's invasive. It's not native in Washington. I'm not sure about Oregon, but I think it's invasive in Oregon. I don't think it's native there. Um, there's one that's native to South America, and there's another one that's native to large parts of the Southeast United States. So telling them apart. So Ludwigia peploides is the class A noxious weed. That's over here on the left side of your screen. Um, subspecies peploides. The main way you can tell it apart from the native Ludwigia is that it has alternate leaves. Leaves are about one to nine centimeters long. Generally grows prostrate sort of trailing along the ground. Um, but it can sort of mound up up to be about uh, 80 centimeters tall at the most. Um, and it grows in water that's up to three feet deep. And there's only one site in Washington state where this plant occurs. And that's the site here in King County near Seattle. Um, so it's a class A noxious weed, super high priority. Moving on, there's Ludwigia hexapetala. This is water primrose. This is a little more common weed, class B noxious weed in Washington state, still not native. Um, this also has alternate leaves. So both the non-native Ludwigias have alternate leaves. That's a key way you can tell them apart from the native one. This has yellow flowers also. The leaves are a lot narrower. Um, they're up to 12 centimeters long. This doesn't grow in quite as deep water, up to one meter deep. And there's a bunch of it down near Portland. Well, there's a lot of it in, you know, the Portland area in general, but there's some just north of uh, the Columbia River in Washington state. And I think they just found a site on Orcas Island, unfortunately. And then finally, there's the native plant called water purslane, Ludwigia palustris. This has opposite leaves. So you can see the leaves right here on opposite sides of the petiole. And I'm gonna turn off my camera to see if I can show you the, the um, flowers. The flowers for the native one are these little tiny green flowers that happen that grow on the, the leaf axles. So you probably won't ever really notice the flowers. If you, if you come across a plant that has opposite leaves and no yellow flowers, then it's likely the native water purslane. So to reiterate, class A weed here is circled in red, class B weed, uh, Ludwigia hexapetala, and the native plant. We're going to focus on Ludwigia peploides today. So here's a picture of water purslane, the native, circled in green, and the non-native one, class A, floating primrose willow, Ludwigia peploides circled in red. And this is at our site, our weed site um, in King County. You can see the alternate leaves on the one circled in red, the non-native one, and then the opposite little leaves. And they're quite a bit smaller too than the native one, but not always. So Ludwigia peploides occurs mostly like in the um, Mississippi River area, 
the drainages that flow into that, but other places in the south, east part of the United States. Um, that's one of the subspecies that mostly occurs there. Ludwigia peploides, subspecies peploides, is pretty common in California. Um, and also some parts of Oregon and King County. In Oregon, it's a class B weed because it's not, it is, it's a little bit more widespread, unfortunately. So the impacts of Ludwigia peploides. It um, decreases native plant diversity. Uh, like most noxious weeds, it crowds out native plants. It reduces open water habitat. It can reduce water flow in ditches. It can lead to oxygen levels being lowered and pH of water being lowered. It grows very quickly. Um, its biomass can double in 23 days. And its growth is not limited um, by competition, but it more so by physical space. So it can be can really take over a lot of habitat. This is sort of a re, re, um, coming back population after it was sprayed the year before at our site in King County. So it has big impacts in Europe too. Um, there's two non-native Ludwigias that are aggressive in Europe. This is one of them on the Lorry River Valley. This might be Ludwigia hexapetala, but Peploides grows in a similar habit or similar way. So it can be really invasive. It's not native in Europe, so that's a big impact there too. So the site that we have in King County is just north of Maple Valley. And this is, once again, this is the only place this plant grows in the whole state. So that's why it's super high priority for control. And it grows in unincorporated King County near the Cedar River, just about less than a mile upstream of the Cedar River along Taylor Creek. So we really don't want it to get into the Cedar River because that'd be bad news. So a history of the place where we have the plant here in King County, it is, was found growing on this um, old wetland site, um, part of a rural property um, and it was found about a year before a restoration project was instigated. Um, the county was bought, or the property was bought by King County, and they did a large, about three acre wetland restoration project, actually more than three acres, but, a, but about a three acres of it was created pools. Um, unfortunately, the county weed program wasn't able to eradicate the plant um, before the wetland restoration was done. So the weed has persisted. We've worked on it every year since. Um, but as you can see through these air photos, before the restoration project happened, the plant occurred in a small wetland, like in those trees there. And then there was a bit more habitat for it to grow, unfortunately. And it still persists within that sort of pink boundary um, that's sort of the, the full extent of where it has occurred. So here's a picture of it. Um, you can sort of see the plants just really filling out the water there. That's from several years ago. Luckily, it's not that bad right now. The water is anywhere from like just, you know, a few inches deep to up to more than five feet deep in some places. So it grows just fine there, unfortunately. Um, here's another picture of the plant being held. You can sort of see the, the scale of the leaves. So it has these sort of veins that are a little more visible, so almost like willow leaves. I think that's where it gets a com its common name. So first of all, getting around the site is tricky. Um, we used to wear knee boots and hip waders, and then we started wearing chest waders. You can get in a little deeper. Um, and then maybe five years ago or six years ago, I tried wearing a dry suit and a life jacket and bobbing around in five foot water, five foot deep water. So I was able to get to more plants that we couldn't reach otherwise. And then we thought, 
why don't we just shove our canoe through the woods? Uh, so we drug it maybe 100 feet through the woods or 200 feet through the woods and got to the wetland. Um, it's a lot of canoe shoving, but it works really well and we're getting pretty good at it and helps to have a durable canoe. But this makes getting to a lot of the plants that are just out there in the middle of the water um, that we wouldn't be able to get to otherwise. And also it makes it so we don't disturb them so much and break them, break them up with our boots. So we had to get a little creative. Um, in terms of control work, what we've done, we did for about 12 or 13 years is we sprayed the plants every year. Um, and I'll show you in a few slides what we use, but mostly foliar spray of aquatic herbicide approved by the State Department of Ecology. Um, often use blue dye, and of course we use aquatic surfactants to make sure the herbicide sticks. But a little tricky to get to these places because you don't want to wash the herbicide off the water. Um, here's my supervisor, my program manager, Steve, spraying some weeds a few years ago. Don't fall off the log. And then about three years ago, we got the weeds down to a small enough level that we were thinking, okay, let's just go out there and hand pull. Um, let's just see if we can really reduce them further by hand pulling. So we decided to go out three times a year and look around really carefully and hand pull. So it, you end up accumulating some biomass, that's for sure. Um, but it worked out pretty well. Um, just have to pull really slowly to get them all, bag them up, put them in the garbage, not the green waste. So here's a sort of a chart that shows the timeline. Um, along the bottom is the year that the plants were um, surveyed and controlled, and then how many square feet of the plants. Um, sometimes the area was you know, very large, but then a very low density. So we just multiplied the area times percent cover. Sometimes it was a pretty big area and a pretty dense cover. Um, the first maybe eight years or so, we used triclopyr, TEA, as the treatment. And then for two years, we used mazapyr. And then the last three years of spraying, we used amazamox, which seemed to work the best because that sort of knocked it down, back down to a really low level, um, just like maybe about 100 square feet of dense plants in 2007. Um, after that treatment, it's been a very low level. Um, this year, there was just 25 square feet at a, about 100% cover scattered around in three spots. So. We worked a lot and we got it down to a really low level. This graph, this shows um, how the plant has been scattered around the site over the years. The dots vary by year, but even just this most recent year, these red dots here, here, you know, these five or six red dots represent where we've seen the plant most recently and it's still in many different places so that I guess that shows how well you need to look around and we're wondering, you know, how did this plant get around to so many different places? So we thought, oh, maybe it was beavers. Um, we're not totally certain, but we did find one plant growing off by itself, just floating in the water. And it had at least three stems that were like sort of severed. You can sort of see these red circles around the stems. It almost looks like, you know, they're cut. It wouldn't. This wouldn't occur naturally. It's not like a really windy spot. There's no current or anything like that. So we thought that might be what happened. Um, there's definitely beaver activity out there. There's beaver dams along the, the creek channel that's adjacent to the site. And you can see beaver activity in these trees. So that might be what happened. Um, yeah, and this just shows how carefully you need to look for plants. Um, this is the one plant we found during our June survey this year. This one little plant hiding under some um, iris on the edge of the pond. And this other map here shows our track logs. It shows how we walked all around the site um, during our 2020 surveys looking for plants. So you need to be super thorough. In summary, 
persistence pays off. Um, we haven't seen any movement downstream. If you have a site like this, a situation like this, search your site multiple times for growing season. That way you can make sure you don't miss anything. And search very, very thoroughly. Budget time for a very thorough search um, so you won't be rushed, so you can do a good job, so you make sure nothing escapes. And experiment with field control, field equipment to access your site and control methods. That's it. Here's my contact info, King County Noxious Weeds. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very important uh, work, Ben. And um, so now for our next and final talk for this session, we have um, high diver uh, diver assisted suction harvesting, and this is by Garrett Remhold. Hi all, my name is Garrett Remhold, and uh, I'm the president and co-founder of Seascape's Millfoil Removal LLC. And my presentation today will be on the high selectivity and low specificity of diver assisted suction harvesting, or DASH as a new path forward in the fight against aquatic invasive species. So developing innovative control methods for managing aquatic invasive species is critical to combating the environmental threats these species pose. Diver assisted suction harvesting or DASH is a powerful hydraulic removal technique that can be utilized to effectively combat a multitude of different invasive species. Assisted suction harvesting is a hydraulically assisted extraction method whereby a diver collects individuals of the target species with what is functionally an underwater vacuum. And it's a very common practice. For example, um, our sister company, uh, Aquatic Plant Management, based out of the Midwest, uh, commonly utilizes DASH to, uh, to mitigate and remove milfoil, hydrilla, Brazilian elodea, and, and et cetera. So um, I, a key distinction that needs to be made right out of the gate is uh, that DASH is not a form of dredging. Rather, DASH is a form of mechanized hand removal. And um, in that, a diver uses their hands or small hand tools to, uh, to remove all aspects of a target species. So should that species be a, a plant species, the, uh, the diver can easily remove the stalk of the plant, the root crown, and any associated fragments quite easily. Um, you know, unlike hand removal, uh, a diver doesn't need to be careful with um, enveloping a, a target plant in a, a mesh bag or being cognizant to contain fragments. Um, they can simply manipulate the suction head to collect uh, uh, fragments that are easily uh, disturbed uh, during the removal process. They're easily uh, disturbed uh, during the removal process.
Hi, we're having some technical difficulties um, and um, Garrett is going to be giving a live presentation as soon as the slides are um, uh, make it to UW Tacoma. So while we're waiting, we're going to start with questions. And for Julian, uh, we have a question. Are the location data freely available from the app developers? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, and that's obviously a sticking point, right? Um, so just to be clear, um, people either opt in or opt out, de depending upon the social media platform with respect to whether their location is actually shared. All of the Flickr data is freely available um, on a public API. So uh, application programming interface in which the public can actually just query and get that information. Uh, it's obviously all anonymous, so we don't know who the people are or any of their demographic information. Um, but it varies it varies greatly. Firewalls, particularly around kind of Facebook um, and Twitter, although they have APIs in which uh, you can access the data, it's a little bit more of a trickier exercise. Um, so yeah, um, I'm on video here. Everything's above board. Uh, no big brother here. Um, and uh, yeah, we're asset, asset in the data much like anyone else can. Okay, a follow-up question is um, on the iBobber. Um, what other information would an angler get from an iBobber? So what, what's the primary use for that tool? Sure, um, so the iBobber is, is publicly available. Uh, Real Sonar created, it's a Seattle-based company. You, know, you can buy it on Amazon for I think around a hundred bucks and there's a lot of knockoffs. Essentially anglers use it, it's a solar sonar enabled so they can cast it and get a quick estimate of depth and bathymetry. It also has a fish finding um, a feature. Uh, anything above 15 centimeters I believe is pinged back and it all goes then just to a phone app. Um, it also records things like temperature and stuff like that, although it's, that's typically not used by the angler. Uh, so for our purposes, um, we like it because it uh, kind of basically pings up every 15 seconds to the cloud so we can get their location. Well, thank you, Julian. So we have a question for Tegan. Uh, was the increase in boaters this past summer mostly an increase from local people? That's a good question. Uh, we did see a lot of local people out using the water bodies, which makes sense with the COVID restrictions and people needing to stay relatively close to home. But we also noticed a lot of people were buying boats from out of state and coming through. So the level of high risk boats that we had was still relatively high. Um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of last water bodies, we had, um, they'd been in 290 different water bodies in 29 different states right before coming to our local lakes. And so that's still on par with what we had, you know, last year. So we're still getting those you know, out of state high risk boats coming through. We had another question for you. Um, how many penalties have, do you, you typically send out every year? Like how many tickets basically? Yeah, that's a good question. So on our end, we're more focusing on educating folks and making sure that they understand what they need to do to comply. And then we work with them to make sure they can pass those inspections. Um, so on the inspection end, we get people through the process. Um, and so they're not posing a risk to our local lakes. But in terms of the permit requirements, that's enforced more by the sheriff's office on the water. And again, they focus much more on educating people and giving warnings. Uh, this year, we actually had a much more uh, you know, much more stronger partnership with the sheriff's office. And so I haven't actually gotten the report yet from this year um, to know how that went, but I know they made a lot of contacts with folks. So, yeah. Really good work up there. <laughs> and we had a question for Ben. Uh, where do you find out what herbicides are allowed for use in water? Also, do you think seedlings could still be sprouting? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I heard the first question, where, what, where do you find out what pesticides are allowed in water? Um, the Washington State Department of Ecology runs the permit program for in water herbicide use, and they have two permits, the aquatic noxious weed permit and the aquatic plant and algae management permit. And on those permits, they list I don't know, the, you know, eight or 10 or so different herbicides that are allowed for use in water under that permit. Um, 
and it varies by states. Washington is a little more stringent than other states, but you need to have the permit and also uh, a special license. And then what was the other question? Something about seeds? Uh, the, the second question had to do, um, do you think seedlings could still be sprouting after your treatment? Oh, could they be sprouting after we do the control work? Sorry, audio exactly. fixed. I think that's what the question is. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that could be the case, um, especially with the, the strain. So that's why we back three times a year. We go back in we go June and then August and then again in September. So we try to be super thorough and try to find little seedlings. Um, I think it does. It mostly reproduces vegetatively, although the seeds are viable. Okay, so checking in with Mark, are we ready to go to the um, last presentation? Okay, great. Can uh, everyone see that uh, that slide entitled Advantages of Dash? Are we, are we good to go? Okay. Um, so the advantages of Dash, uh, this is where I want to kind of pull everything together with uh, the high selectivity portion uh, of, of, the, of the PowerPoint. And so by high selectivity, we mean that um, target species can be removed almost surgically. So should we have a, uh, uh, for example, a milfoil plant uh, surrounded by um, native species, that individual plant can be removed just like uh, a handful uh, methodology. Um, and that I think is a really powerful tool. Uh, like I said, in the, uh, in the uh, previous slide, having, um, not having to worry about uh, this, this spreading of fragments is um, is pretty crucial because the diver can just uh, manipulate the suction head. Um, it's a herbicide-free method, and uh, we think that's pretty important because um, in our experience with uh, local lake communities, herbicide, um, although it is effective, it can be uh, highly controversial, and the optics of uh, herbicide use are um, not the best. And I think that um, it's a combination of uh, of uh, public perception and um, a lack of education, but uh, nonetheless, you know, it's bypassing the, the negative objects of herbicide is, is, is great. Um, and then piggy piggybacking off of that, uh, avoiding any sort of uh, oxygen deficiency or suboxid conditions that can result because of a herbicide treatment is, uh, is pretty crucial to prevent um, uh, the chemical cycling of, of a lake from being drastically altered. Um, you know, if, uh, if a herbicide treatment is conducted and uh, the dead and decaying biomass is improperly removed, then um, suboxic or anoxic conditions can occur. And uh, <clears throat> another uh, big advantage of DASH is that it uh, can be used during all stages of infestation uh, or invasion. And uh, I think that's pretty, pretty exciting. It can be used uh, right when a species is um, is discovered, or it can be used um, during the uh, the long term management. Um, just because it, it, it unlike divers diver hand pulling, it is it's mechanized. It can be used on a much broader, larger scale, um, which is which is a pretty cool thing. And then also, um, dash is suitable for sensitive body water, uh, like uh, like Whatcom, um, so drinking water reservoirs sensitive uh, watershed, um, bodies of water where a uh, herbicide or biocide application is, is not appropriate. DASH can be a, a, a viable alternative to, uh, to, to herbicide in, uh, in that respect. Uh, so if we just advance the supply to the... Uh, so um, the disadvantages of, which we... Do we, is it the, uh, the disadvantages of DASH? Is that the next one or it looks like we just have standard? There we go. Uh, so there's disadvantages of DASH. Uh, I think like any methodology, there's always some drawbacks. Um, I think that the big uh, initial uh, drawback is the fact that uh, DASH is fairly expensive, especially relative to chemical treatment. 
uh, you know, putting any human underwater has uh, inherent associated costs with it. Um, and then on top of that, generally one treatment isn't always enough. Um, therefore, uh, DASH is a more time and energy intensive process than say the application of herbicide, um, especially some herbicides are extremely effective. Um, but that's not to say that uh, that time and energy is, uh, is not worthwhile. Um, also, the rate of progress uh, it decreases as density of, of uh, the target species increases. You know, so if there's, if there's more milfoil or there's, there's more hydrilla, then um, the rate of progress of, of removal of that plant holistically will, uh, will decrease. Uh, and also the, the rate of progress and therefore the efficiency is very much dependent on the, the crew operating the equipment. So if a diver or divers uh, are not properly trained in, in DASH or do not have much experience, then there will be a, um, uh, a decrease in, in efficiency. Um, all, you know, also permitting is a, uh, has been an issue for, for us in that, um, because this is such a, a new technique being used on the West Coast, um, Fish and Wildlife has not really been sure how to permit this. We've proceeded by just um, acquiring standard HPAs, but um, you know, we're still working with Fish and Wildlife to, to streamline this process. Um, and that's, uh, that's been, a, been a sticking point for us. Um, so if you could advance to the, uh, to the next slide, the standard dash filtration system. So uh, most dash systems, most dash boats that are commercially available um, utilize just a simple direct bagging or a simple screen filtration mechanism to, to sieve out or separate biomass from the, uh, the, the water stream or the slurry. Uh, and this, this simple methodology, though, it makes it really easy for the operator, uh, like the direct bagging, is, uh, was not uh, adequate for, for uh, operation in Lake Sammamish and Lake Washington, which are uh, the, the primary lakes that we operate in. And that's due to WDFW's regulations to protect uh, endangered salmonid species. So, um, so what we had to do was, was devise uh, our own system to meet those unique requirements. And so what we, we did was that we developed a, a wet well catchment combined with a, a sorting table and then also combined with uh, a turbidity containment and management system so that uh, if we did mobilize any bed material, it could be and, and can be directly redeposited to the lake bed. Um, so uh, on the, the, the picture to the left here uh, of your screen, that's just an example of the direct bagging system where you have the, the end of the discharge just um, uh, puts the biomass and slurry into the bag and then uh, whatever isn't caught by the bag, so whatever fragments aren't, aren't caught by the bag or redeposited back into the water body. And, and that um, kind of defeats the purpose of DASH for early maintenance because you're essentially going through a field of dandelions, uh, just, just kicking them. You're not really collecting all the the fine fragments and thereby you, you run the risk of actually propagating these, uh, these invasive species. Um, and then in the, uh, the picture to the right, that is just a really basic, uh, a simple screen filtration me mechanism where the, um, the slurry is deposited onto the screen and then uh, the biomass is dewatered and then the, the biomass can be, uh, can be removed and then properly properly bagged. Generally, those simple screens aren't adequate enough because the orifice size of the screen is not uh, fine enough to really catch all of the reproductively viable fragments. Um, so ensuring that a DASH system has uh, a fine filtration screen or a, a secondary screen is, is pretty crucial. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide, biomass management system. Um, I think you, you went one too far. There we go. Um, so the, the biomass management system, and this is what we, uh, we came up with as, as, our, uh, as our method. So we built this system to meet all the, the unique requirements set forth by Fish and Wildlife. And uh, it's broken down into three primary stages. You have the, uh, the, the gross biomass separation, you have the stratification phase, and then you have the uh, fragmentation collection. 
and that is uh, just part of the, the filtration mechanism. And then below that is the actual turbidity and sediment control system. So the, the like I said, the the triple stage filtration is pretty crucial because it allows us to catch um, all sorts of, of fragment sizes. So uh, the gross biomass separation will collect uh, a large ball of um, of weed biomass, say just a, a large clump of milfoil. Um, the water slurry will uh, will um, allow the the water to fall through into the wet well catchment. The wet well is important because should we um, suck up a non-target species um, like a fish or any sort of um, invertebrate, uh, the survivability of that environment is, is much, much higher so that they are in fact in water and capable of, of sustaining life. Um, and then the third, um, the, the third point, which is the fine fragmentation collection, we have a a filter screen that we can change the orifice size depending on the uh, target species. And, uh, you know, so say we're, we're removing milfoil, then we can use a, uh, a very fine uh, filter mesh. If we're going after um, uh, Asian clams, we can use a larger orifice size. So, so that interchangeability of the, the, the finer uh, fragmentation screen is pretty important. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide, um, this is a biomass management system, uh, turbidity management. Um, actually, yeah, the, the DAS, plus, DAS plus BMS, which is our biomass system. So this is, I wanted to, to include these pictures just to take a step back and, and, and look at the whole system from afar and, and why we think that DASH is, is a really great tool for the, the management of invasive species. Um, so I think uh, I think you may have advanced the slide just one too far. Could go back to the dash plus BMS. There we go. Thank you. Um, so uh, on the picture to the left, th these are all the, the the stages of the filtration system. You have stage one, which is the, which is uh, the gross um, biomass separation. Stage two, which is the stratification stage, and that's where um, fragments can stratify out of the, the fluid stream and um, and then be collected by the third stage of the fine filter. So uh, the transfer chute is actually how we transfer the biomass to our biomass skip. Um, and we found that to be extremely effective and it allows us to holistically get rid of bags uh, because we were concerned that uh, bagging any of the biomass leaves an opportunity to inadvertently capture a, a non-target species and um, and then forget about them, and that's you know working in, in a in a body of water where 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 we might be interfacing with uh, highly threatened species. It was it was of utmost concern, and it was um, an utmost concern of ours to make sure that we didn't uh, jeopardize these species um, at all. So uh, the the picture in the middle that's just the biomass skiff uh, underneath our our crane, and that's just lifting a uh, I think it's a two thousand pound bag of milk oil. Um, but I think what's really cool and it's highlighted by this, this picture on the right is that's a, a 6,000 pound pile of uh, Brazilian Eladia that we were able to remove in a day from Lake Sammamish. And when I say remove, I mean, you know, root crown, stem, fragments, the whole, everything holistically was removed. And so I think that that picture really highlights the efficacy of DASH for uh, a later stage infestation as a management tool. So. Uh, you know, most of um, most of, of diver handling um, activities are, are done in early in the early stages of an infestation, but I think that uh, this picture really underscores how dash can be the uh, a tool utilized in, in the latter half of uh, of an infestation where we're just managing and, and conducting mitigation as opposed to remediation, or ideally with enough time. That, re that mitigation would become remediation. So if you could advance to the biomass management, management system, uh, I want to just kind of underscore the, uh, the turbidity control system. So um, tr controlling turbidity is really, really crucial. Uh, and that was one of the major concerns that Fish and Wildlife had and uh, we had as well. So what we did is we um, affixed a uh, collapsible, flexible piece of ducting to our uh, discharge 
uh, ports on the on the whole of our pontoon boat, and uh, and that would would consolidate and redeposit any collected bio or uh, bed material, which we rarely actually move or or mobilize bed material, but um, to make sure that if we did, if we had to, um, we were able to just redeposit that to the, to the lake bed. Um, most batch operations don't actually generate a whole lot of turbidity, but knowing that uh, a diver, should they need to mobilize some bed material to ensure that they completely remove the root ground of a target species, should it be a plant, um, it is nice to know because then we, we can really reduce the, the variability associated with diver hand removal, just so that uh, we know each plant is completely removed and uh, it's a good deal. So, um, Low species specificity. This is the, uh, the the second part to the title that I think is is, is really cool. Is that um, you know if you were to take dash and couple it with a a proper biomass control system or filtration system, there there aren't very many species that you can't target. So in the in the in a in terms of plants, we can uh, target immersed floating or submerged plants. Um, we can also use them for invertebrates. So when we start talking about how do we control New Zealand mud snails, how do we control um, uh, uh, various invasive mussel species like um, zebra mussels, using uh, dash is, is a very promising methodology. You know we've uh, we've we've been able to conduct a few tests utilizing um, rice grains to simulate um, New Zealand mud snails, and we put them on the lake bed, suck them up, and then counted all all the um, the grains of rice in the catchment and we put 30 down and we, we, we suck 30 up so I think um, when we when you start looking at these these uh, large-scale invasions of invasive species knowing that we can use a tool that that's not necessarily a, a chemical tool I think is really important because it gives us a uh, a whole new methodology to control um, invasive species which are only going to get worse I and mean, as globalization increases as um waterborne commerce increases you know this this these these invasive species are only going to be spreading faster um and so knowing that we have uh more tools in the toolkit to control these uh is is really important um and so just to kind of sum it all up uh for the, the low species specificity um if it lives underwater and can fit through the suction head we can remove it and I think that's a very powerful thing. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's all I really have. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. I also want to thank uh, uh, the Walpa host for uh, putting this whole presentation together. It was great. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear oh, you. Just checking. <laughs> yeah, thank you for being flexible on um, bouncing over to a live um, presentation when you had such a great um, presentation pre-recorded. So we had one question for you, and that was how do costs compare with the uh, uh, diver-assisted um, suction harvesting to um, the big mechanical harvesters? Uh, they can actually be less expensive. Operating those large uh, surface-borne um, uh, road tillers can be extremely expensive. Um, logistically, the challenges uh, with finding someone who either owns or rents one has been pretty pretty difficult. And um, because of their size, they're also really hard to deploy in, in certain bodies of water. So we found that um, dash can actually be cheaper than, than a surface road tiller. Um, and I think, you know, I can't give you any specific metrics on that because it kind of depends on who has the, uh, the surface harvesting device, but um, it's definitely comparable, if not cheaper. And are you working all across Washington or do you have many sites in Washington at this point? We do. Um, we've worked with Snohomish County, um, the surface water management team up in Lake Goodwin and Lake Shoecraft. Um, and also Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish, um, Liberty Lake, Liberty Lake down in uh, Tacoma, um, 
so you know we, we can work all across Washington um, and so not, we're not particularly limited by uh, geography. Well, thank you. Thank and you. We, we're going to circle back to Tegan with a couple of questions. And, and just how big is your team, Tegan? Like, uh, yeah, so this year we had, uh, so I'm, I'm a full-time employee and I have one other uh, full-time employee. And then I have two nine-month seasonal staff. And then we had 17 six month uh, seasonals this year. But in the early days, we started with, you know, three people and eight people. So we've been growing steadily over time. Then do you coordinate with other counties or do you like Snohomish, Skagit, Island County? Do they also have programs like this or? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, we. We definitely are open to working with other places, and so I do get calls from um, from other folks. So I've gone out to Lake Chelan to talk to their board about potentially setting up a program. Um, but no, we're very unique in Washington State in terms of this local effort. But we do coordinate um, mostly with our own, you know, programs within our own county. Uh, when we find infestations and things like that, we'll check in with other places. And then we do attend a lot of regional meetings and state meetings and work closely with uh, Fish and Wildlife because they also have inspection stations on our borders as well. And this is a question I had as well as someone else had was, um, how do you control flow plains as um, invasive species vectors? That's a great question. So we actually work really closely with the Washington Seaplane Pilots Association. Uh, and so they do a lot of outreach to their membership on ways to prevent the spread of invasive species. And then when they come in here, for example, they they send us a lot of their logs uh, and information. So we uh, know where they've been launching and kind of can assess their risk. But for many of the planes, you know, if they are um, true float planes, you know, they are coming from one lake and, and having to land. So it's difficult to um, inspect them before they land. In the case of the event we had this summer though, uh, most of those planes were amphibious and so they actually had come from airports on land um, prior to coming to Lake Whatcom. So those are the kinds of practices we encourage so they're not, you know, transporting any species between lakes. Yeah, that sounds good. It looked kind of funny with the big airplane coming. <laughs> you just don't know. Thank you. So we have a question for Ben. Uh, how do you think that plant originally got into the watershed or the wetland? Good question. Um, I was just talking with the restoration site manager um, and they definitely knew the, the weed was there before they started the project and he said it looked like the pond or it was like a, an area that looked like had a, aquarium rocks and things like that. So it could be that it came from an aquarium dump. Um, from the previous oh. landowner, um, we don't know. Yeah, I mean, wish we knew. Yeah, it looked pretty extensive in your pictures. Pretty well established at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, it was really scattered around because the, the the site had a lot of wood, woody debris, and overhanging willows and stuff. So, it takes a lot of work to really look carefully. Um, and then we have a question for any one of the panelists. Um, on average, when a new invasive species is discovered in a lake, river, or reservoir, uh, where on the invasion curve is this species, uh, i.e. early to well established? Um, and how does this play into the choice of how to manage it or not? So I guess we'll go with you first, Ben. Um, I mean, if it's an uncommon species, a class A weed, such as this Ludwigia, then it would be super high priority to get, get rid of. Um, in general, we know all the lakes that have the common weeds, such as milfoil and um, Brazilian alidea. But yeah, we're definitely, our main focus would be early detection rapid response. Um, Tegan, anything? Yeah, I think, you know, it, for us, it's dependent on the species. I do think if you have these early detection programs in place, that's really important to be able to catch them early. Uh, in the case of when we found the Asian clams in Lake Whatcom, it was actually residents that found them on a beach. So they were already had been present for several years by the time we found them. And unfortunately, that's a common story. 
So I definitely think having those early detection programs, getting out there surveying um, and working with your communities, if you're people living on the lake so that they can ideally catch these things um, is really important. How about you, Julian? No, I think they covered it. <laughs> covered it okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and then just a final question here for Garrett. It kind of relates to the previous question. Um, can you estimate the cost for a treatment with the DASH approach? Uh, I can, and I think it depends on the, the, the size of area. Um, the, the larger the, the treatment area, the, the less expensive it is, just because once, uh, once the, our boat is deployed, um, leaving it there and being able just to conduct operations in, in a discreet location um, makes us more efficient and therefore uh, a less, less expensive. Um, so, you know, most of our, our uh, unfortunately we, uh, only really work with private homeowners for the most part right now. Uh, we've been working towards uh, uh, reaching out to municipalities, uh, government agencies, statewide agencies to try and say, hey, this is a new management technique. But uh, for now, we, we generally we charge on a, a, a square foot basis um, at about 40 cents a square foot. Uh, but that also depends on um, growth density uh, that's assuming maximum growth density. So a plant uh, every, you know, six to 12 inches. Um, but as, as the, uh, the density decreases, um, we can move faster. A great example of that is, is our, uh, our workup uh, with, with Nahomish County on Lake uh, Goodwin, where that was more of just a survey where uh, we actually weren't really using the dredges. We were just uh, diving on scooters, looking for uh, invasive milfoil um, marking the location of each plant and then and then removing them um, and you know if the, the cluster of plants was uh, fairly large then we deploy the dredge um, so I think it'll kind of depend um, but generally for a, you know uh, a good a good estimate is, is anywhere from twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars a day is a uh, is a decent is a decent metric. Well, thank you for that estimate and thank all of our panelists today uh, for this very interesting and important topic. Um, we're done with questions and we'll be meeting again back up for session seven on uh, waves and source tracking at 12 or at 120. 120. We'll see you again.
Ready to go? Welcome back, everyone, to the um, 33rd conference for WALPA. And we're starting the session seven. It's on waves and source, source tracking. We have four presenters this um, a session. The first is um, Basile Cousin, and he'll be talking about uh, literature review of sediment and nutrient resuspension. Thanks, Basile. From France, from the University uh, Lyon 2 and uh, Lyon 1. Uh, this presentation is co rated uh, by Iver Crawford, Crystal Sonora, and Frank Willem uh, from the University of Idaho, uh, from the Department of Fish and Wildlife Science in the College of Natural Resources. Uh, this presentation will talk about the phenomenon of sediment and nutrient resuspension in response to uh, hydrodynamic disturbance originated from the surface. So, in a first time, we will define the study objective and the method that we use to review the literature. In a second time, we will present some bibliometric about the worldwide distribution of the research on the resuspension phenomenon and the aspects that are covered by the literature. In a third time, we will uh, explain the main ideas uh, from the literature about the resuspension phenomenon and the main results from the meta-analysis that we made. Then uh, we want to discuss this result and extract the main challenges of the research in uh, future studies and also make some recommendation and suggest future direction for research. This literature review that we made focused on the resuspension phenomenon induced by surface hydrodynamic disturbance, both from natural origin, mainly wind, and from anthropogenic origin, mainly boats. We peer-reviewed more than 180 articles on the phenomenon of resuspension, from which we extracted the main ideas. On this article set, we extracted the data of 33 of them that we implemented in a meta database that allow us to make statistics at a worldwide scale. So, what are the results? First, about bibliometrics, uh, we can see uh, on this plot the distribution of the time of the number of publications on the resuspension phenomenon. So we can see that there is a clear increase of the number of, of publications since five decades, and especially since, uh, the, since 2001, with many new publications every year, and this dynamics uh, seems to continue with seven new publications uh, since the beginning of this year. This figure represents the geographical repartition of the studies on the phenomenon of resuspension. We can see that North America is a, represents a great part of the studies uh, on the resuspension phenomenon, with 25 articles published on the phenomenon. Uh, China also represents a great part of the phenomenon uh, resuspension studies, with more than 40 articles published. In a lesser extent, also Europe and Oceania, mainly with Australia and New Zealand, uh, uh, has published uh, on resuspension phenomenon. This figure represents the typology of the studies that we implemented in the meta database. We can see that most of these studies are field studies uh, with more than, with 25 uh, studies. Uh, eight studies are laboratory, laboratory studies, and two studies are modeling studies. Um, a large majority of these studies focused on wind induced hydrodynamic disturbance uh, with more than 26 studies compared to only five that focused on hydrodynamic disturbance in general and only three on boats uh, and one uh, more specifically on boats. Uh, we can also identify that studies focusing on boats are only field studies while studies focusing on hydrodynamic disturbance in general are uh, only uh, laboratory studies. In contrast, studies focus focusing on wind were studies of all types. This figure represents the parameters that were used to characterize the hydrodynamic disturbance 
uh, and this figure uh, represents the parameter that, wa that was used to characterize uh, the effect of uh, this hydrodynamic disturbance. Both of these plots uh, for, are for the metadatabase article that we implemented in the metadatabase. Uh, what we see is that most studies uh, used wind speed to quantify the disturbance and focused on suspended sediment parameters uh, to uh, measure the effect of the hydrodynamic disturbance. Uh, when the studies also focused on nutrients, they mainly reported to the total phosphorus with more than 15 studies, then total nit nitrogen with nine studies, but rarely on dissolved nutrients. Only seven focused on dissolved phosphorus and five on dissolved nitrogen. To quantify the disturbance, shear stress was reported in only six studies. Also, what's something interesting to mention is that on four studies on both, five different parameters quantifying the disturbance were used. Now we want to present what are the main ideas from the literature on the resuspension phenomenon. If we had sufficiently strong winds on both at the surface of the lake, hydrodynamic disturbance will occur in the water column. First in the surface by an increase of the wave height, but will increase as a function of the wind speed and the wind fetch for the wind hydrodynamic disturbance, and as a function of uh, boat type, uh, distance of the boat passage, and boat speed for the boat. Uh, this, the wind and the boat will also act deeper down in the water column by increasing uh, the current speed. With uh, this increasing of the wave 8, it is associated orbital movement that originated from the surface and are directed towards the bottom. This combination of orbital movement and current speed will create shear stress on the bottom. This amount of shear stress in the bottom is uh, dependent on the depth of the water column as conditioning the transmission of the hydrodynamic disturbance towards the bottom and also uh, the intensity of the hydrodynamic disturbance. Once a critical value of shear stress is exceeded, sediment will start to be put in suspension from the bottom to uh, the water column. This critical value of shear stress uh, is dependent on different parameters. First, the granularity of the substrate, but also its cohesiveness and also uh, if it is organic or inorganic material. So it will be more uh, shallow zone with thin uh, sediment that will be more prone to a suspension. Uh, this plot from the meta-analysis that we made showed to us the clear increase of suspended sediment concentration in the water column after a resuspension episode compared to before. The literature also interests itself to the nutrient that can be carried uh, with, this, uh, with the resuspension episode. Uh, they mainly concentrated on phosphorus and nitrogen, both in particulate and dissolved form. Uh, it has been shown that the dissolved nutrient not always increase after a resuspension uh, due to the high numbers of parameters that control the liberation of uh, nutrient from particulate to dissolved form, such as the pH value, but also the amount of iron uh, in the sediment and also the quantity of oxygen in the water column at this moment. The nitrogen also has been shown to not always increase after a resuspension episode. Um, and we, as we attribute this non always increase to the literature that focus mainly on already eutrophic lake, so with a high value of total nitrogen in the water column uh, even uh, before uh, the resuspension occurs. However, all the literature is in accordance to uh, say that the total phosphorus increase almost always after a resuspension episode. We attributed this increase of total phosphorus in the water column due to the, to the high concentration of phosphorus in the bottom sediment, and when this bottom sediment are put in suspension in the water column, they carry with them a high quantity of phosphorus. Uh, and uh, this uh, result is supported by this uh, linear regression from the meta-analysis that we made with a strong positive relationship between total phosphorus and suspended sediment uh, in the water column. 
then the literature to quantify the increase of algae in response to hydrodynamic disturbance made the measurement of chlorophyll A. But we detected the big biases of the literature in this measurement uh, because recently deposited material can uh, be detected as a development of algae but a uh, result from a resuspension of vegetative material. However, uh, when this resuspension is detected after a more long period of time after the resuspension episode, it can be due to the development of algae. Uh, this biases can explain the high variability of response of increase in chlorophyll A after or during the resuspension episode compared to before. Then the literature has shown that the resuspension can be a trigger for eutrophication. First, by increasing the phosphorus in the water column, that has been shown to be the limiting nutrient in uh, aquatic ecosystem. And also, uh, continued turbid condition may favor floating species compared to rooted species. This processes can lead to the depth of biota and great concern for human health. However, there is a different trend when there are macrophytes in the water column. First, emergent macrophytes, they can act on breaking the wave, but also breaking orbital movement and current in currents in the water column, but also by pumping the nutrients in the sediment and maintaining the surface bed. Uh, the literature has also shown that submerged macrophytes act kind in the same wave, same way as emergent macrophyte and also floating species play the role but, a role but more by pumping the nutrient already released in the water column. So the macrophyte act on hydrodynamics by breaking the wave, uh, breaking the orbital movement and current speed, on sediment by maintaining them and on nutrient by pumping them both in the overlying water and in the sediment. So the macrophyte act on all the aspects of the resuspension. Now we want to discuss this result and mention the main challenges for future research. First, we detected the unequal distribution of research worldwide. This uh, high concentration of studies in North America can be attributed to the high productive traditional research in limnology. In Asia, a high concentration of studies are uh, lead, led on like Taiyu in China with more than 44 studies on resuspension phenomenon. It can be due to the high numbers of algae bloom uh, that can occur on the lake and the fact that it supplies drink, drinking water for more than 2 million people. We also detected uh, that the Research focuses on already eutrophic lake, uh, so uh, this doesn't allow us to know the consequences of resuspension in all oligotrophic lakes. Also, we detected the lack of studies on hydrodynamic disturbance from both, with studies that focus mainly on wind-originated uh, hydrodynamic disturbance. Also, we detected we detected uh, too much heterogeneity in the way of characterizing the disturbance and this uh, really prevent uh, comparison between different studies and also the establishment of clear management policies and this also prevent the identification of resuspension phenomenon. So we detected a lack of studies uh, characterizing spatially the phenomenon in lakes also, the studies focus mainly on short time scale effect and we don't know the effect of hydrodynamic disturbance uh, at the scale of week or month, for example. And also, there is a lack of interrogation on the interaction and comparison between external loading and internal loading and how the external loading uh, can uh, play a role and, uh, in the internal loading and what are the delay uh, between uh, high external loading uh, on the extent of the internal loading, for example. Then we want to make some recommendations for future research and for lake managers. Uh, we think that uh, interdisciplinary team of researchers will be very efficient and very interesting, uh, with spe uh, specifically with ecologists, geomorphologists and physicists in fluid mechanics. 
Also, the use of ADV and ADCP technology will be very interesting because it has the capacity of measure hydrodynamic disturbance in the same time as suspended particulate matter. Also, there, is, there will be a need for manager to monitor trophic status of flake before and after the resuspension episode. Also, substrate composition and bathymetry are essential uh, parameters to take into account in the resuspension phenomenon. Uh, also, in the case of nautical practice, uh, according to these two parameters previously mentioned, uh, there will be a need to establish no wreck zone. And also, there is a big need uh, to encourage lake fund property owners to have a uneven and macrophyte covered shoreline to avoid reflecting wave and multiplying the resuspension effect. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And now I am available to answer uh, to all your questions and comments. Thank you. Hello everybody, I am uh, Basil Cousin uh, from France, from the University uh, Lyon 2 and uh, Lyon 1. Uh, this presentation is co-writted uh, by Iver Crawford, Crystal Sonora and Frank Willem uh, from the University of Idaho, uh, from the Department of Fish and Wildlife Science in the College of Natural Resources. Uh, this presentation will talk about the phenomenon of sediment and nutrient resuspension in response to uh, hydrodynamic disturbance originated from the surface. So, in the first time, we will define the study objective and the method that we use to review the literature. In the second time, we will present some bibliometric. I thank you very much for your um, almost doing it twice <laughs> for your talk on um, your literature view, Monsieur, aka Le Boss, I hear. <laughs> and um, I hadn't really thought about this, but I think you should um, get in touch with, um, with the model uh, for King County. Maybe we can add this to the make Tim's job even more exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our next speaker is Heather Crawford of the University of Idaho. She'll be talking about um, using ground-based LIDAR to measure uh, shoreline accretion. Thank you, Heather. Okay, I, could, I didn't see anything up, so um, <laughs> I was waiting for my slides, sorry. I am not. Um, it's just WPH4. I think the slides are actually showing on the site. Oh, They're are they? Okay, they the just topic. showed up. They just showed up for me. Okay, I was just just waiting. I didn't know if I was the only one not seeing them. Okay, um, so I'm good to go whenever you guys are. Okay. Um, all right, so hi everyone, good afternoon. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm Heather Crawford and I'm gonna cover the basics of using ground-based LIDAR 3D scanning to measure shoreline accretion and erosion in response to waves and wakes. 
Um, I'm a first year master's student at the University of Idaho. Uh, I'm working with Dr. Frank Wilhelm. And for this presentation and for most of my thesis, I have also worked with Dr. Jan Idol from the University of Idaho, Basile Cousson, who presented just before me, um, and of course with Frank. And I'm not sure if this is moving ahead of me or not, so I'll just keep going. Um, so to give you guys a quick overview of what I'll be talking about today, I'm just going to provide you with uh, some of the background and the big picture of my thesis and my research, the entire thing, and then talk about how we go on to measure anthropogenic and natural effects on the shoreline. I'll introduce you to terrestrial laser scanning, uh, or TLS, which is the, the methodology that I'll be talking about today. So the basics, the utility, um, kind of the analysis behind that. Um, we all talk about going about quantifying shoreline change, changes in the shoreline, um, both with accretion and erosion. I'll talk about the pros, cons, costs of this method, um, and then I'll kind of summarize everything up and talk about what we're going to work on moving into the future. So next. Okay, so the big picture um, of my research uh, comes down to mainly four things. So if you click four times, they'll come up. So it comes down to waves, wake, sediment, and nutrients. Um, so overall, I'm looking to determine the amount of material resuspended from wave versus wake disturbance, and then the subsequent amount of nutrients released into the near shore environment from those disturbances. So basically, how is water quality affected? And you can click one more time. Okay. Um, so just to clarify, we define waves as naturally occurring. Uh, so pretty much from wind mainly, and then wakes are anything anthropogenic. Um, so basically from boats, uh, they're human generated. Um, and we particularly concentrate on large boats and boats that create larger wakes. And so one of the end goals of my thesis is to be able to separate anthropogenic wake turbines from natural wave disturbance and to determine the effect um, boat wakes have on the near shore environment so that we can understand and quantify those effects. And by separating anthropogenic disturbance from natural disturbance, we can provide information to data managers and policymakers uh, that they can use to make science driven decisions that maintain all interests. So it's important to maintain water quality. You can click twice. Um, obviously, we all have an interest in maintaining water quality. That's why we're here. But there's also an importance to maintaining recreation. So we know it's hard to tell people what to do and what not to do. Um, but recreation is also really economically important and should be considered. And so balancing the two is crucial for maintaining both. Um, you can go next. I might have to do a couple clicks. Uh, one more and two more. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so the system that I am working on is Payet Lake in Idaho, also known as Big Payet Lake. It's a glacially formed, pretty large, deep oligotrophic lake uh, in west central Idaho. Right on its south shore sits the town of McCall, Idaho. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, you can keep going, I'll just keep talking. Um, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with McCall, Idaho. Um, it's about five hours south of Spokane and two hours north of Boise. Um, and it's the town that sits on the shores of Payette Lake. Um, Payette Lake serves as the drinking water source for the town of McCall um, and for others who live around the lake. And it's also one of the main economic drivers of the region uh, through tourism and recreation of all kinds. So on the lake, this includes, as we all know, swimming, kayaking, fishing, motorboating, jet skiing, things like that. Um, and while we know and have studied the effects of wind and natural wave phenomena on this lake, um, you can click a, one more time, I think. Um, understanding the effects that recreation has on the physical and chemical properties of the lake grows more important as recreation becomes more prominent in these regions. And on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so we focused really on the question of how recreation, specifically motorized recreation like boats and jet skis, affects the lake shoreline outside and on top of how wind waves do. So understanding these effects becomes increasingly important with advances in boating technologies, especially those that enhance and maximize wake, wake height. And since boats like this are relatively new, their effects on lakes erosion and water quality hasn't been widely studied yet. So that is something that we aim to do. And then I don't know if any of you guys have noticed, but these things are also getting really popular and really fast, at least around here. So that's something else to consider. And then we also need to consider kind of our regulations in place on the water body. So speed limits and no wake zones as well as the characteristic of the lake and the shoreline. So how deep is the lake? What kind of substrate do you have in the near shore environment and on the shoreline? And is the shoreline developed or not? And so it's really important to figure out how recreation, all of these things considered, affects the shoreline and in what way. And we can ask not just how boats affect the shoreline, but then how do we quantify that effect? 
and does disturbance from human activities result in erosion or accretion? And then if we you know, go on to answer those questions, we can say, how do we accurately quantify the amount of material being released from those activities? And from there, can we attribute nutrient concentrations to the material being released to quantify the concentration of nutrients being released through each kind of disturbance or activity? Next. So to, do, to get there to answer that question, um, which is a pretty complicated question, part of the way that we get there um, is we're using what's called terrestrial laser scanning, which is a form of uh, ground-based LIDAR three-dimensional scanning and rendering. And uh, what the heck does all that mean? Um, some of you may have heard of this, but uh, if you have not, because I definitely had not heard of this before I started this project, um, this is what the basic setup looks like. There's a photo on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, the scanner I use is a Leica Geosystems, that's the brand, uh, ScanStation C10 3D laser scanner. So it's this gray and green box thing on top of the tripod. Um, and it weighs about 13 kilograms, 30 pounds, um, just by itself. Its carrying case weighs a little bit more. So it's super fun to carry around all the time. Um, but it, does really cool things and so you can see um that it has like a little screen on the bottom i guess bottom left in this photo for operating it and then in the green part in the middle where there's a gap um that's kind of where all the work really happens so the scanner sends out a green laser which in the smaller closer up photo you can see um, a little green dot that's the green laser that it sends out um, and then the black box in the middle contains mirrors and so while you're scanning it rotates to reflect and send out that laser beam. So it spins around. If you click, um, there is a video that I think you can play, hopefully. <laughs> and it kind of shows you what that does. So that black box spins around and basically the whole time the laser is being projected and reflected back. Um, and then the scanner also rotates on its base on the tripod. So it can complete up to a full 360 degree rotation within the time period that you're scanning. Um, and then you can scan at various resolutions. You can scan at low, medium, high, or very high resolutions and all take different amounts of time. So a low resolution scan takes only about three minutes while a very high resolution scan takes about 90. And so for my project, I've been using high resolution. It takes about 45 minutes to complete a full 360 degree panoramic scan. Um, and then the scanner also comes equipped with a camera so you can take a photo of the area you're scanning to reference back to if that would be useful for you. So you can go next. Okay, so how exactly does this work once you get this thing? Um, so, and how does it provide usable data? So to set it up in the field, uh, the scanner sends out this green laser, if you click twice probably, um, it sends out this green laser and it measures the time that it takes the laser to reach and reflect back off of an object. And then that correlates to the distance of the object from the scanner. So it does this like millions of times within a single scan, this thing moves crazy fast. It can send up to, uh, it can scan up to 50,000 points per second, which is pretty impressive. Um, and then what it does with those millions of distance readings is it makes data points for each time the laser hits something and bounces back. So there's millions of data points. And it puts those together into what's called a point cloud, which is basically just a digital rendering of the scanned area. And what you see on the bottom is what it looks like on the screen of the scanner when you're done. Um, and then with the green laser actually, and this is pretty cool for this application, is that it can actually scan through water too, up to about two meters of water. Um, and that depends really on the lighting and the refraction and the movement of the water and the turbidity and quite a few other factors that can mess with the accuracy of registering underwater objects. So it's possible, but be a little cautious with it. This black and white photo here is kind of generally what it looks like if you scan underwater. Um, and you can see, you can still see a pipe sticking out um, but it might not be as clear as something that was scanned out of the water. So next. Okay, so then to actually take the scans once you've done that and to play around with and analyze them, you take the point cloud that the scanner outputs and load that into this Leica Cyclone software computer program. Um, Cyclone is the point cloud processing software that Leica Geosystems developed to complement their scanners. Um, the deal with this is that unfortunately the scanner outputs files that can only be read by the Cyclone software. Um, but of course the software doesn't usually come with the scanner. Um, so they make you purchase a license separately, which is 
wonderful. Um, it's kind of an expensive program and you don't really need to perform a whole lot of actions within it. Um, you can do more if you want, but it is really necessary if you're going to do anything with your scans because this converts them to a readable, like a file that's readable by other programs other than a file that is only readable by this Cyclone software. Um, so basically you import your scan files and then you convert and export them into a readable file. And then these readable files can be imported by a variety of programs. And I have been using Cloud Compare, which is an open source software project designed just for this, for 3D point cloud processing and analysis. And there are a variety of tools you can use within this software, depending on what you want to look at in your scans and what your application is. Um, but what it does allow you to do and what I've been doing is you can import multiple point clouds, so multiple scans of the same area, and you can line them up. Um, even if you didn't scan them exactly from the same location, you can still line them up and overlap them basically one on top of the other. Um, and then you can use tools uh, that to compute the distance between the points of those different layers. Um, and so that kind of quantifies the amount of change the shoreline has experienced in the time between scans. And you can only do this in one dimension at a time. So you can only do the X, Y, or Z dimension at one time. Um, so with erosion or accretion, in my case, we're mainly concerned with changes in the Z dimension. Um, but that is basically what this program allows you to do. And that's kind of how you go about getting something useful out of these scans. So if you go next. So this is what you get from all of this. If you click, there's a, a photo of um, one of the scans that I've analyzed. And so this shows you the change in the Z dimension for one of our sites for the month of July this summer. Um, and I really only recently, like last week, learned how to um, access the software and be trained how to use it. So this is the only site that we have uh, had time to really get results for in time for this presentation. There will be more coming soon. Um, and so I use the M3C2 tool, which you can see on the top of that colorful bar. That's the name of it. And so that is what computes the distance between points of the two clouds that are overlaid on top of each other. And then the bar on the right tells you what vertical distance each color correlates to. And the units are in meters. Um, so as you can see here, it doesn't look right now like there's much vertical change. The only thing that's hard about that is, I mean, green, the green color goes down to about like 1.5 meters of change. Um, and so it doesn't show me right now very precise unless I zoomed in, but I wanted to show you guys what this looks like. You can also export this file though and put it into a program like R and make a map out of it that allows you to really kind of get into the nitty gritty. Um, and you can actually get up to sub centimeter accuracy of change in these scans, which is I think a really cool um, thing. So you can really accurately quantify how your material is moving. Um, and like I said before, you can only do this in the X, Y, or Z dimension. If you wanted to get multi-dimensional change to understand all the movement of sediment on your shoreline, you can do one in the Z dimension and one in the you know X dimension or something and kind of overlay those on top of each other afterwards and see how you have multi-dimensional change. Um, you can see some red up in this image. That was just a kayak rack that the homeowner had. Um, and so you can kind of see how things will really show up uh, if they're moved a lot. So uh, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so really to wrap that all up, just really quick, the basic process is you go out and you scan. Uh, the scanner produces a point cloud. You convert that into a usable digital file and then you use a software program of your choosing and you analyze that file and that allows you to quantify that dimensional change, whatever dimension you want. So basically to quantify erosion or accretion and it does this really precisely. Uh, you can go on, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so once we get to quantifying those changes in the shoreline, um, this may seem a little bit basic, but it's definitely something to consider. We have to think about the fact that the material resuspended has moved and it has to go somewhere. And so when the wind picks up or a boat comes by um, and we see that effect reach the shoreline, the sediment's released and we see turbidity. Uh, and then once that sediment is released, it's most likely going to move somewhere um, if it doesn't just settle back down. So we see that in the process of erosion, where it moves away from the shoreline and can be deposited further away and building up the lake bed further away from shore. Um, but what if that is not the case? So what if, if you go to the next slide, um, so what if instead when the sediment's released on the, sh in, on the shoreline, it moves in a different direction? So it could be pushed up further on the shoreline and be accreted actually, um, rather than eroded away. And 
I know, like I said, this may seem obvious and basic, but I had honestly never really thought about accretion and erosion or accretion as much as erosion. Um, so all the, cause all the focus is normally on erosion. That's all you really hear about. Um, but it is really important to consider the entire movement of materials within the lake. So, you know, everything does have to go somewhere and it becomes apparent that there is this incredible movement of sediment, not just within the lake that I'm studying, but within probably most lakes. Um, and some part of the shoreline may be gaining material while other parts are losing it. And the cool thing about this laser scanning technology that I'm using is that we can not only measure erosion, but we can also measure accretion and do that really accurately. And then, you know, tying that into the bigger part of my thesis. So not only does that affect, you know, shoreline composition and physical nearshore dynamics, but while this material is released and moving, it's moving. And while it's moving, it could be releasing nutrients that contribute to eutrophication. So uh, next, please. Um, so like I, like I said before, um, all I had really thought or heard much about before was erosion. Um, and when I started this study and still, yeah, I still get a lot of citizen calls and complaints from property owners around the lake and they pretty much all had to do with erosion. You know, people really don't like losing their beach or losing square footage off of their property. And so one example shown to me was this, this set of stairs um, off the dock. It was built about 20 years ago, according to the homeowner. Um, and as you can see, this step's now just hanging midair. They're about two feet off of the ground. Um, and that's a ma massive amount of erosion within those 20 years or so. Um, and when they were built, obviously the steps went down to the beach. And then others complained about pipes and rocks sticking out that have never shown before. Some folks called me to look at this, which is um, their patio had collapsed from big wakes repeatedly uh, crashing into it over this summer. And then uh, uh, they said a significant amount of their beach had also eroded. And so this is what people are concerned about. This is what is usually more noticeable or negatively affects them. And that's really what they wanna reach out about and really all I'd heard about or considered before. But we finally heard of another San Pei Lake, which was interesting, um, on the next slide. Um, so this, this gentleman contacted um, Dr. Wilhelm and I about something that he had observed on his property. Um, if you can go to the next slide, and probably two clicks. Okay, so if you look at this photo, um, it's kind of just a portion of a photo that was hanging on the wall in this guy's cabin. It was taken in 1987. Um, if you can, and if you could click, please, if you just take a second to look at this rock that's circled in red, um, it's the biggest boulder sticking out on the shoreline. Um, fast forward to 20 to 30 something years later um, when we get this call. And so I went down to check it out. And then this is a photo of that beach now. And so it's the same house, same photo angle. Um, you can't see the boulder. You can't see any of those rocks, but you definitely can't see the boulder. Um, it's actually right there. If you click, there's a circle around it. Um, and it really, it barely sticks out anymore. You can probably click a couple times. There's a close up. Um, so this guy had marked it when he uh, noticed that it started to be surrounded by sand, that the shoreline was accreting in that area. And he says that this like really just happened within the past 10 or 15 years. Um, but we know at least from the time of that photo, so like 33 years ago, it's happened at least then. And that is also significant accretion. And, and that's not very far down from the erosion where the, those steps were two feet off the ground. Um, and so that's kind of plays into the bigger picture of this massive movement of sediment in the lake, um, sometimes within a rel relatively short period of time. And then we have to consider, you know, where, what is releasing that sediment so that it can be transported like that? Is that a natural phenomenon or is that due to an anthropogenic, anthropogenic um, increase in activity? And so, you know, we're kind of in really deep here. It's like a big can of worms of all these things we have to consider with in-lake currents and everything. Um, and so we're really focusing on how do we quantify what is happening on the shoreline and how is all of that stuff moving? Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, really like why did we choose to use this technology and not a, you know, a pin erosion study or something, not just because of the accuracy, but um, you know, what might you gain from using this method? We had this equipment available to us, fortunately, from Dr. Jan Idle through the university. Um, so we were able to use it um and it is really accurate that's awesome there are other methods to measure erosion but this is really up there as far as accuracy goes and then this technology allows us to quantify sediment movement in the lake so we can see where sediment is eroding and where it's accreting and really understand at least most of the picture of sediment movement to and from the shoreline um there are a few drawbacks 
uh, that I think it's important to mention. For one, it is pretty costly. <laughs> it's not something like your average, you know, everyday independent person could afford. Um, and it also requires a specialist or someone who knows what they're doing um, to start out with when it comes to, you know, scanning and processing and getting anything useful out of this. Um, or at the very least, you need a willing master's student, which is me. Um, I got put up to that. So great. <laughs> um, and if you could go next, please. Um, so I mentioned that it was costly. I'm just going to break that down really quick. Um, so the biggest cost is the scanner itself. The scanner that I use uh, generally costs between fifteen and twenty thousand um, dollars on average, and that includes some accessories, um, but not really any of the equipment or software necessary for actually processing or analyzing the scans. Um, to do that, you require that Leica Cyclone license that I mentioned earlier. That can range anywhere between $906,000 and, and probably out of that range on either end too. There are educational discounts and other things like that, but um, that's kind of the general range depending on what kind of software you need and what you're going to use it for and how long you want your license to last. So um, to analyze the scans, at least the program that I use, you know, you get a freebie, which is great. And that's a big part of the reason why we chose it um, is that it was free because um, Cloud Compare is that open source software. Um, the time aspect as far as costs go, the time for a scan, like I said, runs about an hour, but that really varies. You could probably do the whole thing, set up and take down and scanning in 15 minutes, but you could, you know, you could also take probably two hours. Um, and so uh, there's, you know, there's other similar techniques. Um, the analysis takes a little bit of time um, depending on, you know, your network capabilities and everything like that. So um, just to summarize really quick, because I know my time is up. Um, and you can click through the bullet points on the slide. Um, this is basically, you know, this has its, its pros and cons. It's really accurate, but it can be expensive, but it's really cool um, for understanding your shoreline. And then we're gonna go on and do more with this. We're gonna characterize the shoreline and try to associate nutrient concentrations with this moving material. So uh, I wanna thank you all for watching. I wanna thank the Big Pale Lake Water Quality Council uh, for raising the funds for this. I want to thank WALPA for letting me present and the University of Idaho and the McCall Field Campus um, and Basile and Frank and Jan who have all helped me. If you guys have any questions, because I know this is a lot, um, please feel free to reach out to me. I am available um, or email questions now and we'll get to them later. So thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. That was an awesome project and uh, really looks like a useful tool. <laughs> So next up, we have Sean Ahern. He'll be talking about isotope tracers in uh, nutrient source tracking. Welcome, Sean. Hi, and thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Sean Ahern. Um, I'll be guiding us through this uh, talk this afternoon, um, isotope tracers in nutrient source tracking of nitrate, um, a different perspective on surface and groundwater remediation. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining me this afternoon. I know that uh, the conference is almost over, so thank you for those of you who are um, still here with us. Um, and a thank you to the uh, WALPA and to Rob Sysette for this uh, opportunity to share with you guys uh, how isotopic analysis can improve uh, water quality projects. Uh, my goals for this talk are going to be to define isotopic nutrient source tracking, uh, review nitrate and bore on their origins and how the analysis works to define pollution sources, and then I have a brief case study uh, to review that should uh, wrap it all up. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with beta analytic, uh, we are celebrating 40 years this year of uh, radiocarbon dating. We also uh, do stable isotopes, which is what I'll be discussing today. Um, we do a lot of different sort of services to help people um, understand the physical world. Uh, we're also a proud certifying body for bio-based products. So you might have a water bottle or toothbrush that is a plant-based material that may have gone through our laboratory for certification, um, as well as to show off our ISO uh, certification. So that is the uh, international uh, organization on standardization and what that does is it proves our competency you know we're regularly audited uh, to prove our competency to uh, measure these ratios in a reproducible manner um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with beta um, you know this is what we've been up to for the last uh, 40 years um, you know, something that I like to kind of uh, emphasize to people is that when we're talking about isotopic analysis, we're talking about uh, how to understand the physical world in a different way. Um, so uh, Beta and Isobar are companies that uh, we're really, we're just, we're one big company, but depending on the service, your report might come from Beta or from Isobar. Uh, but what we're doing is we're helping people understand the physical world. So this is a great paper by Matus and Jackson that sort of reviews the idea that um, from origins to diet to uh, chemical reactions taking place, uh, 
isotope ratio mass spectroscopy or IRMS or really you know mass spec um, can really help us in understanding the physical world around us and also to prove that things are um, what they say they are and that they've come from where they've come and that you know products or even you know timelines um, are accurate so uh, you know for those of you who want to take a deeper dive into mass spec I highly recommend checking out this paper by Matos and Jackson in forensic chemistry um, and uh, uh, if anyone's interested in learning more, just let me know and I can always get you some more information. Uh, this is just a teaser slide. I wanted to go ahead and kind of let you know where we're going. Um, at the end of the talk, we're going to be uh, talking about this case study where uh, the combination of nitrate and boron isotopes, um, as well as a microbiological indicator we used to define the sources of nitrate in a karstic groundwater system. And what was really important about the study is that um, over several decades, the water quality had been uh, continuously becoming more and more impaired from five milligrams per liter nitrate um, to 25. Uh, so it came to the point where finally these uh, research needed to uh, define a source and their approach was to use isotopic analysis and um, we'll talk about why in just a few moments. So before we jump into looking at data, I just wanted to make sure that we were all familiar and um, on the same page as far as um, stable isotopes and what it is we're reviewing. So um, a stable isotope is a variation of the same element, but just with a different number of neutrons. Um, therefore, its identity and overall reactivity are the same, but you pretty much have one that's a bit more massive and therefore more sluggish during reactions and phase changes. Um, what fractionation means is that because something like evaporation is taking place, you're fractionating the atom pool, right? And we have an example here on our right that shows that if a beaker of water was you know on a hot plate and evaporating we would expect that um, there would be a fractionation process or a separation where the uh, one H's would be more present in the vapor phase whereas the two H's would be more present in the liquid phase right so it's these changes that refer to fractionation and that's what helps us develop the um, uh, what's called the uh, delta notation right so the delta notation here what we're doing is we're suggesting that compared to a standard these ratios of ones to twos or whatever um, element you have of interest for that stable isotope we compare that to a standard and when it's positive we call it enriched and when it's negative we refer to it as depleted now what's really great about this kind of analysis is that these standards are actually both nationally and internationally um, generated and sold to labs all around the world, meaning that data sets from um, you know, the, the states can be compared to data sets in, in Europe and in South America, and it really just allows us to have a lot of confidence in the kind of data we produce and know that our machines are running well as we run these standards through our machines. Right, so um, again, stable isotopes, same element, different variation. We're using the fact that these different um, forms of the elements that have different masses fractionate, and that fractionation can actually help us reveal uh, processes that are taking place and the origin of substances. So I just wanted to remind everyone of you know why we track nutrients, and really it comes down to eutrophication. Eutrophication can greatly impact recreational waters, uh, causing algal blooms and bringing all sorts of uh, toxins to the water. You know these poisons can buy you accumulate, and they can even hit your dinner plate. Uh, but really, you know something to consider is marine and fisheries industries that are also relying on this clean water for the health of estuaries, bays, and large lakes. Um, you know something that I like to remind people is that even if you feel that the environment um, and balance in the environment is not the most important thing, well then just consider um, the economy and realize that keeping nutrients in balance um, is also helping not only ensure that we are um, happy and healthy, but also ensuring that we have uh, plenty of work and, and, and food to go around. Uh, one of the big challenges in tracking nutrients is differentiating between point source and non-point sources. So our point sources tend to be pretty well-regulated outfalls. Um, they can be sometimes high in nutrients and high in other chemicals, but for the most part, they are regulated. Uh, our real big issue, and something that this data helps elucidate, is non-point sources. That's stormwater runoff, uh, septic tanks leaking, uh, large agricultural areas that are all coalescing to one spot. So what ends up happening is all these sources mixed together and it can become difficult to understand which is the leading cause of pollution. And that's where isotopes can come in to really help and understand where pollution is coming from, what processes are these non-point sources going through, and how can we really target our remediation efforts. So nitrate, you know, what is nitrate? Well, nitrate, it's a naturally occurring molecule that is essentially a vehicle for nitrogen within the nitrogen cycle. 
All right, here's a fun cartoon that kind of expresses, uh, uh, this is a, a very abridged nitrogen cycle that's focusing on nitro, but what we can see here is that nitrifying, fixing, nitrogen fixing bacteria pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere. They now make that nitrogen as nitrate available to plants, um, animals, and uh, the death and decay of plant matter uh, then uh, turns into organic matter. That organic matter is then um, mineralized and uh, nitrified and then denitrified back to N2 gas. So pretty much what we have here is, you know, an example that the nitrogen in a nitrate molecule is undergoing several different reactions from formation, death and decay, reformation, and then all the way back to uh, disintegration. So what we can do is utilize all these reactions taking place to understand the origin of nitrate and the process being imposed on it. Here's a graph that sort of summarizes what we would expect the isotopic reactions to be. So we can see that nitrification, we actually expect things to shift um, in a negative manner, righty? And then when it comes to uh, denitrification, we could see that we expect things to shift in a positive manner. And that would be a depletion versus an enrichment. What is very useful about tracking nitrate is that we're getting information from both a nitrogen and an oxygen molecule. And what that allows us to do is to get even more information on the processes that are being taken place to help us better understand the origin. Um, and let's see what that looks like. So here on this biplot, what we could see is that we have our delta 15N of the nitrate and our delta O18 of the nitrate plotted. And already we can see um, some of these ranges of known substances. So the USGS has published these ranges. Um, uh, Carol Kendall uh, et al. has gone through um, a bunch of different N members or, or you know, potential sources and defined some of these regions. So we can see that you know this green box here is for manure and sewage. We have um, inorganic fertilizers, nitrate fertilized precipitation. This is actually very very common in urban areas due to combustion reactions, um, as well as uh, lightning strikes that generate nitrate. But ultimately, what we can see here is by looking at the delta 15 and delta O18, we can already begin to suggest what sources are or are not present, and we can also see where they're mixing. Furthermore, what's really important is this trending here. So here we have labeled denitrification. So we, if we had our data populating along a line, with this trend, we could begin to um, speculate that there's some natural remediation taking place, maybe something we want to augment or improve, and then also nitrification, and that would be um, ammonia, fertilizers, and rain. So again, this data set begins to really bring together what's happening to this dissolved nitrate, where it's coming from, and where it's going. Um, so, so far we've talked about nitrate, the fact that it's natural, and the fact that using these two isotopes can help us understand what's going on with that nitrate. But let's shift gears. So boron is interesting because, and, and I was really surprised to, to learn this when I was doing research, was how ubiquitous it is. Um, here are some estimates from 1972 about all the different processes where boron's present. We have uh, glass formation and ceramics, mining, uh, but soaps and cleansers really just outcompete it all. And what we tend to, you know, not always realize is that our homes and our, our domestic waste coming from apartment buildings, septic tanks, and, and pretty much all of the stuff leaving our, our common household items are actually full of boron, which have very distinct and discrete values. Um, what this allows us to do is to actually help us pinpoint these sources of pollution. What makes boron a very useful tool for isotopic source tracking is this large difference in their stable isotopic values. So we can see here, or I should say in their isotopes. So what we can see here is that the boron 10 is actually almost 20% of the stable isotope uh, per percentages and the boron 11 is almost 80. And what this leads to is a very wide relationship between um, boron 10 and 11 that allows us to better understand the sources of all these different kinds of materials. Um, so for example, um, you know, coal here has a very wide range, but they're always negative. Um, what we'll be interested today is in sewage and contamination. Um, but we can also see that there are, you know, seawater intrusion examples, um, here detergent, something else that's interesting, um, manure, which we'll look at in a moment. But ultimately, we can begin to start to see that we have nitrate um, isotopic ratios that are helping first define some ranges. And then now we're using boron to go ahead and refine those further and better understand them. 
and I kind of alluded to this a second ago, but what we can do is combine the Delta 15N and the Boron 11, and we can begin to look at all these sources and use all three of these isotopes to understand the origin. And what really pops out, and what's probably the most important part of this graph, is that it helps to pull apart the manure and suic signatures that can become very difficult to um, to understand in non-point sources. Um, you know, when these two sources are mixing, there's a, there could be a lot of arguments as between what the major source is and what sort of policies to take. So by taking this kind of approach, we can actually get insight into the mechanisms being imposed on the contamination and better understand its source. Okay, great. So now we have some background on what stable isotopes are, uh, what fractionation means, how we can use that fractionation to help us understand the sources and reactions being imposed on our, on our contaminants. Now let's see this kind of information in action. Um, as I had mentioned before, uh, this is an area that was um, under a lot of agricultural uh, land use, and since the 1970s till 2013, there had been progressive increases in contamination, and it came to a point where these researchers now needed to um, define a source. Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, in agricultural areas, due to large amounts of releases of nitrogen, um, there is a very um, high chance that that uh, fertilizer and manure could be contaminated contaminating the local groundwater table. However, sometimes it can become um, very difficult to determine that that is the real source of the contamination. And this is also where it becomes difficult to decide what sort of best management practices to take. So during this research, and again, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add some color. Um, the first approach taken was to measure the nitrate isotopes. And we can see here that we are able to show that, you know, uh, nitrate from the atmosphere and fertilizers are very likely not a culprit here. So we can basically rule out inorganic fertilizers. And now we're in a sewage manure area and with the potential for some uh, soil and organic matter. We can also see here that there is a nice denitrification trend, suggesting that there is some natural remediation taking place. Place, and researchers can use that to understand the rate and potentially um, augment that area as we talked about before. So from just this one data set, we already can begin to understand origins and now with the boron, we can refine it. So now with the addition of the boron isotope, we're able to further refine these boxes and show that indeed the agricultural practices in the area are the leading reason for these increases in nitrate and pollution concentrations in this area. And now informed practices and decisions can be made to improve this water quality. Another point to bring up is that um, the, there were no markers for human waste uh, with the bacterial source tracking. So just as a more confidence in, in our proxies. So what, so why bring this up? Well, isotopic nutrient source tracking of nitrate and boron were able to confine contamination sources and improve remediation efforts in the area. Um, further, boron and nitrogen proxies are able to help researchers and stakeholders understand their current water quality issues to better tackle them. Uh, I wanna just thank everybody again. You know, we were able to define isotopic nutrient source tracking, uh, review nitrate and boron origins and how they're used to define sources and we reviewed a case study. Um, so at this point, I just wanna thank everybody. Um, you know, I'll. I'm sure I'll be unmuted for questions. And, um, you know, uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. That was really interesting. I know EPA is um, just funded six um, million dollar plus projects uh, looking at source tracking of nitrogen. So you're in the right field. <laughs> um, look forward to questions. And next, our last uh, presentation of the day and of the conference is Rob Zizet, our current president. Uh, he's talking about monitoring phosphorus and fecal bacteria loading in Lake Whatcom. Thanks for coming to the WALPA conference and thanks for sticking around for the very last presentation. Uh, this presentation is a follow-up to one I gave to WALPA in 2017 when we first uh, investigated the impacts of septic systems on water quality in Lake Whatcom. The question uh, was asked to me by the Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District. Are on-site sewer systems in the North Shore Basin impacting public and environmental health of Lake Whatcom? There are 100 uh, septic systems on in this North Shore Basin. They're located just across the lake from where the sewer district takes their water supply from and as well as the city of Bellingham takes their water supply from and they're concerned that the septage uh, from those systems are getting into the lake and in fact 
due to that concern, they had proposed to uh, extend the sewer from the city down along the three miles of shoreline where these septic systems are located to intercept them and connect them to um, the sewage system, which they also manage, by the way. Uh, but their attorney told them they're not allowed to do that because the Growth Management Act will let, not let them do that unless they can prove that those septic systems are, in fact, impacting public and environmental health. And at that time, using fecal bacteria as a measure of public health and phosphorus as a measure of environmental health, since there is a fecal and phosphorus TMDL on Lake Whatcom, and the entities are spending millions of dollars a year uh, in managing stormwater to reduce phosphorus inputs to the lake, but uh, not uh, anything pr principally on the septic systems other than ongoing maintenance. Anyway, uh, we did find that uh, using human fecal biomarkers that OSS are getting to the lake from septic systems. We found high uh, to moderate um, concentrations of fecal biomarkers in six of the 18 drainages that we sampled. And we also found though that they didn't correlate, those concentrations didn't correlate well with fecal bacteria. However, that's not unusual if DNA tracking studies because of different transport mechanisms between those batteries, uh, between those uh, parameters that we'll talk about later. So moving on to the 2020 question, well, that was fine, but you didn't take very many samples. And how do we know that the loadings, uh, even though you calculated some not very, not very accurately with the, a study that wasn't designed to calculate loadings, let's redesign the study, calculate some loadings, and look at loadings from a sewered area that, uh, in fact, to prove that sewers aren't contributing comparable amounts of fecal bacteria and phosphorus to the lake. So here we have our three study areas. The OSS area is on the North Shore of Lake Wacom, shown with the 100 or so orange dots representing septic systems and the 20 or so red dots representing drainage outfalls that were sampled. The new sewer area that we sampled is located across the lake uh, in the area served by sewer shown in pink located between uh, the city of Bellingham intake on the northwest and the district's intake to the southeast. The undeveloped area is located beyond Smith Creek, southeast of the OSS area in Lake Whatcom Park, where there are no uh, known human uh, sewage or septage sources. The study design uh, was to use five drainages, the sample five drainages in the OSS area. These are five drainages that we intentionally selected that where we found human biomarkers before. So we did not randomly select them. Uh, they are actually targeting uh, known previously contaminated areas. And five more, not randomly, but we picked five drainage basins in the Seward area that had very different size of flow and, and basin size and were readily access, accessible by by foot. The first one we did in 2017 was all by boat. This time we did it by foot. And then we picked two drainages of different size in the undeveloped area. We sampled also one of two septic tanks in each of the five events, uh, lo obviously located in the OSS area. And then a municipal sewer uh, shown here sampled in the um, sewer area. Three storm events two basic flow events in the spring of 2020. Uh, storm events were between a half to an inch in 24 hours. The field measurements really consisted only of flow measurements, so we could expedite things and, uh, and just grab samples and measure flow, uh, and take those samples back to the lab instead of doing optical brighteners in the field to track sources like we did the first time, as you may recall. Uh, we just uh, tested whether this lab method of optical brighteners would work by using a UV light to um, degrade the optical brighteners, which does not degrade the natural background interference, positive interference we get, uh, fluorescence from organic matter. Um, so we tested that out and along with conductivity. But really we're looking at uh, fecal coliform and E. coli and total phosphorus. 
We did look at two human biomarkers this time, as well as last time, but different ones. Uh, HF-183 is the same bio, one of the same biomarkers we used in 2017, but it's been renamed because it's been um, promulgated as an EPA-approved method uh, since 2017. HF-183, and then we added an experimental one that's just been developed by the University of Washington, uh, I'm sorry, University of Wisconsin uh, researchers uh, named it back v 4 v 5 They uh, isolated it from municipal sewage and in fact determined that it's most prevalent, uh, more prevalent than HF-183 in the sewage, but most prevalent in the biofilm on the sewer pipes, that it's actually in bacteroides growing in the biofilm, not in bacteroides uh, present in the human waste itself. Here's just a map of the drainage basins that we delineated using LIDAR to each of the five OSS drainage sampling outfalls, along with the two septic systems to the southeast and further to the southeast, the two undeveloped sites. And across the lake are the five sewer area outfalls that we sampled of varied uh, basin size, along with the sewage site uh, draining the Strawberry Point neighborhood. The total phosphorus results are shown here in box plots uh, with blue for the undeveloped, green for the OSS, and brown for the sewer sites. Um, we found uh, high phosphorus concentrations, over 50 micrograms per liter, in all but two of the OSS and two sewer stations. This threshold has been developed by Robin Matthews, who sampled uh, for years tributaries to Lake Whatcom and used that threshold to identify uh, where mean concentrations exceed that in developed tributaries and typically were less than that in undeveloped basins in the watershed. We found even uh, much higher concentrations, uh, over uh, 300 micrograms per liter at one OSS station, and that's 520, uh, per, important to note that, as well as uh, we did go upstream of station 440, even though the, the mean was um, less than 100, we did find concentrations over 300 in an upstream station in 440 that's not shown in this graph. One interesting observation, however, was that phosphorus concentrations were in fact lower during lower, um, during higher flow. So as the concentration, uh, as the flow increased, phosphorus concentration decreased from base to storm flow, as well as comparing the 2017, where we sampled extremely high flow rates during very large storm events over an inch um, or two. Uh, we saw that same pattern, and it's theorized that, in fact, which we've seen elsewhere, that in forested watersheds, uh, which all of these really are principally, the um, groundwater phosphorus concentrations are higher in base flow and actually get diluted by forest runoff. Anyway, concluding, uh, also these high phosphorus concentrations were observed in septic tanks even higher than the sanitary sewer, but both of which are similar to the literature value of 10,000 micrograms per liter, commonly reported. Now the fecal bacteria results are shown here for E. coli uh, on the right. We did not find high concentrations over our threshold of 500 on average for a geometric mean, shown in red X's, by the way. But we did find moderate concentrations at station 440 in the OSS uh, area, as well as a sewer station 485 in the um, sewer area. Fecal bacteria concentration did follow a pattern of, of being lower at lower flows or increasing with flow, likely due to runoff uh, containing animal de deposits of feces uh, in, in these basins. E. coli was higher in sanitary sewage then the septic tanks, presumably due to the uh, settling of solids in the septic tanks versus the suspension of those solids in the sanitary sewer. Now the fun stuff, the biomarker results. We have the back V4, V5 up top and HF183 down below. The threshold of 2500 we developed is um, about 10 times the quantitation limit for this qPCR method. And uh, we found actually higher concentrations of BAC V4, V5 uh, than HF183 in all sites. And we found high concentrations of 
back V4, V5 at three of the five OSS stations shown in the upper graph, 520, 430, and 440. We also did find a high HF183 at 520, but not at those other two uh, OSI sites. So we um, interestingly found higher, not shown here though, but in the sewage samples, we found higher back V4, V5, as well as the septic samples. So this is a much uh, better human marker for this watershed for both sewage and septage because of the higher concentrations and the better sensitivity. We'll note down below HF183 was found at moderately or low, yeah, moderate levels at undeveloped uh, basin one, the very first blue bar with a median concentration of a th of a thousand. Um, and um, also in uh, lower concentrations at at uh, site 516 or site 516. But anyway, those lower concentrations of 180 of 183 was uh, were much lower than what we observed at those three high uh, OSS sites. Continuing on with the biomarker results, uh, the patterns we saw among the five OSS stations in 2020 matched those we saw in 2017, with 520 being the highest on down to 466 in, in that order, as well as the uh, moder uh, the levels of the concentrations themselves. Secondly, um, the important finding was is, is again, which we, we had assumed uh, or concluded in 2017, but that because we're not seeing high fecal or high phosphorus concentrations in these drainages with high human biomarkers, that transport mechanism is through the soil not overland flow, not failures uh, that weren't observed by the health department either, by the way. And that human biomarkers are transported uh, through, slowly through soils, but more readily than fecal bacteria, which die off by those slow transport rates and phosphorus, which is absorbed to particles along its pathway to the water. Loading analysis pretty much showed the same thing as the concentration. Uh, when we look at aerial loadings um, on an annual basis, uh, those three OSS stations, 430, 440, 520, were much higher than the any of the undeveloped or sewer stations. But when we average them over each of the, th um, the three areas over the year, we found that in fact the sewer area had the highest uh, phosphorus loading rate of 0.19 compared to 0.08 for the OSS and the undeveloped areas, clearly showing that septic systems are not a significant source of phosphorus loading uh, to Lake Whatcom. This conclusion actually agrees with what we concluded in 2017 in our crude estimates of loading uh, showing it or ex estimating it to be less than 10% of the total load uh, from the septic system based on a uh, difference in concentration, uh, as well as by other researchers in 2011 using uh, literature values for septic system loading rates, predicting they would uh, amount to less than 15% of the total TMDL load attributed to the North Shore Basin. And finally, uh, we did assess whether the 68 of uh, the 100 systems uh, were, in, were inspected by the Whatcom Health Department between the 2017 and 2020 study. They weren't able to get access to the other uh, 32. And uh, of those 68, five were found to have either a uh, Need, a need of repair or maintenance. Two of them landed in two of the basins we studied, 466 and 430, and we found no appreciable decrease in uh, human biomarker input between the, um, the time that those repairs were made. However, further investigation would be needed to determine if other contaminants in septage may be getting to the lake other than phosphorus and fecal bacteria. In conclusion, uh, nope, OSS are not a significant source of fecal bacteria and loading to the lake because septage is transported slowly through the soils and fecal bacteria die off in those soils, phosphorus is absorbed in those soils, as has been reported by others. But we don't know what's happening with these other chemicals. 
and that, in fact, uh, septic repairs uh, by the health department did not appear to um, reduce the low amount of septic inputs that were observed in 2017. We do recommend, however, following up with some uh, source tracking in two basins that showed high phosphorus and high human biomarkers to see if those sources could be controlled in basins 440 and 520. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. That was very interesting. It looked like a big project. Interesting that the results were the same from um, 2017 to 2020. So if anybody has any questions, please uh, submit them to info at walpa or info at walpa.org. Uh, you can also use that website for any feedback on the conference and um, any questions you might have for any of the presenters that you weren't able to get to. And before we take questions, I just wanted to thank a number of people. First off, all the participants who um, are still logged on and logged on yesterday. I think this was a really good conference uh, online. Secondly, I'd like to thank um, Rob Zizet in particular, along with Sally Abella and call out Jen O, Jennifer Oden, for their um, lots and lots of work that they did to make this conference um, work on the program and getting abstracts in. Really did a good job. Thank you. Um, like to present all of the, or thank you all of the presenters. Um, everything was interesting. I learned a lot. I think the panel discussion yesterday on equity and justice was very important for WALPA, as was a, a discussion and panel discussion this morning on um, access. Uh, I think as we go forward, these topics will be um, incorporated into WALPA's work. We'd like to thank um, the sponsors, um, call out uh, all of our sponsors for the conference. And again, call out uh, UW Tacoma for their great job that allowed us to have this online conference. And we appreciate your efforts and work very much. Um, and as a personal thank you, I'd like to thank Jennifer Parsons for forwarding the questions uh, to me and sorting through those. Uh, so as we get going on questions right now. So we have a question for Basil. Um, when you looked at the macrophyte aspect, was there any distinction in the ability to prevent uh, resuspension between submerged rooted plants like pondweeds or elodea that are further out versus those that are more shoreline um, uh, only like rushes and cattails? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, it's a long one. <laughs> when you looked at uh, the macrophytes, did you um, notice any distinction in preventing resuspension by uh, submerged rooted plants that were uh, further out versus those that are closer to the shoreline? Did either of those work better for preventing resuspension? Gluten? Uh, um, well, deeper plants, ones that are deeper in the water versus mm -hmm. the shallow ones, did either work better? Oh, uh, it wasn't mentioned in the literature uh, what was the, but uh, between the big distinction was between uh, flex one and between very uh, erect ones and um, about the strong uh, strongness, uh, uh, the solid of the plant, if it was a very um, strong or flexible and it plays a great role on hydrodynamics but um, yes an emergent uh, compared to the ones that was more uh, deeper down play a greater role more for breaking orbital uh, movement and also surface movement uh, than, than ones that was uh, more deeper and coverage of the bed. We have another question for you. And and did you actually work at Lake Ta Tai Hu in China? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, let's see. The rest of that question was disappeared. Oh, how, so in Lake Tahoe, did you 
happened to notice if they um, tried to plant macrophytes to to work on that? Mm. What, one, of the, mm -hmm. one of the big problems that it was uh, already too much uh, eutrophic and that the establishment of macrophyte was uh, very difficult. Uh, but they tried some other strategy by making big wave breaking barriers of few kilometers that act on wave suspension and after when they limitate uh, aerodynamic disturbance and all this suspended particulate matter to go in the water column, uh, they tried to re-establish after uh, the macrophyte with, uh, in the same time as maintaining this barrier, but uh, there is still not an uh, article on the re-establishment of this macrophyte. But one of the big conclusions is that, like Tayu, it's too late for uh, re-establish macrophyte and it's already too, uh, too much eutrophic uh, state. It's famous or infamous for its uh, toxic algal blooms, for sure. Mm -hmm. So we have a question for Heather. And Heather, what's the range of the laser on the LIDAR unit? Uh, I, how much shoreline can you map from one location? So, um, so that really depends on where you are scanning from. I've been trying to scan from people's fixed docks or piers so that I can get a little bit off of the shoreline and that gives me a bigger range. Um, but you can generally, it can pick up objects up to 200 meters away. Uh, it's more accurate as you get closer, obviously. And so I've been trying to keep everything kind of within a, a, I don't know, 25 to 50 meter range, depending on my sights um, and how the shoreline is and you know how curved it is and how far off of the shoreline I'm able to get. So how big of a um, picture am I able to get of the shoreline? And then you can do a full 360 degree scan with that. And so, um, so it can pick up objects that are, you know, a ways away and you kind of get that whole um, circle of it, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of complicated. <laughs> and, and also how deep, how deep, you probably mentioned that. But. Um, into the water, mm -hmm. I assume. Okay. Yeah. So it depends, like I said, um, it's really dependent on the characteristics of your water. I think it can go up to about two meters deep um, and that, it, but it really depends on how turbid is your water and how, how much does it move, what is the lighting, like, so what's the reflectance of water, um, things like that that can really mess with the accuracy of scanning underwater. Um, it does pick up things obviously really quickly. It scans, you know, through those through those points, you know, 50,000 times a second. Um, but if things are kind of moving around um, or you get a weird reflectance and that laser beam hits the water and bounces back off rather than scanning through the water because of a reflectance and a lighting issue, um, then you wouldn't quite get that. So um, we've been looking a little bit at, at maybe trying to see how accurate that is um, with me going into analyzing my scans. but. It can go up to two meters if you have like nice, calm, clear water. That's neat. Nice. But it, it won't be replacing sonar for looking at bottom. Bit. <laughs> no, yeah. definitely not like anything. Yeah, not anything deep. Um, we've just been using it for that near shore. Um, another question for you. Do residents that live on the shoreline have complaints or concerns due to accretion? Would someone complain about increase in property regardless of natural or anthropogenic activities that cause these accretions? Um, some people might. Uh, and, you know, kind of like I said, most people that I've gotten calls and complaints from have been complaining about erosion because that upsets them. Um, but I have had like that call with the example of the rock. I don't know if that um, if that man was really upset about the accretion necessarily. Um, but he had really noticed it and he was kind of just like, this is crazy, like what has happened? Um, and uh, I have uh, another site that I have, they have mentioned also like, oh, we've actually been gaining a little bit of, of beach is what they said. Um, you know, it looks like our, like the sand is higher up on the steps that go down kind of thing. Um, the reaction that I've gotten from most property owners around the lake is not that they're as upset about accretion as they are about erosion, uh, but that might change depending on if they knew like a nutrient effect that goes along with that. And if you have more sediment moving into your area, into your beach, 
um, if that's bringing in more nutrients and then you could potentially have more growth. And most people really don't like having macrophytes in their beach or off of their dock. It scares them. Uh, so that really depends on the person, but generally it's a lot more negative of a reaction to erosion than it is to accretion. That's interesting. <laughs> so we have a couple questions for raw or for Sean. Uh, can isotope tracers be used to distinguish nutrients resulting from internal loading? Uh, that's a great question. And um, for that kind of question, what I would suggest is if we were to measure the uh, bed load and then compare that to the suspended load, we can actually assign an isotopic fingerprint. And also there has been research done in Lake Superior that actually showed uh, lake bed sediments producing more nitrate um, than there were inputs. So um, the short answer is yes, but I would also uh, consider some strategy to it. Um, since we do have the ability to fingerprint a particular source, we can fingerprint it and then identify it. So, yeah. So uh, another question um, for you, um, have you done many projects in Washington or Idaho? So unfortunately, we have not made it to the um, to the Northwest, but we have done projects in the West. Um, I'm in Miami, Florida now, and we've actually done the bulk of our work so far on the East Coast. So this is a you know a really great opportunity, and thank you guys again at Walpa for letting me be able to like talk about this kind of stuff. Oh, very interesting. Yes. Okay, and then we have a question for Rob. Uh, what do you think the key elements you would carry forward to a new lake system? to understand the impact of OSS on septic contributions to the lake? Well, I think the human biomarkers is a great tool. I think uh, estimating nutrient load from septic systems is, is a challenge that we've, we've been up against for many, many, for decades. Um, it takes a lot of effort to monitor uh, phosphorus transport in the subsurface. But um, I think the biomarkers are great for identifying problem areas and looking to um, target those areas um, in more in-depth investigation to um, see if you can control those sources without being too hung up on the, the quantification aspect of the biomarker and how it doesn't necessarily reflect the, the, the loading from phosphorus, for example. Okay, so um, we have a general question. Um, is there access to the presentations after the conference? Do you have the website on how we can access and listen to these presentations? Yes, it's a good question. Everybody's asking. Uh, yes, there will be access to all of them. Uh, University <clears throat> Washington Tacoma will be posting them for two weeks uh, and uh, look at, we'll post that on our WALPA website, what that uh, link is to get those. And then WALPA has plans to um, post them beyond that. We haven't quite figured out how and where that's going to be, but that's the plan is it would, they would be available even beyond two weeks. So, so look, we'll shortly, we'll, we'll get that information from them and we'll put it up on our web. Okay, I've been reminded to um, to say that we still have time to donate to WALPA on our website. And thank you to everyone who's donated extra. Um, that will help next year in our scholarships, since we didn't have an auction this year that I could buy everything from. <laughs> and um, anyway, I think that's it for questions. If no one has anything else, um, we hope to see you next year in October in the Tri-Cities at an in-person uh, conference if we can. And if not, we're going to talk to Rob again and he can set up a whole nother conference <laughs> next year. <laughs> thank you, Rob. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. <laughs>